I guess, he said. Hate to miss the fight, though. Then you shouldn't have volunteered for the drone class, Chunk said and slapped his teammate on the shoulder. It's cool, Gyro said. I'll cruise up the road, make one more pass, and then recover for a battery change just ahead of your launch. We'll go in thirty minutes, Dempsey said. Check, Gyro said. But he was back focused on the video game that was the UAV. Chunk and Dempsey slid back down the hill toward the base camp. A quick brief, and then it was go time. Chapter 22 They circled around him in the rapidly darkening jungle. Dempsey mentally divided the group into two strike teams, one led by him and the other by Chunk, with one SEAL and four DEA strikers on each. For his team, he reluctantly took Adamo, but also Mendez, who was a former Marsoc Marine. He couldn't dump Adamo on poor Chunk. He put Smith with the SEAL officer and, with a twinge of guilt, Grimes. He felt obligated to watch after her. She was Spaz's sister, after all, but having Adamo forced it this way. Besides, from what he'd seen over the past few months, Grimes could take care of herself. With all the shooters gathered, he pitched his plan. The two assault teams would move into position, one near the southwest corner and one near the southeast corner. They would stay concealed under jungle cover until the SEAL snipers kicked off the assault by taking out the tower shooters. Then, each team would breach the perimeter wall with breacher charges and move into the compound. The rest was just standard capture-kill mission 101. Once they secured the camp, they'd hold the captured crows in the front courtyard and then toss the house in barracks for intel. The DEA team would defend the compound with the snipers on fire support if an enemy QRF responded. Exfil would be by air with pickup inside the compound. The primary target was Al-Mahajer, but Dempsey planned on taking any ISIS or Hezbollah assholes who survived the assault with them. Does it help your operation to haul in cartel guys? Dempsey asked BT. Nah, BT said. What would help is if this operation looks like it isn't a DEA raid. In fact, if the Zetas come away believing the CIA or some black ops team hit them because of their work with Hezbollah, maybe they'll stop this terrorist training bullshit once and for all. Amen to that, Dempsey said with a nod. Then to the group he said, All right, people, final checks and it's go time. Five minutes later he was leading his team silently through the NVG-lit jungle. He tried to relax, but that was impossible, leading a mixed team with shooters who'd not worked together before. He knew the SEALs, whom he had positioned right side rear of his V-shaped eight-man squad, were solid. He'd operated with Mendez before, so no worries there. That left the four DEA guys, who BT assured him were solid, and Adamo. He'd positioned the CIA man close on his left in case he needed to be managed. Dempsey had expected foot snaps and panting during the jungle trek, but so far Adamo had been pretty damn quiet. They weaved methodically through the tangled vines, exposed roots, and heavy foliage, a task that would have been impossible without night vision. The howler monkeys, who had been active at dusk, had settled down, but the jungle had since become a nocturnal circus. The buzz of insects and cacophony of a thousand tree frogs reverberated all around them. The humid, warm air coupled with perspiration made Dempsey's clothes cling to his skin. He inhaled the Guatemalan jungle and could almost taste the miasma of decaying foliage, the musk of earth, and a hint of sweetness from tropical flora. The team mirrored Dempsey's lead, moving in combat crouches and scanning over their rifles through holographic sights as they advanced. The warning BT had given him earlier that day played in his head. The drug cartels are investing serious cash money in high-tech gear. They've got night vision and drones, so don't count on the darkness alone for providing adequate cover. Dempsey worked a path through the jungle accordingly, weaving to maximize foliage cover both overhead and in front. As they approached the target, the bright lights inside the camp told him that the only night vision counter-detection threat they could possibly face was from roaming patrols outside the walls. With so much light inside the perimeter, anyone on greens would go blind, even the shooters in the towers. Twenty feet from the camp, he halted their advance and surveyed the layout. The camp vaguely resembled a medieval castle, 
with an impressive 20-foot-tall cinder block wall and two gunner towers. The cartel had clear-cut and burned a swath of jungle ten feet wide around the outside of the wall. Although not intended to be a moat, the gap had become a nasty bog with standing water where daily rain and runoff pooled at the base of the wall. So far Dempsey had yet to encounter a roving patrol. Considering the density of the jungle and sloppy nature of the perimeter, now he understood why. He slowly and silently advanced his team the final few yards into position at the edge of the forest line. Once they were fanned out and set, he keyed his mic and spoke softly into the small boom by the corner of his mouth. Doobie two, one. Position, he said, trying not to chuckle at the call sign Chunk had suggested. One, two, is nearly in position, stand by. Chunk was cool and collected. Just another day at the office. Eagles, he whispered, calling the two seal snipers up on the ridge line. Eagle one, Tango is lit. Eagle two is no joy. Dempsey sighed. Wait, I have him. Must have had to take a leak. Second Tango lit. In the tower, Eagle two? Check. Roger, Dempsey said. Doobie two, call position and ready. Two clicks in his headset told him Chunk would let him know when his team was in position. Dempsey began the familiar kata of checking over his gear, especially his ammo pouches. He felt over his Sig Sauer 556 rifle and looked through the holographic sight to be sure the red hologram target floated out in space. He clicked off his PEQ-4. They would come off NVGs on the assault because of the lights inside the compound, so the infrared laser designator would be useless. Last, he checked that his pistol was secure in the drop holster on his right thigh. A crackle in his ear, and then, Doobie two is set. Dempsey took a deep breath, and then scanned the brush line around him. No movement, no bodies. Even Adamo was invisible. On the first shot, breaches to the wall for a quick entry. A double click. Eagles. Go. Before the single-syllable command was two seconds out of his mouth, Dempsey heard the familiar thud of a long-range, high-powered sniper round. Then he heard the clatter of man and gear hitting the tower deck. The assigned seal breacher sprinted to the wall and pressed a brick of C-4 into a crevice in the cement. A heartbeat later, he was trailing wire behind him as he dashed back across the brush line. Dempsey flipped his NVGs up in preparation for what came next. A baritone whump echoed in the night as the Team 2 breacher charge detonated on the other side of the camp. A half second later, his team's breacher detonated twenty feet away, and he felt the concussive shock wave in his chest. Then he was up and moving through the gaping, smoke-filled hole in the cinder block wall. Without turning to see, he perceived the flurry of movement behind him as his team followed him into the compound. On the other side, he blinked away the cement dust and smoke, reflexively holding his breath until he exited the cloud of acrid fumes and particulate. He turned left, clearing down the wall, confident that Mendez was clearing right in mirror image perfection. With his rear quarter cleared, Dempsey pressed left. Finding no targets, he angled right and advanced toward the heart of the camp. Billowing smoke, backlit by the camp's blazing halogen lights, obstructed his view. Suddenly a figure emerged from the haze, spraying bullets wildly with a compact submachine gun. Dempsey hit him with a single shot through the temple. The defender's arms went limp, but the legs kept pumping for two strides until the body pitched forward face first into the dirt. The staccato pops from his team's M4s and Sig Sauer 556 echoed steady and measured, but soon erratic bursts of enemy AK-47 fire joined the ruckus. As Dempsey advanced on the center of the courtyard, he heard BT's voice in his earpiece. There's a dude climbing up Tower 1. He tensed, hoping one of the SEAL snipers made the shot before the 50 cal lit up and ripped his team to shreds. The answer came a second later, over his headset. Got him said Eagle One's calm voice, a split second after his sniper round found its mark. The plan called for one of the DEA strikers on each team to advance to the base of their respective tower and take control, win control of the fifties, and they won control of the camp. It wouldn't be long now. Suddenly, he saw a wave of men, machine guns blazing, pouring out of the gap between the mansion and the barracks like hornets from a rattled hive. Within seconds, the defenders were saturating his team with disorganized, fully automatic fire. His team returned fire with deadly and systematic accuracy, and bodies began to fall. Dempsey sighted and fired, sighted and fired, dropping two enemy fighters in as many seconds. RPG! someone shouted. Dempsey took a knee and made himself small, searching for the rocket. 
It streaked past him and exploded against the wall behind him, wide right. Concrete fragments sprayed everywhere, but the impact point was far enough away that he escaped unscathed. Time to win control of those fifties. Eagle One, tower status. Both towers are clear, came the report. Eight and sixteen take the towers, he ordered. Dempsey sensed movement to his left and turned on his heel, looking over his rifle. A man wearing a silk shirt and sporting a handlebar mustache was waving a long-barreled silver pistol over his head and barking orders in Spanish at two younger men with rifles. Dempsey sighted in, but before he could squeeze the trigger, the man's head evaporated in a puff of red as one of the SEAL sniper rounds did its work. Dempsey pressed on, sighting the next asshole in line behind the teetering, headless corpse. He took the shot, dropping the first guy as the other tossed his weapon and ran for cover back into the barracks. One is going to take the barracks, Dempsey said in his mic. Still have shooters in the main house. Ten shooters down over here, Chunk said in his ear, followed by back-to-back -back gunshots. Two will take the main house. Dempsey scanned the courtyard. Another twelve or fifteen KIA on their side, plus three in the towers. They had already cut the opposition force by more than half. The cadence of gunfire was becoming more sporadic. These were cartel shooters they were facing, not jihadi martyrs. No one in this crew was fighting for virgins in the afterlife. Drugs and cash were not the same motivators as faith. One, Aiden, control of Tower One. Roger, light up the assholes on the balcony. One burst from the fifty caliber machine gun in Tower One, and the remaining cartel fighters began throwing down their weapons and surrendering. Then Dempsey heard the pop-pop of a pistol, followed immediately by the sound of an M4 in response. After that, all was quiet. They'd taken the compound without incident or injury on their side. Dempsey scanned for any holdout threats while his strike team members went to work pressing bad guys' faces into the dirt and flex-tying hands behind backs. Chunk met him in the middle of the courtyard where DEA strikers were cuffing the last of the cartel fighters. Anything? No terrorists in this group, Dempsey said, his head pounding. Had they missed them, or was Al Mahajer out in the jungle with his men somewhere? He motioned the DEA strike team leader over. Can you figure out who's in charge? We know most of these assholes, BT said. The guy in charge of the compound is that headless motherfucker in the silk shirt over by the stairs. Shit. Then find me someone else to talk to. Sure thing, just so you know. They have a briefing room in the main house. Dempsey nodded, grinding his teeth with what felt like a lifetime's worth of frustration. Bring them inside the house. We'll toss the briefing room and other buildings and see what we find. Hey, J.D.? It was Smith in his headset. Go, he said into his mic. You need to see this shit. I'm in the barracks building, all the way in the back. Dempsey looked at B.T., who gave him a thumbs up. He turned to Chunk. Toss the briefing room and the rest of the house. Find me something that explains what the hell is going on here. Check, the seal said. Moments later, Dempsey walked through the wooden door at the front of the first long building. The room was bunk-style beds on either side, all unmade with clothes scattered on top. Liquor bottles stood on windowsills and trash littered the floor. The room stank of body odor and cigarette smoke. Back here, Smith called. Dempsey moved quickly through the dump of a room. A narrow door at the back led to the second building, where everything was completely different. Each bed was meticulously made. No liquor bottles, no cigarettes, no trash. Smith stood next to a small writing desk, leafing through a notebook. Here, Smith said, handing over the book. Take a look at this. Dempsey flipped through the handwritten pages which were covered in Arabic scroll. He exhaled slowly through his nose. And there's this. Smith said, gesturing at the foot of the bed. Prayer rug. Dempsey scanned the room, noting similar prayer rugs rolled up neatly at the foot of each bed. Think they're coming back? Smith shook his head. I don't think so. No clothes, no bags, no personal items. Nothing but rugs, copies of the Koran, and this notebook. So why leave this stuff? Smith looked at him and waited, as if he expected him to figure it out. And then he did. If they don't intend to survive where they're going. Smith nodded. We just miss them. Dempsey's temples began to throb. How far behind are we? No idea. Maybe hours. Maybe a day. Let's go toss the house and interrogate the cartel guys. I don't care how many skulls I have to crack. Someone is going to tell me where they fucking went. 
Dempsey slipped the notebook into his pocket and then marched out of the barracks straight into the main house. In the foyer, Adama was standing over two men, both kneeling with their hands behind their backs in flex cuffs. He was speaking to them calmly in Spanish. Chunk saw him coming and hustled over to caucus. I think we got something, bro, the seal said. Follow me. Chunk took the steps to the second floor of the house two at a time, and Dempsey kept pace, eager for good news. Grimes was already in the large modern briefing room, not so different from the ember talk under the hangar. She was poring over what looked like a set of schematic prints. She looked up, excited. Check this out. She stepped aside as Dempsey bent over the maps and drawings. What am I looking at? Tunnels, she said. These are schematics of the tunnels that the cartel is building and using to move drugs, weapons, and illegals who pay for entry into the United States from Mexico. There are several tunnel designs outlined here. He suddenly felt nauseated. Oh, God. What? she said, grabbing his hand. Are you all right? You look a little green, J.D. Bawaba Samali, he mumbled. The northern gate is not a tunnel into Israel. Her eyes widened. It's a tunnel into the U.S., she said. al Mahajer is going to hit us, he said, nodding slowly. Oh, God, she echoed. Where are these tunnels? Dempsey said. The maps are unmarked, she said. They could be anywhere. There are dozens of known tunnels, plus God knows how many still yet to be discovered. Then how do we know which one they're taking? I don't know. Maybe Baldwin and the boys could have a look at these schematics and— No time, Dempsey said, cutting her off. These cartel guys have set check-ins, both radio and telephone. They also use social media to convey information with code words. If Al Mahajer is still with the cartel and doesn't know we hit this compound, there's a good chance he will— any minute, we need to know which tunnel he's using, ASAP. How? she said. Hot rage took control. Dempsey spun on his heel and headed out the door, pulling his SIG P226 from his drop holster on his thigh. What are you going to do? she asked, chasing after him with Smith in tow. He ignored her, descended the stairs, and strode quickly over to where BT and Adama were waiting with two senior cartel leaders. What have they told you? Dempsey said. Adamo sighed. Nothing, I'm afraid. Dempsey looked down at the two assholes on their knees. The older man on the right squinted up at Dempsey with a callous smirk, plastered across his chubby face. Ask him when al Mahajer left, Dempsey said, clutching his pistol at his side. Adamo said something to the man in Spanish. The man said something back and laughed. He says he doesn't remember. Dempsey raised his sig and fired a round through the man's knee. The man screamed in pain and surprise and collapsed onto his left side. "'What the fuck are you doing?' Adamo shouted. "'Are you insane?' Dempsey stared into the eyes of the man writhing on the floor. He saw pain, but he also saw terror. "'Ask him if he remembers now,' Dempsey said, but Adamo was silent. Dempsey shifted his gaze to B.T. "'Ask him.' B.T. nodded and spoke to the man in Spanish. The man answered, his voice quivering. He says the Muslims left this morning at 9 a.m. Ask him which tunnel they're using. B.T. spoke again in clipped Spanish. The cartel man began to cry and plead in Spanish. He says he can't tell us. If he does, he's a dead man. Cartel del Norte will torture him and murder his family. Dempsey looked up at heaven and exhaled. This is the part of the job I hate, he said to everyone and no one. Then he looked down at the bleeding, whimpering drug trafficker and, with a steady hand, pressed the muzzle of his pistol into the center of the man's forehead. "'If you won't talk, maybe your friend over there will. Lord, forgive me, but I have no choice.' "'They will cross in Mexicali,' the cartel man blurted in fluent English and began to sob. "'When?' "'Tomorrow.' "'What time?' "'I don't know.' Dempsey pressed the muzzle harder into the man's forehead. I swear it! The crossing logistics are always decided locally. Dempsey withdrew the pistol and slipped it back into his holster. Then he turned to Smith. If you were al Mahajer and you got word about this raid, what would you do? I would advance the timeline, the Ember Opso said. So would I, Dempsey said with a grave nod. Call the helicopters for Xville. We're leaving right fucking now. Chapter 23. 
Cartel del Norte Safe House, Mexicali, Mexico, October 28, 2130 local time. The bedroom door flew open and smashed against the wall, jolting Rostami awake from the first decent sleep he'd had in two weeks. Tell your crazy friend to gather his men and equipment, Arturo Garcia said. We leave in ten minutes. Rostami glanced at his wristwatch. What are you talking about? It's not time. We have been compromised. There has been an attack on our training camp, and there are indicators that the egress address in Calexico is under surveillance. We're not crossing, the cartel del Norte man said. What kind of indicators? How do you know this? No time for questions, Garcia snapped. We're not safe here. You have nine minutes or I leave without you. A surge of adrenaline vaporized Rostami's drowsiness. He swung his legs out of bed and quickly dressed. Less than a minute later, rucksack on his shoulder, he woke Al Mahajer and told him exactly what Garcia had said. Al Mahajer ran his fingers through his hair and let out a weary groan. I am the one who will decide when and where we go, not the cartel. Rostami laughed. A terrible scowl appeared on Al Mahajer's face. You think you're in command here? You think the cartel cares about you and your mission? The only thing they care about is money. Money that Hezbollah pays to lease their training camps. Best case scenario, Garcia tolerates us as an inconvenience. Worst case scenario, he decides we're a liability and he abandons us here. Where we can speak the language, have no support network and no place to hide. How long do you think it will be before the Mexican authorities find us? How long until we are handed over to the Americans? Don't be a fool, my brother. We have no choice but to do as Garcia says. Where is he taking us? Al Mahajer asked, rolling out of his cot. I don't know, Rostami said. But if I had to guess, Agua Prieta. Al Mahajer sniffed. The backup location? Rostami nodded. The ISIS lieutenant was silent for a moment and then said, Find out if this is where they are taking us, and if they will still support our crossing into America. And if the answer is no? Al Mahajer smirked. Then, as a fellow true believer, as the Persian who pledged himself to help me fulfill my destiny, it is your responsibility to negotiate a new plan. Chapter 24 Ember Corporation, Boeing 787-9, 520 nautical miles south of Mexicali, Mexico. October 29th, 0125 local time. Dempsey stared at the hand-sketched but remarkably detailed drawings of the tunnel system. In the schematic, the tunnels formed a complex on the Mexico side of the border with multiple tunnels originating close together and a third farther away. B.T. had spent time on the secure line with Baldwin poring over what they knew about the tunnel systems, where the known tunnels were, and where they suspected new tunnels might now be under construction. Baldwin had used this information, and considerable math and computer time, to confirm that the schematic did indeed suggest the tunnels in Mexicali, with two in Santa Isabel and Mexicali converging and merging together. B.T. called these feeder tunnels designed to route product and human cargo to a consolidation site prior to transport across the border. In this case, they converged at a house, and then a single tunnel made a relatively straight shot under the U.S.-Mexico border into California, west of Calexico. Dempsey had no idea how Baldwin and his boys had done it, but they calculated there was a greater than 78% chance the tunnels in the schematic ended in a private home at an address on Anza Road. What about the other schematic? Adamo had asked. Impossible to pinpoint without more data, had been Baldwin's answer. They'd known to look in Mexicali from Dempsey's violent interrogation, but to find the other site without any frame of reference would take time, if it was even possible. So to Mexicali they were headed. Dempsey hated not knowing where the other tunnel system was. How did they know that the drug smuggler had told them the truth? It would be far better to cover both tunnels and hit the one with the highest likelihood, but still post assets at the exits to the others. 
The current plan was to land at Marine Corps Base El Centro in California and then cross the border in DEA Blackhawks. He would have preferred to land on the Mexico side, but a Boeing 787-9 landing at Mexicali was sure to draw unwanted attention, and now Dempsey found himself wishing, ironically, that they were back in the Falcon for this mission. So far, they had not been able to utilize the wealth of additional gear, including a Humvee, two suburban SUVs, and several ATVs that were kept stored in the aft cargo hold, ready to roll into action. On the flip side, it was nice to utilize the 787's talk with real-time information flow instead of having data relayed from Ember back in Virginia. He looked up from the maps and fixed his gaze on Adamo, who sat bent at the waist, his face red, whispering conspiratorially to Smith, who was listening patiently and nodding. It didn't take a genius to figure out what they were talking about. Special Activities was Dempsey's unit, and Adamo would either have to adapt or ship the hell out. He hoped Smith was telling him as much. He looked back at the schematics. Something was bothering him, but he couldn't quite articulate it. It wasn't the assault plan. The raid was a textbook capture-kill with air support from the two Blackhawks. Dempsey's team would hit the house in Mexicali and either take al Mahajer down or flush him into the main tunnel. A DEA task force was already standing by in California, monitoring the exit house in case Ember was too late and the crossing happened before the raid. But if the crossing had already happened, or if al Mahajer was in the wind, they were screwed. Hope they're there, a familiar baritone said. Dempsey looked up at B.T. Me too, he said. I'm just worried they heard about the raid on the camp and pushed the timeline. If they go at all, B.T. dropped into the leather seat beside Dempsey. If they're in Mexicali, they'll go, Dempsey said. They have to because a border crossing like this requires support operations on the other side. Which means... Assets and logistics that were already in motion. Dempsey looked up again as Adamo took a seat beside the DEA strike leader. The CIA man shook his head. I disagree. It's better to slip the timeline than to get caught. What you need to understand is that Hezbollah and ISIS use a fractured, independent cell structure. Dempsey said. They employ old-school techniques like dead drops and face-to-face -face information exchanges that are immune to cyber surveillance. Individual cells will do everything possible to avoid communications that might leak information to our cyber warfare community. Once certain elements are in play, there's no easy way to stop the machine. So what's your point? My point is that even if they want to advance the timeline or change the location, they might not be able to do so because of the constraints imposed by their communication protocols. Granted, but let's not forget who we're dealing with. al Hajer is a tactician. You said it yourself. This guy has successfully avoided capture for a decade. Given recent events, I just don't see al Hajer crossing in Mexicali, Adamo said. Dempsey knitted his brow, confused. What recent events are you talking about? DEA and the Mexican Narcotics Task Force raided a house in Calexico with a tunnel linked to Mexicali a month ago. Dempsey looked over at B.T. Is that true? Yes, B.T. said. But it was a different system than the one on the drawing. I confirmed that. This is how the game works. We close a hole, they open two more. It's like playing fucking whack-a-mole. Whack-a-mole or not... Adamo said, pushing his eyeglasses up on his nose. These guys aren't morons. If there's heat on Mexicali, then I guarantee they'll look at alternate crossings. They must have a plan B, right? B.T. shrugged. These guys always have a plan B. A wave of dread washed over Dempsey. Shane, Dempsey hollered. Come here, bro, we might have a problem. Smith stood and walked over to them. What's up? he asked his eyes scanning the maps Dempsey had spread out. Adamo thinks we're headed to the wrong tunnel. In the corner of his eye, he saw the spook bristle before he added, and I'm inclined to agree with him. Okay, Smith said. But the Zeta you shot in the knee said they were headed for Mexicali. Maybe they were, maybe they weren't, but according to Adamo, they'll think Mexicali is too hot to risk a crossing right now. He looked at B.T., 
What's the DEA's opinion? Look, man, I don't know the M.O. for the guys you're chasing, but I know the cartel. And if they sense any heat, any heat at all, they'll zigzag. If I had to guess, the cartel will advise your guys to go black, wait it out, and try again when the heat dies down in another two or three weeks. Yeah, they could do that. But they risk us unraveling the rest of the plan. Our targets operate differently than the cartels because terrorists and drug dealers have different endgames. The Zetas are playing the long game. Their objective is sustainable. Covert drug trafficking. They can afford to wait because the alternative... Getting caught and losing a shipment and a tunnel is just too damn expensive. For a terrorist, the short game is the end game. If al Mahajir is infiltrating the United States to execute a terror operation, then he has a window of opportunity that must be exploited or he fails. Think about Brussels. ISIS moved that attack forward because Salah Abdesalam had been caught. They hit Brussels instead of executing their original objective, which was to hit Paris again. Dempsey looked up and saw that Grimes and Mendez had joined the group. Why did they do that? Why didn't they wait a few months, regroup, reset, and try for Paris again? Dempsey said, pressing the group to think it through. No one nibbled. Because they'd activated a sleeper agent who, once in play, couldn't be turned off. We've seen this before. We saw it in Germany when we stopped that shit two months ago. We've seen it in the U.S., they limit communication because it makes their activities impossible to track. But the downside of this approach is limited command and control. But it's still better to live and fight another day, B.T. said. Not for these assholes, Dempsey said. They plan to martyr themselves no matter what. To them, it is stabbing the great Satan in the heart and not missing the opportunity. The most important variable for them is how much collateral damage they cause, not their personal safety. Dempsey's right, Smith said. So, if I was al Mahajer, I'd push the timeline and change the crossing site. Awesome deduction, Grimes said. But we have no idea where else to look. We don't know the alternate location. I might, Adamo said. Everyone turned to look at the CIA agent. Adamo stared back only at Dempsey. Where? Dempsey asked. Adamo grabbed a map and the two schematics. He pushed the one from Mexicali away and pulled the other one closer. Do you see the dashed line around this map, a fence of some sort beside a winding road? And how would you possibly know that? I spent the last hour online, poring through maps of industrial compounds in Mexico, trying to match the layout. The large building north of two long buildings with another square building east. It needed to be on a winding road and surrounded by a fence. Aren't Baldwin and his geniuses looking at all of this? Grimes asked skeptically. Yes, Adamo said and clenched his jaw. But a computer can't fill in gaps from a hand-drawn schematic. Assume what is missing and what is maybe less detailed the way a human can. Go on, Simon, Dempsey said. So, I narrowed it down to about a half dozen, but only two are along the border. Of those two, only one has adequate proximity to an airport that would allow them to get to it within the presumed timeline. Adamo tapped his index finger on the map just south of the border with Arizona. Agua Prieta, Grimes said. Adamo nodded. If they cross from Agua Prieta, they'll enter the U.S. here in this little patch of nothing outside Douglas, Arizona. Smith started tapping on a laptop he had plugged into the pop-up panel in front of him. He clicked his wireless mouse, and the center screen in the bank of large, flat screens on the cabin wall flickered to life. A beat later, the middle screen flickered, and Ian Baldwin's face filled the screen. "'Good morning, Shane,' he said in clipped tones. "'Problems?' "'Jesus, does that man ever sleep?' Dempsey wondered. From looking at him, you'd think it's noon. Always, Smith said with a sigh. Ian, how long would it take to get a drone over Agua Prieta, Mexico? It's located just across the border from Douglas, Arizona. I know, Baldwin interjected. I was just about to call Adamo back, let him know we ran Agua Prieta through our algorithm. 
It looks like about a 67% chance this is the second location based on the schematic. We may be able to task a drone. I suppose the better question is, how much time do I have? Minutes, Dempsey chimed in. That's what I figured. You're in a brief with the whole team, by the way, Dempsey said. I can see you, John, Baldwin said with a little smile. What are we looking for? Activity, vehicles coming and going, armed men moving about, anything that looks suspicious. The target location appears to be an industrial complex west of Agua Prieta. Sorry we can't give you anything more specific, but that's all we know. Well, Baldwin said, pulling at his beardless chin, I can't possibly get any sort of UAV over the site that quickly, but, he raised a finger and his eyebrows, I can see what satellite assets may be over the area with our friends at NSA and the boys up in Fort Belvoir. I can also borrow time on Homeland's border camera systems. Give me ten minutes. Ten minutes, Smith said. Baldwin leaned in and the screen froze, a close-up of his right nostril the last image before he broke the connection. I need to talk to the pilots, Dempsey said. Are you sure? We should wait for Ian to let us know what he sees before we divert, don't you think? Grimes asked. Adamo leaned in. She may be right, Dempsey. This is only conjecture. Based on the information available to us, is this your best educated guess for an alternate crossing location? He asked. Adamo hesitated a split second, then, pushing his glasses up on his nose, said, Yes, then that's where we're going, Dempsey said, setting his jaw. We'll get a data dump on the area and see what we can build on top of that tunnel map, Smith said. Two of the other flat screens now held Google Maps images of an industrial complex in Agua Prieta, situated along a remote stretch of desert outside of Douglas. Dempsey left the talk and passed through a short hall with offices on either side. This opened into a sizable galley and then the cockpit. The cockpit door was open, the sport shirt-clad co-pilot leaning his back against it while blowing on a cup of coffee. The former Air Force tanker pilot looked up and smiled, but shook his head. A personal visit, never a good sign. What's up, Mr. Dempsey? Need to evaluate a change of plans, Dempsey said. He leaned in and nodded at the gray-haired, athletically built pilot sitting at the controls in the left seat. Hey, Steve, can we talk? What's up, John? Dempsey knew that Jarvis had filched the decorated aviator from the CIA after a full career flying for the Navy and then Delta Airlines. Apparently, the former Hornet pilot wanted back in the game in whatever capacity he could get. What would our ETA be if we diverted from El Centro to Douglas, Arizona? The pilot began tapping data into the navigation console at the top of the panel between the two pilot seats. Where would we land? the captain asked. There's nothing on either side of the border with enough runway. Oh, wait a minute. The pilot saw something and then pulled a chart out of a black case behind his seat. There is a field with a 12,000-foot runway about 56 miles north and west of the border. It's a joint civilian-military field that's run by the city of Sierra Vista and Fort Huachuca, an army base that adjoins the field. Why have I heard of them? Dempsey asked, searching his memory. It's the home for the Army Intelligence Center and NETCOM, plenty of runway there, and they can probably give us a secure place on the military side of the field if you're willing to read them into your up. I can read them enough to get us in. How much extra time? From here? Shit. Almost nothing. We're already burning the paint off this pig to get you on the deck as soon as possible. A turn now adds maybe ten minutes. But the longer you wait, the more time you add. The co-pilot had already slipped back into his seat and was punching things into his navigation computer. Make the correction, Dempsey said. He felt more and more certain with each passing second this was the right call. He was not letting that slippery son-of-a-bitch Al Mahajer slip away again. We'll work on clearances and the rest and have it to you right away. Roger that. Dempsey turned around and as he walked aft he could feel the Boeing banking as the pilot made a correction to the right. In the talk, Baldwin was back up on the screen nodding, and Mendez and Grimes were crowded around the handwritten maps, which were now reproduced on a monitor with red lines overlaying a size-corrected satellite image. 
Smith and Adamo sat side by side in front of Smith's computer discussing something, and in the back of the room, four of the eight DEA shooters now stood looking around in awe and sipping coffee. Chunk came in with his four seals in tow. What's all this, bro? Chunk asked, gesturing to the beehive of activity. Threw a party and forgot to invite us? Dempsey held up a finger. Baldwin leaned back in his chair on the center screen, talking to someone out of view. So? Dempsey asked Smith. The last satellite pass is two and a half hours old and not the best angle, but there's definitely vehicle activity in the complex, which, based on historical imagery, is abnormal for that time of night. Dempsey felt a twinge of validation at the news. He gave a curt nod to Adamo, who returned the nod. Any useful camera feeds from the Homelander Border Patrol? Nothing yet, but they're working on it. The cameras are pretty widely spaced, and, no surprise, the facility falls right in between two of them. Probably not much help. Baldwin says he may have new satellite imagery in 20 minutes, which means he will. It's Baldwin, after all. Smith crossed his arms and looked at Dempsey. What do you want to do? Already did it. Talk to the pilots and we're going to Arizona. If we need to divert back to California, we will after Baldwin checks the next sat feed. Okay, Smith said. What about air support? Our best option is Fort Huachuca. The Army Intel Base? Smith asked. Dempsey nodded. It's the only place with enough runway, but it's perfect. Far enough from the border to not be seen, but only 25 mics from the target and Blackhawks. Simon, you and Elizabeth work on getting us air support for the infill. Ideally, we want 60s, armed 60s, with door gunners for CAS. Shane, please coordinate with the boss back home and try to get us some eyes and ears on the target. Oh, and also see what we can get on the U.S. side for additional support. Border patrol, local law enforcement, anything. I don't care. Any questions? No one said anything. All right, then. Let's get to work. We land in under an hour, so be prepped and kitted up by then. He clapped his hands together. Let's go. Failure is not an option, people. Chapter 25 Main Warehouse Alto Semex, Incorporated, West Agua Prieta, Mexico, October 29, 0245, local time. Rostami paced the soles of his shoes making a dull scratching sound on the dusty cement floor. The Americans are coming. The Americans are coming. The Americans had carried out the attack on the cartel compound, he was certain of it. The fact that Garcia had shared precious little information with them was confirming evidence. Hijar had abandoned them in Mexico City, just as he had promised, and now Rostami had no way to contact Hezbollah to learn the truth. As a VVAC operator with years of field experience, Rostami had learned to trust his eyes and his ears. He had learned that the information people refused to share was often just as important as the information they chose to share. Had a rival drug cartel attacked the compound, he would know all the details by now. Garcia's men would be chest-pounding and brazenly discussing revenge. But the men were not doing this. Instead, they were silent, solemn, and skittish. They were afraid. In recent years, it was common for the American Drug Enforcement Agency to partner with U.S. Special Forces in their war on drugs. Even in faraway Tehran, there had been rumors that the elite Navy Tier 1 SEAL team had executed the final raid on the doomed drug lord Pablo Escobar. That the Americans had attacked the Guatemalan compound was not the question. What mattered was whether they were attacking the Zeta stronghold in their war on drugs or targeting it as a Hezbollah training site. Had the Americans already made the connection between the meeting in al Qaim and this operation? Had Amir Modiri been wrong about Parviz? Had the VVAC operative cracked under interrogation and told the Americans everything? What had the Americans learned from the raid on the Zeta compound? Were they interrogating the senior cartel detainees at this very moment? If so, the only advantage left was time. Rostami had grudgingly come to respect al Mahajer for his tenacity and intellect. That the man had survived more than a decade while being on so many capture-kill lists was itself an achievement, but Rostami also knew that al Mahajer possessed a keen mind for tactics and the psychology of human motivation. Surprising for someone who had lived like an animal for so many years. 
But the closer they marched toward their objective, the more impassioned and committed the Islamic State lieutenant was becoming. En route to Agua Prieta, Rostami had tried to convince al Mahajer that living to fight another day was an act of prudent courage, all the while knowing he was wasting his breath. When the Syrian announced simply, We will strike at the heart of the devil and we will succeed because it is Allah's will, Rostami had known the debate was over. There was no reasoning with religious zealots, no matter how talented in warfare and covert operations they were. Rostami had been forced to breach protocol and reach out to his Suren teams, providing them with new instructions for pickup in an entirely new location. It was too many moving parts. He trusted his sleeper agents and had every reason to believe they would be in place, but the rapidly changing plans made him worry more and more. Failure would do more than destroy the jihadists' plan to strike America. It could unmask the Suren operation that had taken decades to implement. He watched with irritation as al Mahajer roused his small band of martyrs to find their courage. The man was gifted with an inspirational tongue, but if he truly wanted to serve Allah, he'd best find his way to brevity. Rustami looked at the Rolex submariner on his wrist. They needed to go. Now. al Mahajer finished with a flourish, and his band of brainwashed jihadis all raised their rifles above their heads and began shouting praises to Allah. Rostami glanced at the stoic cartel fighters, Catholics everyone, and wondered how many were contemplating gunning down the crazy Muslims who were going to get them killed. Enough, you fools! Rostami cleared his throat, loudly. al Mahajer looked over, his eyes blazing, then turned back to his men. He walked over and stood in front of the young man called Farouk, friend of the recently sacrificed Nabil. Farouk was kitted up like an operator. He wore one of al-Mahajer's special Hezbollah-constructed bulletproof suicide vests, a Kevlar helmet, and a sidearm, and he clutched an AK-47 in his hands. Rostami watched as al-Mahajer placed a hand on Farouk's shoulder. "'It is time, my brother. The Americans are coming,' he said softly. "'Are you afraid?' "'No,' Farouk said, blood rage in his eyes. "'I am afraid of nothing.' except failing in my service to Allah. It is Allah's will that you remain behind, so that we may complete our mission and strike the heart of the great Satan. You will safeguard our passage. You alone must shoulder this burden. Farouk nodded. I will not fail you. al Mahajer embraced Farouk, then beckoned Rostami. We are ready for you to lead us into the heart of America. With Farouk staying behind, only five would make the crossing. The rest of the group was dressed in American clothes, each different and carefully curated depending on their cover story and which Suren team was picking them up. Amahajer, having shaved his beard entirely, looked neutered, all the ferocity gone from his face. Rostami checked his watch again. It's about fucking time, he said, turning his back on the Muslim. He led them to the tunnel entrance, a hole in the concrete floor next to a row of tool and equipment cages. The hole was normally covered by a thousand-ton hydraulic press that had taken a forklift to move out of the way. Next to the hole stood Garcia, armed and tapping his foot impatiently. Rostami extended his hand to the cartel man. Thank you for everything. Garcia looked at the hand, but did not shift his own from the grip of his machine gun. Go now and do not turn back. When the last of you is below, the hole will be sealed. This is a one-way trip. Rostami said nothing, slung his machine gun over his shoulder and eased himself down into the hole until his right foot found the first steel ladder rung. He counted twenty-seven rungs as he descended into the dark tunnel. At the bottom he switched on his flashlight and wondered how Rafiq al Mahajer intended to compensate for the loss of Farouk. Would he still try to hit three sites with only five men, or would he try to recruit a replacement? The Suren Circle assets would provide logistical support as well as transportation, but they would not, under any circumstance, participate in the attacks. When the last of his companions was down, Rostami looked up and watched the eclipse taking place above, 
as the hydraulic press was moved back into position over the hole. All went black, and it was done. No turning back now. Without a word or a glance behind him, he put his right foot in front of his left and set off into the tunnel at a brisk pace. The tunnel stank of urine, quicklime, and mold, and so he switched from breathing through his nose to his mouth. He wondered how old this tunnel was and the last time it had been used. How could the Americans, who seemed to possess prescient insight into every foreign clandestine operation in the Middle East, not know about all these cartel tunnels into their territory? Unless, of course, they did know and chose not to shut them down. But why? Parshan, Rafik said, jolting Rostami from his thoughts. I do not know your assets. I will need you to personally and visually confirm their identities before I split my men. I wish I could, Rostami said. But they have been asleep in the U.S. for years, some of them decades. I have never met any of them. We will know them by their vehicle license plates and the challenge phrase authentication. I assure you that our operation is secure. If the Suren Circle were compromised, we would have known long before today. With Nabil's sacrifice and Farouk's assignment, I am one man short for completing the operation. Here it comes, Rostami thought. He's going to ask me to martyr myself. You are a man of God, Rafik continued. It would bring great honor to your family and your country if you would join our jihad. Rostami stifled the urge to mock the man with laughter. Al Mahajer was as unpredictable as he was brilliant. To flat out refuse was to risk a knife in the back when he least expected it. Best not to antagonize the man. It's a great honor that you would consider me worthy of joining your team. I will contemplate your offer and inform you of my decision after we are safely in America. As they walked in silence, Rastami calculated their odds of safely crossing the border. He settled on fifty-fifty, a coin flip's chance that he would escape this tunnel alive and disappear into the American night. The irony of al Mahajer's invitation to join the jihad and martyr himself suddenly hit him. By agreeing to serve as the escort, he had already enlisted in the radical Muslim's jihad, whether he admitted as much or not. Because if the Americans pursued them into this tunnel— he would make his last stand with these five lunatics and have no choice but to martyr himself in the dark. Chapter 26 Military Ramp Fort Huachuca, Sierra Vista Regional Airport, Sierra Vista, Arizona October 29, 0255, local time Dempsey ended the call with the DEA support team in California watching the house where the Mexicali Tunnel terminated. The report had been exactly what he needed to hear. No activity. When taken together with the latest Agua Prieta satellite imagery showing new vehicles parked at the Semex complex and armed men walking the fenced perimeter, he had all the information he needed. The next time he saw Rafiq fucking Al Mahajer would be in his gun sight. The instant the air stair touched the side of the Boeing, he led his team off the plane. The tarmac was well lit, and he could see the two MH-60 Blackhawks sitting on the skirt in front of the low gray hangar, their blades turning overhead. The whine of their twin General Electric T-700 GE-401C engines was as familiar as the feel of his heart beating in his chest. The smell of the jet fuel was an operational aphrodisiac, stirring his emotions in preparation for combat as he jogged across the ramp. The team assignments were unchanged from Guatemala, with the exception of adding Gyro to his squad. The two SEAL snipers would, once again, provide high-side fire support. Dempsey led his team to the front helicopter, climbed past the starboard side fifty caliber machine gun, and grabbed a patch of canvas near the front. His teammates piled in behind him, quickly and efficiently. He nodded to the air crew man on the canvas bench beside him, clad in a flight suit over which he wore a full kit with ammo pouches, and an M9 pistol holster on his chest. The man nodded back, and Dempsey tapped his own headset and held up the mail adapter that he had pulled from his encrypted radio. The airman nodded, took the cord, and plugged it into the Vox panel beside him. "'Evening, sir,' he said. "'You my door gunner?' Dempsey said. "'Door gunner, air crew, combat medic, and ass-kicker, sir.' 
P.J.? Dempsey asked with a smile. Yes, sir. One of three for your op. Quack over there is our buy one, get one free special today, and we've got another guy in bird, too. The other para-jumper, Quack, nodded to Dempsey from his seat on the far side of the helicopter. Can I talk to the flight crew? Dempsey said. The PJ nodded, flipped a switch on his panel, and then gave Dempsey a thumbs up. Dempsey moved forward to the big gun and then, hanging out the door, tapped on the cockpit door window. The aviator at the controls looked up from his checklist and slid a large rectangular panel backward. He reached out a gloved hand, which Dempsey shook. Thanks for the support, Major, Dempsey said, noting the gold oak leaf on the pilot's shoulder. Happy to help you, spooky motherfuckers, the man said his voice arriving in Dempsey's headset just out of sync with the movement of his lips, which now stretched into an easy smile. You got me and Colonel Boyd in the other seat. They said you wanted experience, and we're both AFSOC guys. Lucky break, Dempsey said. Appreciate it again, and sorry for the short fuse. You get the details? Yeah, the pilot said, and then leaned over when Colonel Boyd pointed to something on the panel. The major cycled a switch and then gave Boyd a thumbs up. He turned back to Dempsey. We'll fly the brief as your guy sent it. Helos splitting east and west at the border, crossing at less than a hundred feet and well a beam of your target. We'll converge on the corners at opposite angles. You still want to drop inside the wall? Yes, if possible. Okay, can do, but we're not set up for fast roping, so it'll be a touch-and-go delivery. We'll cool the LZ with the fifties first. Only reason to not put into the compound would be if it's too hot, but that won't happen, he said and gestured at the fifty caliber behind his door. Dempsey got the sense that, for this AFSOC pilot, there was never really such a thing as too hot. He gave the pilot a nod and a tight smile, and then quickly reviewed the tactical channels. Copy, the pilot said. Kazivak is your call. We got three PJs and then an army medic in bird two. Check, Dempsey said. Davis Monthan Air Base for flesh wounds and the civilian trauma center in Tucson for mortal injuries. Roger that. Dempsey shook the pilot's gloved hand again and then ducked under the fifty and slid back through the long, open hatch. He hooked in with the safety harness attached from his belt to the canvas bench at the rear and sat with his feet dangling out the door. He looked longingly over at the same seat on the port side of the aircraft, his favorite spot for twenty years with the teams, and sighed. A moment later the engines whined, the wind picked up, and the Black Hawk lifted off. A heartbeat later... The helo nosed over and accelerated over the ramp. Once they were at altitude, the pilot banked left and punched the throttle. Dempsey estimated they'd be on the ground in less than thirty minutes. That thirty minutes vaporized while he went over the assault plan one last time with his team. Normally, briefing on the infill would be unheard of. Everyone should know his role backward and forward, but on the continuum of short-fuse ops, this fell near the no-fuse end of the spectrum, so... He didn't dare leave anything to chance. After fielding questions, he turned to the sniper sitting on the canvas bench across from him. You picked your spot? Yeah, he said. Unfortunately, we can't get super high without a second drop. No matter really, because there's nothing tall on this target. You guys will be hitting the north building, so we'll take position on the big warehouse to the west. I'll take the northeast corner, and Davis will take southeast. Dempsey nodded. Let's have the pilots put you on the roof after we offload inside the fence. Cool? The sniper gave him a thumbs up and relayed the new plan to his partner in the other bird. Dempsey relayed the plan to the pilot, who replied with a, No problem, we'll clear the roof with the fifties on the infill if needed. Satisfied everything had been covered, Dempsey leaned back against the bulkhead. The chatter died down as everyone sought the zone. Both birds were completely lights out, screaming across the desert floor at 150 miles an hour. Dempsey felt a powerful wave of deja vu as he looked out across the terrain, terrain that could have passed for the western Iraqi desert he'd flown over just days ago. In some ways, he felt like he knew that shithole country better than his own, just like he'd known his dead teammates better than the wife and son he'd abandoned. Not now, not today, he chastised himself. Only one person matters right now, and that person is Rafiq al Mahajer. He forced his mind out of the gutters of regret and back to the present, mentally reviewing the satellite imagery of the Semex industrial complex, mapping the assault paths, identifying hides for shooters. 
noting cover locations for his team in the event of RPGs or grenades. He conducted the complete mission in his head, breaching the North Building, tracking down Almaha Jair and his men, and then killing them all before they could make their escape. The helicopter banked sharply left, and he watched the fence that functioned as the U.S.-Mexico border whiz past them just under his dangling feet, the lights that lit the top every fifty yards little red blurs in the dark. Two minutes. The pilot sounded as calm as if he were out for a Sunday drive. We'll make two low passes first and soften the field with the fifties. The PJs on either side of the cabin unlocked their machine guns and cycled rounds. Dempsey watched the gunner turn on the IR laser designator and sight it on the ground below to make sure he could see the green dot with his NVGs. Dempsey performed the ritual last check of his gear, weapons, and ammo pouches reflexively, as the other fighters did the same. He was good to go. They were all good to go. First pass, came the report from the cockpit. They banked right and then left, and then dropped down so low Dempsey thought if he stretched a little he could drag a boot in the dirt. Then his guts felt heavy as the helicopter popped up and over the fence surrounding the industrial complex. An instant later, scattered muzzle flashes punctuated the darkness as shooters on the ground began to engage. He had flipped up his NVGs an instant before the gunners lit the fifties and tongues of white fire licked the night beside him. He watched the tracers tear across the ground and along the fence line. Something exploded to his left, a pickup truck most likely, lit up by the other helicopter. Dempsey grabbed the edge of the door and braced himself a split second before the pilot initiated an evasive maneuver. One of the DEA shooters wasn't so lucky and slipped off the canvas bench, his harness keeping him from falling out of the helo. Adamo helped pull the scrambling operator up and back into his seat. "'Holy shit, this is nuts!' someone said on the command channel. "'We're okay,' came the relaxed voice of the pilot. "'Pass two, starting now.' They crossed this time from north to south, and the door gunners engaged more effectively. Dempsey watched shooters below flee toward the warehouse, only to be cut down mid-stride. One poor soul pitched forward and slid all the way to the door, while both of his legs and half of his torso remained five yards behind in the dirt. The engines whined, and they were pitching up again and banking in the opposite direction. "'This is it, guys. Get ready to drop,' the pilot called. Dempsey unhooked his harness from the bench and leaned out the door of the helicopter, one hand on the rail at the edge of the door, and the other gripping his rifle and bringing it up to bear. The helo flared, and before the skids touched down, Dempsey was out. He moved right and toward the rear of the Black Hawk, taking a knee and scanning over his holographic sight, watching his green IR target designator dance as he searched for targets. In less than three seconds, the bird was lifting off, the rotor wash beating the hell out of him. The Black Hawk screamed toward the large warehouse to the west, barely pausing long enough for the sniper to leap out. Just to the north, the mirror image was happening as the other Black Hawk dropped the Team 2 sniper. Then the birds were up and gone. Spooky 1, Thor 1 and 2 are in slow orbit, standing by for supporter Xville. Spooky 1, Roger. Dempsey answered. God is up, came the whispered voice of the sniper duo in his ear. Copy, God, he said. He stood and circled a fist over his head, then led the team at a crouched combat jog across the compound. Mendez fell in beside him while the group of four DEA assaulters and two SEALs fanned out in an inverted V behind. Spooky Two is approaching the West Warehouse, Chunk said in his ear. The SEAL had moved his team fast to the large warehouse where aerial imagery had shown a contingent of enemy personnel. After clearing the warehouse, Chunk's team would set up a defensive perimeter at the target building. Sporadic gunfire erupted to the west, followed by shouting in Spanish, confirming Dempsey's concern that the cartel was providing cover fire for their terrorist clients. Chunk's team answered with controlled, measured response fire. Dempsey vectored his team toward the target building to the east. Shooter on the roof, came a call. He heard a shot echo from the roof of the warehouse as one of the snipers engaged the target. Target down. A body tumbled off the roof of the target building and hit the ground with a thud. Spooky one, this is God. Be careful on your approach. You have a few more tangos on the roof of the target building. Give us a second to clear. Roger that, Dempsey said. Cap them fast. There were a few more flashes, and then the sniper called back. Target roof is clear. A couple more came up, but they changed their minds and went below. Be ready for shooters inside. Dempsey double-clicked and moved further east. He had expected heavy resistance as they approached the target building, but so far it had been quiet. Too quiet. 
He heard continuing gunfire from the large warehouse where Team 2 was engaged in a hot gunfight. Spooky 2 is clearing, but we have a lot of shitheads over here. You guys okay? Check, we're good. Dempsey said. Do you need us? Negative, came Chunk's cool reply. We're fully engaged, but expect to secure in two or three mics. Dempsey surveyed the target building's west facade. The roll-up doors, elevated concrete apron with ramp and loading bays confirmed this end functioned as the freight dock for the building. The team scurried up onto the concrete landing and took positions along the wall. Dempsey crouched next to a metal entry door at the end of the row of bay doors. The team split and formed up on either side of the door, two DEA agents taking a knee and facing outward to cover their six during the breach. Mendez crouched opposite the door from him and nodded. Dempsey reached up, grabbed the door handle, and pulled down. The handle dipped, the latch disengaged, and the door drifted open an inch. Unlocked? What the fuck? Dempsey put a flat palm over his other fist and popped it away, then flared out his fingers. Toss a flashbang. Mendez nodded and fished a non-lethal grenade from his kit with his left hand. He pulled the pin and nodded. Dempsey pushed the door open enough for Mendez to toss in the grenade and then shut it. He waited for the muted explosion and then flung the door open wide. Mendez charged in, crouching low and moving left. Dempsey followed him through the gap, expecting gunfire but getting nothing. He cleared the right side corner and continued moving right to make room for the rest of his assault team surging in behind. The main floor appeared deserted, but he noted plenty of hides, behind inventory stacks, inside tool cages, as well as atop two parallel catwalks that serviced an overhead crane. Dempsey cleared the nearby hides, then shifted his attention to the catwalks. Just when he thought the steel walkways were clear, movement on his right made him drag the green IR dot quickly to the corner, where he spied a man with a rifle running after someone else fleeing out a second-story window. The man with the rifle looked nervously over his shoulder, but he didn't seem to focus on Dempsey or his team in the darkness below. Clearly he was still night-blind from the flashbang. Dempsey was about to squeeze the trigger when a voice beckoned in Spanish from outside. The man immediately dropped his rifle and dove through the window. Dempsey's heart sank. These guys were cartel, too. Shit. Were they that far behind and the bad guys long gone? Was this the wrong building? Had he misread the intel? Maybe the tunnel entrance was in the West Warehouse. He considered calling Chunk and asking him to search for the tunnel in the main warehouse, but he didn't dare make a sound until they'd cleared the building. Spaced in pairs, they advanced in silent synchronicity, a creeping line converging on a metal partition wall. In the middle of the partition stood a twelve-foot roll-up door, and next to it a regular man-sized swing door, both closed. Dempsey mentally reviewed the hand-sketched diagram of this facility. On the other side of the partition should be a machine shop. Dempsey had seen similar industrial layouts before, where quadrants of warehouse space were partitioned to separate air-conditioned from un-air-conditioned spaces. He gritted his teeth. There was no telling what was waiting for them on the other side of that wall. To clear the other side would almost be like making another breach. Then an idea came to him. He looked up at the catwalks and noticed that they extended past the partition into the other space. He looked at Gyro and BT and pointed at the catwalks and gestured east. They both nodded understanding. He whispered the words, clear on two clicks, to BT, and the DEA team leader nodded. Moments later, BT had climbed up onto the south catwalk and Gyro was on the north, creeping silently toward the machine shop. Dempsey gestured for the remaining DEA shooters to watch their flank, while he and the rest of the team trained their rifles on the roll-up and swing doors. He glanced up just in time to watch both operators disappear from sight as they stepped beyond the partition wall. His respiration rate picked up in anticipation of gunfire, while his pulse kept time in his ears. Ten. Eleven. Twelve. They had the high ground, which meant they had the advantage. Thirty-two. Thirty-three. Thirty-four. Silence. No gunfire. What the hell's going on? Then two clicks in his ear. Dempsey exhaled and keyed his mic. Roger, we're coming in. Mendez led through the swing door, sighting over his rifle and moving right. Dempsey followed after him with Adamo right behind. Dempsey cleared the left corner and surged forward as Adamo stepped up and took the center lane. They cleared the length of the room, scanning around all the equipment until they reached the far wall. Satisfied, Dempsey waved BT and Gyro down from the catwalks. 
After regrouping, Dempsey stared out at the deserted machine shop floor with its hydraulic press, plasma torches, bending machines, lathes, and CNC machines. Sorry, boss, BT said with a sigh. Looks like we missed him again. Dempsey nodded. That same feeling of deja vu he'd experienced on the Hilo ride washed over him again, except this time without any of the nostalgia. Something was wrong. He just couldn't put his finger on it. He decided to radio Chunk. Two, one, target building is clear. Copy one, West Warehouse is clear. Six KIA and a couple of squirters. Any dead shitheads are just cartel guys. Not a single raghead in the mix. Looks like the cartel guys were prepping a shipment, though, which explains why they were hanging around. We have a pallet of shit over here that'll make BT smile. God, Sid Rep, Dempsey said, scowling. They're scattering like jackrabbits, the lead sniper answered. You want us to engage? They're bugging out. Negative, Dempsey said. One, you want us to come to you or toss the warehouse and see what else we can find? Chunk asked. Dempsey blew air through his teeth, then keyed his mic. Later, come help me find this damn tunnel. Copy that. Dempsey looked at Adamo. What do you think? Adamo hesitated a beat. Just wondering why they split their force. If this is the tunnel entrance, why so much security at the other building? Protecting their product. Adamo shook his head. Yeah, I guess. You think the tunnel is actually in the other building? Dempsey asked. The diagram showed the tunnel entrance hidden under a hydraulic press in a machine shop. This is a machine shop, and there's a hydraulic press right over there, Mendez said. But we'll need that fork truck over there if we want to move it. With a grin on his face, he turned and jogged off toward the forklift. Dude, do you even know how to drive that fucking thing? Gyro called and trotted after him. Dempsey shook his head at the thought of a kitted-up Mendez driving a forklift using night vision. Then... He noticed something that made his heart skip a beat. Hey, was that fucking cage door open before? He pointed to the right side of the room, the side Mendez had cleared, to a wire mesh tool cage door hanging ajar. No one had time to answer. Blinding muzzle flares and the roar of machine gun fire sent Dempsey to a knee. Bullets scoured the machine shop and ricocheted off the equipment all around him. Shooter in the cage, he yelled, making himself small as he pushed his NVGs up on his helmet and waited for his vision to clear. Gyro's hit, a voice yelled. Stay down, Mendez boomed. There were two pops from his right as BT returned fire and advanced on the ambush shooter. Dempsey's vision grudgingly cleared, and he made out a silhouette standing in a firing stance in front of the tool cage, spraying the room, haphazardly, with automatic fire. Dempsey sighted in, squeezed his trigger twice, and dropped the shooter. A body appeared in the partition doorway. Dempsey shifted his aim and identified the new arrival as the DEA operator he'd assigned to watch their flank. The DEA man immediately sighted in on the corner and, along with Mendez and a seal, closed in on the fallen shooter. Dempsey had only sighted on the ambush shooter for a fraction of a second, but something about that silhouette was wrong. Years of combat experience didn't lie, and his brain registered the problem. That motherfucker was kitted up. It's Romeo all over again. Stop! Dempsey screamed. Mendez, get back! The explosion knocked Dempsey flat on his back. Hot, wet, fleshy stuff rained down on him. He gasped for air. The wind knocked from his lungs. Despite his brain's frantic call for oxygen, he pulled his rifle up, got to his knees, and cleared the room for other jihadi threats. Still wheezing for his breath, he got painfully to his feet. Someone groaned. Dempsey looked down and found Adamo sprawled on the ground next to him. The CIA man looked intact, but Dempsey asked, You hurt? I don't think so, Adamo answered. Dempsey extended Adamo a hand and pulled him to his feet. Shoulder to shoulder they walked toward the carnage, Dempsey stepping over a severed leg with half the boot missing as they crossed the shop floor. Mendez, one of Chunk's seals, and a DEA operator were gone. Nothing left but horrific splatter. The explosion had knocked the hydraulic press over and decimated everything in a ten-meter sphere around the cage. Spooky one, sit rep, came Chunk's desperate call in Dempsey's ringing ears. Dempsey spit coppery blood from his mouth, then keyed his mic. Suicide bomber, 
he said. His voice was thick and not his own. At least three KIA. Behind the forklift he found Gyro. He rolled the seal over and saw wild eyes darting back and forth. Where are you hit? Dempsey asked. Gyro heaved in a spasm of coughing. In the vest, I think. And then that fucking explosion. I'm blind, Dempsey. Dempsey shined a light on the man's face. It was covered in blood, but he saw no major damage. He felt along the man's shoulders and neck and found no wounds. There was a deep hole dead center in the chest of his vest, but he could feel where the 7.62 rounds spread out on the ceramic plate. Round hit your sappy plate. Didn't go in, he whispered. You're going to be okay. The blindness is from the flash. We'll get you out of here. My right leg feels funny, Gyro said. Dempsey felt along Gyro's right thigh, but when he got to the knee, everything went mushy. He cocked his head and saw that Gyro's lower leg was turned around further than should be possible. He flicked on his light and saw the operator's BDUs were soaked in blood. He heard footfalls and spun around, raising his rifle. He looked up to find Chunk and the rest of Team 2 funneling into the machine shop. Gyro needs a tourniquet on his right leg, Dempsey told the lieutenant, who immediately pulled a blowout kit from a cargo pocket and went to work on his man. Dempsey keyed his mic. Thor, one. We need urgent Kazivac at the target building. His voice was sounding more his own and the coppery taste of blood was going away, unlike the ringing in his ears. He wiped his gloved hand across the side of his face and looked down at the blood and clots he picked up. One, Thor, Roger, what else? Maintain overwatch. One bird for urgent Kazivac and the other standing by for support next fill. He spit a glob of blood onto the ground, saw the gyro was being taken care of, and then walked over to the gaping hole in the floor underneath where the hydraulic press had been. This was the tunnel entrance he'd lost three men to find. He shined his light down into the hole, no longer worried about stealth or light discipline. A metal ladder, bolted into the concrete, disappeared into the blackness below. In his peripheral vision, he saw Chunk appear beside him and stare down into the hole. Drug dealers don't blow themselves up with suicide vests, Dempsey said. al Mahajer is close. I'm going after the fucker. You coming? Hell yeah, Chunk said. By now Grimes was on the scene and she went straight to Dempsey. You need medical? She asked, looking him over, her eyes wide. Negative, he said. We lost Mendez. All the color drained from her face. Suicide bomber? He nodded. Where's Smith? Coordinating the Gila landing for the Kazivac. Someone else can do that. We're going after al Mahajer. He keyed his radio. Smith, to me. Time to hit the tunnel. Twenty seconds later, Smith was at his side. All right, Dempsey said. Let's go. Dempsey squatted and then lowered himself into the hole until his feet found purchase on the ladder rungs. The tunnel was black as midnight, so he pulled his NVGs down and snapped them into position over his eyes. He sighted over his rifle toward the bottom of the tunnel while hanging on to the top rung of the ladder with his left hand. Clear, he said, and then began his descent. At the bottom he took a knee, sighting down the tunnel as he waited on Chunk, Grimes, and Smith. The rectangular walls stretched far into the distance before fading into gray-green static. When Smith's boots finally hit the ground, Dempsey popped to his feet. Stay on me he said to the group. The time for stealth had passed. If al Mahajer and his zealots were still below ground, they certainly knew by now that a team was in pursuit. Dempsey wouldn't put it past al Mahajer to station a second suicide bomber in the tunnel and told his teammates as much. Anything moves, Dempsey said, taking off down the tunnel. Kill it. Moving as quickly as a combat crouch would allow, Dempsey took point. His lower back ached and stingers flared down his left leg with each footfall. Chunk hugged the left wall, matching his pace, and he could hear the pounding of the other two pairs of boots behind them. After what he judged to be a hundred yards, they came to a sharp turn. Dempsey raised a closed fist and stopped just before it. He listened for a beat, but hearing nothing, he peered around the corner. Seeing nothing, he gestured with his left hand, and they resumed the advance. The tunnel jogged left and right with the occasional dogleg mixed in. At one point Dempsey felt like they'd doubled back toward Mexico, but it was impossible to know with certainty. His normally dialed-in internal compass was slowly losing calibration with every bend, turn, and switchback. They moved at a quick pace for what he estimated was at least a mile. Had they crossed under the physical border yet? The answer had to be yes, but how much farther until they reached the tunnel exit? He picked up the pace, his sense of urgency kicking into overdrive. The air was heavy and damp, and sweat was pouring from his brow. 
After a bend to the left, the tunnel straightened out. Unlike the buildings at the Semex facility, the tunnel interior did not afford any place to hide. There were no alcoves, offshoots, or doors. If al-Mahajer had left another suicide jihadi behind, interception was inevitable. Breathing hard now, Dempsey kept the pace for another four hundred yards, slowing only when he spotted the tunnel's end, a cement wall with protruding metal ladder rungs. Cursing silently to himself, he halted the team a cautious distance from the hole. He let the team form up around him before signaling for them to stay back while he investigated. Expecting a strafe of machine-gun fire or a falling grenade, he eased forward until he was able to angle under the hole and sight up with his rifle. The tunnel exit was covered with what looked to be a piece of plywood. "'Be ready for anything on the breach,' Grimes whispered. "'On me,' he mouthed, slinging his rifle. He pulled out his six-hour P-229 pistol and headed quietly up the ladder. Four feet from the top he looked down and saw his team waiting in a line beneath him, Grimes already halfway up. He nodded at her and then worked himself into a crouched position on the rungs as he took the next two steps, keeping his head below the plywood cover. He waited, straining to hear anything, movement, the rustling of clothing, breathing, but he heard nothing except for the sound of his pulse pounding in his ears. He took a deep breath and, lodging his back hard against the wood, slowly pressed up with his legs. The board was heavy, heavier than a piece of plywood should be, but he felt it give under his pressure. Grunting, he pressed upward with the power of both legs, lifting the plywood and a layer of fine earth, which poured off the sides and rained down around him. Then the board tipped and slid off his back. With the weight gone, he sprung the rest of the way out of the hole like a jack-in-the-box, raising his pistol and rolling right. Seeing no immediate threat, he scurried to a crouch and pulled his rifle into combat position while reverse holstering his pistol. He was in a small wooden building with a dirt floor. As he cleared the room, it became obvious this was a maintenance shed. Tools and yard implements lined the walls, and in the far corner sat a battered green riding lawnmower, along with a red five-gallon gas can. Dempsey moved to the right toward the wooden door. Moonlight streamed in through the slats. Grimes stepped up beside him. A heartbeat later, Chunk moved past him to the far side of the door. He nodded at the SEAL officer and then pressed his gloved left hand against the latch, took a deep breath, and pushed. The shed door opened into the backyard of a ranch-style house. All the windows in the house were dark, and the only light was from the moon overhead and street lights in front. The backyard was enclosed on three sides by an eight-foot wooden privacy fence. He heard laughter and music coming from the next-door neighbors, but this property was dead quiet. He stepped out of the shed and cleared the yard for threats. The scene matched Dempsey's memory of what the confiscated map had depicted. Using private homes to conceal secret tunnels had been an effective strategy for the cartel, and this tunnel was no exception. He crossed the yard in a combat crouch, his team in tow, keeping away from any windows and the noisy neighbors. With his back pressed against the wall, he slid forward, pressed the latch, and quietly eased open the wooden gate. The street in front of the house was empty, and so was the driveway. Grimes pulled up beside him and whispered, Now what? We clear the house, he grumbled. But you know what we're going to find. Nothing, she said. Yeah, they're long gone. The operation had been a total failure. Mendez and two others were dead, and Rafiq al-Mahajer had slipped through his fingers. Again. Part 3 The woods are lovely, dark and deep, but I have promises to keep, and miles to go before I sleep, and miles to go before I sleep. Robert Frost Chapter 27 Special Activities Equipment Locker Beneath the Ember Hangar, Newport News, Virginia, October 30th, 1250, local time. Dempsey shrugged the massive duffel off his shoulder and it hit the ground of his cage with a dull thud. God, it felt heavy, much heavier than usual. He stood, paralyzed, suddenly too exhausted to even contemplate cleaning his weapons and gear. He took a deep breath, and then another. His vitality was leached, as if half the blood in his body had been drained out. There was a briefing scheduled in the talk in thirty minutes, but the thought of rehashing the events of the past twenty-four hours in front of Jarvis was almost more than he could bear. 
The flight back from Arizona had been miserable. He'd cleaned himself up, washing the blood of his murdered colleagues off himself, but he'd not slept. He knew sleep was a lost cause, so he hadn't even tried. Instead, he'd sequestered himself at a workstation, searching the databases for clues and conferencing with Baldwin on what new data had been collected or insights gleaned. The answer had been none. Nada. Zilch. Despite immediately involving local and federal authorities in the search for the terrorists, the Arizona State Police and FBI bolos hadn't found a thing. Not one suspicious traffic stop. Not one drifter picked up along the border roads. Not one call from a hotline or a concerned citizen. Even the DEA and FBI guys, pissed off for not being invited to the party until after the fact, had found nothing of value while canvassing the Semex facility on the Mexico side of the border. No physical evidence had been left behind in the warehouses or the tunnels by al Mahajer's men. The cartel guys on site were dead or low-level pukes who knew jack shit. Everyone important was gone. al Mahajer and his band of crazies were in the wind, somewhere inside the homeland, and Ember didn't have a clue about their plan. And it was his fault. For the millionth time, he watched Mendez get blown to pieces on the video screen inside his mind, just like Romeo. Just like fucking Romeo. The seal inside him knelt and unzipped the black bag. John Dempsey could not bring himself to do anything at the moment, so he let the seal do what needed to be done. The seal pulled out the Sig Sauer five fifty six rifle and broke it down releasing the magazine, clearing the chamber, and locking it open, reloading the lone round into the magazine and then pulling the pin to separate the upper and lower sections of the machine gun. The seal laid out all the components on his workbench and methodically cleaned and oiled them. The seal put everything back together and stowed the war machine back in the rack among its brothers for the next mission. The seal pulled the battery from his radio and dropped it in the charger, cleaned his lights and sights with a lint-free cloth, and finally cleared and cleaned the pistol from his drop holster. And when the ritual was finished, the seal returned to the bag for something else to inventory or clean, and finding the bag empty, the seal left, leaving John Dempsey alone, head down, palms flat on the workbench, eyes rimmed with tears. You okay? Grimes asked. He didn't answer. You haven't moved in a few minutes, she said from the passageway in front of her cage, two down from his. I've heard seals have the ability to sleep anywhere, but I didn't know that meant standing up. After a long, awkward beat, she padded over. She didn't try to touch him. She didn't say anything. She just sat down on the concrete floor, cross-legged in the corner of his cage. When she didn't go away, he turned and glared at her, but she wasn't looking at him. Her gaze was fixed on something in her hands. He watched her rotate a small object over and over, robotically, with her fingers. What's that? he asked, his curiosity eventually getting the better of him. The left corner of her mouth curled up into a pathetic smile, and she tossed it to him. He caught it midair and opened his palm to find a Lego miniature. The little figurine wore a black mask and cape and had a bad emblem on the chest. Batman? he asked, cocking an eyebrow at her. It's my lucky charm. A poignant memory from his final mission as a Tier One SEAL washed over him. Given all that he and his brothers had been through, it seemed that this one memory was what his subconscious kept coming back to— Spaz and Pablo arguing on a helicopter infill about which superhero would make a better seal, Batman or Spider-Man. Ironic that this memory defined who they had been. Not superheroes themselves, just ordinary men with extraordinary ambition and the will to do an impossible job for their country. He smiled, a genuine fraternal smile, and sat down on the floor next to her. Your brother. Had such a hard-on for freaking Batman, 
he said. Yeah, he did, she chuckled. It started when he was five and he never grew out of it. Believe me, I know. We could be in the middle of a firefight and there was your brother going on and on about Batman. He cleared his throat and then did his best spaz impersonation. Hey, senior, help me settle an argument. Pablo thinks that Spider-Man would bake the best tier one operator. I told him only Batman is badass enough to make the teams, much less our unit. Dempsey started laughing. God, he really was a spaz. Her eyes lit up. That was pretty good, Dempsey. You sounded just like him. Then her smile suddenly morphed into a grimace and she started to sob. I'm sorry, he said. I didn't mean to. It's okay, she said, crying and laughing at the same time. I just miss him, that's all. He pressed the stupid little Lego Batman into her palm and wrapped his hand around her fist. Me too, he said, choking on the words. Me too. It's not your fault, she said, suddenly turning to look at him. What happened to Mendez is not your fault. You know that, right? He met her gaze. It absolutely is my fault. I led the team into the trap. I didn't see that fucker hiding inside the cage. She shook her head. Being ambushed is the implicit risk of every capture kill up we run, and it wasn't just you who missed the jihadi in the cage. Nobody saw him. But as the team leader, I'm accountable for the team's safety. When no one else recognizes the trap, I'm the guy who is supposed to. If you don't get that simple operational principle, you have no business being a member of special activities, your highness. She exhaled with exasperation. I don't like when you do that. Do what? When you say shit like that. When you call me your highness and Lady Grimes. Grimes is your name, he retorted, lamely. No, it's not. My name's Kelsey Clark. Not anymore, it isn't. That's where you and I and the rest of you knock-using motherfuckers disagree. Kelsey Clark will always be my name. Elizabeth Grimes is just a character. She's a myth. She's a legend. The way I see it, I'm an actor playing a part in Kelso Jarvis's grand film noir. But someday the director is going to yell, cut, and when that day comes, Elizabeth Grimes is no more. When that day comes, I finally get to go back to being me. Well, la de fucking da for you. He snarled and looked away. Must be nice. They sat in silence for a moment before she said, I'm sorry, John, that was selfish of me. Forget it, he said. If I were you, I'd feel the same way. Hell, I'm no better stalking Kate and Jacob on Facebook every chance I get. She scooted closer to him and laid her head on his shoulder. Neither one of them said anything for a long time. Have you thought about starting over? You know, if you found the right girl, I mean. He shook his head. Don't want to. Kate's the only woman I ever loved. The kind of love we had can't be replaced. I understand, she said hesitantly. But nobody said you have to replace her. Love doesn't have quotas, you know? Yeah, was all he said but he made sure his tone put an end to where he guessed this conversation was headed. She lifted her head off his shoulder and glanced at her watch. We're going to scoot brief in two, she said and got to her feet. As she was on her way out of the cage, he grabbed her wrist. Hey. What? If I can't call you Your Highness or Lady Grimes anymore, what the hell am I supposed to call you? She smiled at him. How about Liz or Lizzie? Or you could call me Beth. Maybe Bess. Do I look like a Bess to you? You're not a Bess, that's for sure, he said, getting to his feet. He studied her face for a beat. As far as pet names go, I'd say you look like a Lizzie to me. The genuine smile he got back told him he'd made the right choice. Lizzie it is, she said, turned, and headed to her cage. Two minutes later, he was slumped in a chair next to Smith in the talk. At the end of the table, to his left, sat Chunk, his eyes wide as he scanned the slick, high-tech room that was Ember's nerve center. 
His fellow SEALs were tucked in at Dempsey's house with strict orders to contact no one. As far as the world was concerned, the small contingent from SEAL Team 4 was forward deployed somewhere in support of OGA. Chunk had spent the last 15 minutes with Quinton Thomas, Ember's head of security, who had told him almost nothing, but instead had explained all the ways he would be fucked if he ever discussed the little bit he did see about their operation. The SEAL still believed that they were a covert team from the CIA, and that was for the best. As Dempsey watched Chunk, the wonder disappeared and he went back to grinding his teeth. For the first time since they'd met, there wasn't a smile on the LT's face. He must have felt Dempsey's gaze because he turned and gave a solemn nod. You all right? Smith whispered to Dempsey. Yes, Mom. Dempsey snapped with more venom than he had intended. Smith narrowed his eyes. Sorry, Dempsey said, looking away. I'm good, boss. Smith let it side. Grimes dropped into the seat beside them, the seat beside her. Mendez's spot sat painfully empty. Dempsey noticed that Adamo had taken a seat on the far side of the table, away from him and the others. He sat with his arms across his chest, his eyes locked on the empty table in front of him. Something in his expression caught Dempsey's eye, a melancholy he'd not seen before. Maybe Adamo was feeling... This won't take long, Jarvis said, entering the room from his office. The screens behind him were dark. Not a good sign. He scanned the faces in the room, drummed his fingertips once on the podium, and said, We all know what happened. No point in rehashing or reconstructing. We lost three good men, and we have a fourth in critical condition. I'm not here to assign blame, and even if I were, we don't have time for that right now. Rafiq al-Mahajer is in the homeland. Right now, as we speak, he is plotting carnage, and I think we're all painfully aware of how effective this terrorist is at dealing out death and destruction. Dempsey ground his teeth, making his jaw pop, garnering sideways glances from Smith and Grimes. I'm going to be straight up with you. We're as blind as we've ever been, Jarvis continued. For the past three hours, I've been in constant contact with FBI's Joint Counterterrorism Task Force, and there's no chatter. It's pin-drop quiet on every media channel. I have NSA doing a signals dump, but that's a long shot. They've pulled rabbits out of hats for us before, Smith said, almost hopeful. When they knew what they were looking for, but I don't think al Mahajer is plugged into the regular in-country circles they monitor. He recruited his own fighters outside the U.S., and he came in black. In my opinion, that was by design. Whatever network ISIS has in place here, he's not touching it. He's compartmentalized, and he has OPSEC discipline. Don't get me wrong. I have Ian and the boys looking at NSA data, but the same constraints apply. If he's not talking, they won't find him. We also have our friends in Mossad working on our behalf as well, but so far they have nothing to report. Sounds like we're fucked, Dempsey grumbled. Jarvis nodded solemnly. Maybe, but failure is not an option. Never give up the fight. Never give up the fight, Dempsey conceded. It was the tier one way. We will find something. And when we do, I need everyone at this table ready. That means I want you to rest and decompress. I know you all want to honor Mendez and the two other operators we lost, but remember, we are still in mission and sleep is a weapon. What about us, sir? Chunk asked. Dempsey could see the SEAL officer's leg was bouncing up and down with fury. I can't tell you what our timeline will be, Jarvis said. As soon as we get something actionable, we'll mobilize. That could be hours, it could be days. I probably should release you guys back to your command in case they have tasking for you. I'd prefer not, sir, Chunk said. We're just back from deployment and in training mode at present, nothing short fuse in our near future. If it's okay by you, we'd like to stay on here, Tad, and see this thing through. No surprise there. Chunk had lost one brother and Gyro was in the hospital. For the young SEAL officer, getting al Hajer was personal now. Jarvis nodded. We can do that, Lieutenant. They can bunk at my place, Dempsey offered. I have plenty of empty bedrooms. 
That would help him maintain security on the seals as well. They were professionals, and Dempsey trusted them to a point. But Ember couldn't have them in public or in contact with anyone until Al Mahajer was contained. Done, Jarvis said. We're on a one-hour fuse, people, so clean your gear, repack your go-bags, and check your comms so that they're ready to go. When we mobilize, it'll be right fucking five minutes ago. Everyone nodded. Any questions? Dempsey was about to ask Jarvis if he would be joining them for Mendez's memorial, but knew the answer, so he held his tongue. Jarvis fixed his gaze on Adamo, and when the CIA man looked up, the director of Ember curled his index finger twice, beckoning Adamo to follow him. Without a word, Adamo pushed back his chair from the table, stood, and followed Jarvis out of the talk. Dempsey watched with equal parts irritation and curiosity as the two men disappeared into Jarvis's office. I wonder what that's all about. He felt a tap on his shoulder and turned to find Smith standing beside him looking down. Where and when for the toast? My house, say, thirty minutes. Roger that, Smith said and turned to Grimes. Does that work for you? Yep, Grimes said. All right, see you then, Smith said and turned to leave. Hey, Smith, Dempsey called after him, getting to his feet. You gonna be here for a few minutes? Despite my long-standing policy never to let assholes into my house, Dempsey said with a grimace, If you want to bring Adamo with you, I promise not to make him wait in the car. Smith flashed him a sardonic smile. I'm glad to hear that, because I was planning on dragging his ass along, no matter what you said. Like it or not, bro, after that op, Adamo is blooded. He is officially one of us. Dempsey scowled, and as he turned to walk away, said, Simon Adamo will never be one of us. Chapter 28 Kelso Jarvis's Office, Ember Headquarters Have a seat, Jarvis said, gesturing to the chair opposite his desk. Adamo hesitated. If this is you firing me, I'll save you the trouble and— Sit down, Adamo! Jarvis interrupted, exasperated. I'm not firing you. Adamo dropped into the leather chair and folded his arms across his chest. The man looked absolutely haggard. Unshaven face, heavy bags under bloodshot eyes, and a gray pallor that was not entirely due to the fluorescent lights. Hell, Adamo looked even worse than Dempsey, and that was saying something. Jarvis stared at the man a long moment before saying, So, what went wrong out there? Adamo screwed up his face. Your man, Dempsey, is out of control. That's what went wrong. He rushed into both raids without a fully developed tactical picture, and that's a cold fact. Ember is a lean organization, and our special activities division is a short fuse entity. Could Dempsey have done more due diligence? Yes. Would we be any better off if he had? I'd argue no. In fact, we'd probably be worse off because Al Mahajer would have an even bigger head start than he does. Sometimes you have to act on incomplete information. The CIA man exhaled and met his gaze. I understand that. But you asked me a straight question, and I gave you a straight answer. I'm sure you were hoping the DNI was going to send you some guy who'd come in here and kiss everyone's ass and, yes, sir, every decision, but that's not me. I'm not here to make John Dempsey's life easy, or yours, for that matter. I know that. Which is why I personally requested you for the liaison position. Adamo sat forward in his chair. What? That's not how I understood it went down. The DNI assigned me to this post. Jarvis shook his head. No, the DNI mandated that Ember have an agency liaison, then he gave me pick of the litter. And you picked me? Adamo asked with a laugh. Why would you do that? I'm not looking to build a task force of clones. I want a team where each member augments and stretches the other member's capabilities. You bring unique skills and field experience to the group. Throughout your career, you've repeatedly demonstrated that you're not willing to sacrifice your integrity for personal advancement. Last and most importantly, I picked you because of your work on the Iranian Illegals Program. Adamo shook his head. That chapter in my life is closed permanently. I'm sorry to hear you feel that way, Jarvis said, tapping a file on his desk. 
because you work for me now, so consider it officially reopened. Trust me, sir, you don't want to go down that rabbit hole. The Siren Circle is a myth. I wasted six years of my life chasing false rumors and ghosts. Take it from a guy who staked his career on it and lost. The Suren Circle doesn't exist. I think it does, and I need you to break it wide open. Jarvis leaned forward. And I need you to do it in the next 24 hours. Impossible. Then hundreds of Americans are going to die on our watch. Silence hung in the air between them. Jarvis saw the consternation on the other man's face and knew Adamo was in the midst of a mental civil war. He was familiar with the story of Simon Adamo's crusade inside the CIA to prove the existence of an Iranian illegals program, a program run by Vivac and implemented on a scale and scope rivaling the Russian Residentura program. After the unmasking of Anna Chapman along with nine other SVR illegals in 2010, Adamo's theory gained traction inside the agency. He was given funding, a small team, and marching orders to identify and penetrate the Iranian illegals network in America. But his group was eventually shut down due to lack of proof and progress. The failure rebranded Simon Adamo from one of the company's rising stars into a real-life Fox Mulder, chasing a fringe espionage theory of his own design. What does the Suren Circle have to do with stopping Al-Mahajir? Adamo said finally. I don't care what Grimes and Dempsey think. I'm not convinced that guy in Poland was Vivac. All we know with certainty is that Al-Mahajir is working with Hezbollah. Jarvis inclined his head. We have signals intelligence that Tehran has been in the communication mix in the recent past. Adamo pushed his glasses up on the bridge of his nose. Encrypted signals data does not a conspiracy make. Jarvis tamped down his rising irritation. Before you came here, I presume Director Phillips read you into the events of Operation Crusader and the United Nations terror attack five months ago? Then you know that Amir Modiri, Director of Foreign Operations for VVAC, has been actively planning, funding, and coordinating acts of false flag terrorism against the United States and her allies. Al-Mahajir and ISIS could not have pulled off the border crossing without Hezbollah's assistance, but I don't believe for a second that Hezbollah would have agreed to render aid to the Islamic State without incentive from VVAC. Adamo nodded slowly. Let's say you're right, and VVAC is involved, and let's say I was right, and the Suren Circle actually exists. Why would Modiri risk exposing such a valuable covert asset to aid a half-dozen ISIS jihadists? Strategically speaking, it doesn't make sense. A fair point, Jarvis said. But you're not putting yourself in Modiri's shoes. Your older brother wasn't shot and killed by Americans. Your religious beliefs don't maintain that the United States and our Judeo-Christian Western society is the root of all evil. And lastly... You are not driven by a burning desire for revenge. To assess the risk-reward proposition, you must first view the decision through our enemy's lens. Okay. Okay what? Okay, I'll try. Excellent. Where do we start? California. I had a CIA there who I always believed knew more than he was letting on. Only before I was constrained. Adamo said, smiling wanly. As a member of Ember now, I can really put the screws to him. That's the modus operandi around here, if I'm not mistaken. The modus operandi at Ember is this, Jarvis said, pointing to the simple plaque hanging on the wall behind his desk. We do what others can't, what others won't, and what others are incapable of doing to safeguard innocent American lives. It's counterterrorism, Simon, not rocket science. I understand, Adamo said and stood up from his chair. Is there anything else, Director Jarvis? Actually, yes, there is, Jarvis said, picking up his coffee mug. And folks around here aren't going to like it. He took a sip, letting the cold, bitter brew linger on his palate before swallowing it down. For the next 24 hours, Adamo? You're in charge. Chapter 29 
5209 Brigstock Court, Williamsburg, Virginia, 1630 local time. To Mendez, the only fucking Marine I've ever known who smiled more than he scowled, Dempsey said, raising his beer bottle. To Mendez, echoed Smith, Grimes, Chunk, and the three loner seals. Adamo had stayed behind at Ember, no surprise there. Dempsey clinked his bottle against the others, much harder than he meant to, sending little puffs of suds up into the air. As he chugged what was only his second beer, he realized he was already feeling a buzz. Must be the lack of sleep, lack of food, and dehydration, he thought, taking inventory of the abuses he'd subjected his body to over the past forty-eight hours. Abuses he'd best soon remedy if he meant to remain functional. To Riley and Colt, Grimes said with a heavy voice. Riley and Colt, they answered in unison, and Dempsey realized that he had not known the names of the dead seal and the DEA operator until that moment. But Grimes had known their names. Of course she knew their names. And a gyro getting out of the hospital and back in the suck with the rest of us, Dempsey added. ya," the seals said in solemn unison, their minds still fixed on the brother they'd lost. Dempsey took a long swig of beer and then looked at the bottle in his hand. The red, white, and blue Budweiser label was wet and slimy from sitting in the ice-bath-filled cooler. He peeled it off easily with his thumb and index finger. He swirled the beer around inside the now unadorned glass and watched it fizz. Without the label, the beer could be anything. Slap a different label on the bottle and 99% of the people who tasted it would not doubt the brand, which raised the question, without the label, was it still a Budweiser? He shook his head as the metaphor hit home. Who was Salvador Mendez? The real Mendez, the stuff inside the bottle, not the label Ember had slapped on him. They should be toasting that. They should be memorializing the man, not his fucking knock. His mind flashed back to the conversation he'd had with Grimes just hours earlier. Elizabeth Grimes is just a character, an actor playing a part in Kelso Jarvis's grand film noir, but some day the director is going to yell cut, and when that day comes, Elizabeth Grimes is no more. What if he'd been the one blown to pieces by the suicide bomber in that warehouse? Would they be toasting John Dempsey and his make-believe life right now? Only Jarvis knew him from before. Smith had made his acquaintance before Yemen, but only Jarvis knew him when the label on the bottle said Jack Kemper. To everyone else in this room, he was John Dempsey. And to everyone outside of it, he was already dead. Kate and Jacob would never know John Dempsey. When it was his time to go, for real, only his Ember teammates would mourn his loss. He looked down at the slimy paper label stuck to his finger and flicked it into the nearby trash can with disgust. Then he chugged the rest of his beer. I'm going to get something to eat, he announced, suddenly remembering he needed to get food in his stomach before the buzz kicked in and took control. Who needs something? I'm starving. What do you have? Chunk asked. Nothing good he said, walking to the kitchen. I haven't been here in weeks. He swung open the pantry door and stared at the barren shelves. How about I order a bunch of pizzas? He called out. Yes, Chunk called back. Definitely. On me, he heard Smith say. Damn right, he mumbled, and opened a drawer beside the fridge, fumbling through the half-dozen delivery menus. He pulled out the menus for Z Pizza and dialed the number on his cell phone. Before the call connected, he felt his phone disappear from his hand, and turned to face Smith, raising the swiped phone to his ear, holding up a credit card in his other hand. I got this, Smith said. Get the spicy Hawaiian, Dempsey grumbled. Smith shook his head. Spicy Hawaiian? Dude, now I'm really starting to worry about you, he said, then turned his attention to the call. I'd like to place an order for delivery. Uh-huh. That's the address. Yeah, I'll take two large Z carnivores. While Smith finished the order, Dempsey walked back to join the others. He was surprised to find Grimes entertaining Chunk and the Seals with a story about Mendez. As he listened, he quickly realized that he didn't know this particular story. Must have happened when I was in Iraq, he thought. When she reached the punchline, Chunk and the boys howled with laughter, and he found himself laughing too, despite his sour mood. He looked at her, and her tear-rimmed baby blues met his gaze. She looked so vibrant, so strong, and so... J.D., Smith called from the kitchen. Dempsey looked over his shoulder and saw Smith holding out his mobile phone with one hand and waving him back to the kitchen with the other. The boss, 
Smith said simply. Yes, sir, Dempsey said, putting the phone to his ear. Do we have something? Not yet, Jarvis said, but the confidence in his voice conveying that a reversal of fortune was inevitable. But we're pursuing a new direction. Time to break up the wake and get everyone into the rack. Tell the team, including the SEALs, that I want everyone at the talk at 0600 ready to go. I need you here sooner. 0400 hours. I can come in right now. No, I need you rested. Take an Ambien if you have to, but get a solid eight down. You need to be ready to go full throttle tomorrow. We'll talk at 0400. Check? Check, he said. Then the line went dead. Smith was staring at him. What's up? Dempsey shrugged. Not sure. He says we're going in a new direction, whatever the hell that's supposed to mean. He wants me there at 0400 and the rest of the team reports at 0600 for weapons check, gear loadout, and a brief. Maybe Baldwin is on to something? Maybe, Smith said without conviction. We'll feed everybody and then wind down. I'll have Grimes pick up the seals on her way in. Cool? His phone buzzed in his pocket. He pulled it out and checked the screen. Looks like the skipper wants to talk to me. If it's important, I want to know, Smith. Don't leave me hanging until 0400. Trust me, if it's important, you'll be the first to know. But until then, get some sleep, dude. Dempsey nodded. He felt childish for being irritated that Smith was getting read into Jarvis's plan tonight while he'd have to wait until morning. Then a disturbing thought occurred to him. Adamo was still at the hangar. Adamo had stayed behind, which meant he had Jarvis's undivided attention. He wondered what that CIA bastard had managed to talk the boss into now. Whatever the new direction was, Dempsey had a sinking feeling it was Adamo's doing. What's wrong? Smith said, eyeing him with the same expression the head shrinkers loved to use. Rafik al Mahajer is what's wrong. I just want to catch this motherfucker, he said. And it's not just about revenge for Romeo and Mendez. It's our job, Shane. It's our job to protect and serve the homeland, and right now we're failing. An attack is coming, and we don't know when, where, or how. We'll stop him, Smith said. Let's just hope he doesn't stay dark. Hope is not a strategy, Dempsey said, eyeing his friend. I know. But right now, that's all we got. Chapter 30 University of California, Berkeley, Berkeley, California November 1st, 1155 local time Dempsey sat beneath the blue umbrella at a picnic table waiting for his mark and wondering if Jarvis had lost his mind. When the skipper called him in before dawn to talk, the conversation had been entirely one-sided. Jarvis hadn't called it a demotion, but that's effectively what it was. He'd given Adamo operational authority, and in doing so, Dempsey's worst fear had come true. Ember Sad was now working for the CIA. Wonderful. Here I am back to the beginning. Full fucking circle. He took a deep breath and forced himself to stop brooding and look at the book laid open before him, Cecil's textbook of medicine. If he didn't actually study the material, he knew that an experienced counter-surveillance operator would easily spot him pretending to read, thus raising suspicion. As he read, he periodically looked up to scan the quad south of the genetics and plant biology building for graduate student Adar Farhad. In his peripheral vision, Dempsey saw a tall, lanky male, not Farhad, approaching from the left. The young man was mid-twenties, sported green sunglasses and a tie-dye shirt, and had his hair pulled up in a man bun on top of his head. You the TA for Genetics 520? The kid asked. Nah, bro, Dempsey said. I'm at the med school, meeting my internal medicine study partner here. Oh, I think I'm, like, in the wrong quad the kid said and shuffled off in his Nike slide sandals with black socks, swinging a large pink backpack over his shoulder. That's the future, came Smith's voice in Dempsey's earpiece, as clear as if Smith were sitting beside him. America's intellectual elite. Dempsey smiled and shook his head. Heads up, came Adamo's voice, all business. He should be coming out of Koshland Hall any minute. I have him, said Smith. Coming toward you, Grimes. Dempsey had positioned himself facing west toward the Lee Ka Shing Biomedical and Health Sciences building. He looked up from his textbook and made a show of looking exhausted and rubbing his face. He immediately spied Farhad walking south on the sidewalk between a row of picnic tables and the building. Got him, he said softly, arching his back in a stretch. The face 
was a match in profile, but the young muscular Persian confidently striding across the quad did not match the pictures of the drug-addicted kid Adamo had shown them. Evidently, Farhad had cleaned himself up. Dempsey watched Farhad pull his mobile phone from his jeans pocket. Phone's out. I have him, Grimes said. Dempsey forced himself not to look south where Grimes was walking on an intercept course from the corner of the Geospatial Innovation Facility and Environmental Sciences Building. Instead, he looked at his watch, sighed, and started to pack his book and three different colored highlighters he had been using into his Surf Pro backpack. He stood just as Farhad walked past and pretended to hunt through the pockets of his backpack for his keys. He had the perfect angle to see the planned collision. Grimes was walking with her head down, mobile phone in hand, sending a fictional text when she slammed into Farhad, nearly knocking him down. She bounced off him and stumbled to the ground. "'Oh, my God, I'm so sorry,' she said, looking up at him from her hands and bare knees. She quickly scurried over the pavement, picking up Farhad's phone and her own. The handsome Persian extended a hand to her and helped pull her to her feet. Dempsey caught him peeking down Grimes' tank top at her breasts, jostling unrestrained beneath the thin cotton fabric. "'Thanks,' she said, standing up, both phones gripped together in her left hand. Back in the van, Richard Wang, Ember's tech genius, was back on the SAD team and was dialed into Grimes's phone, waiting for this exact moment to infiltrate Farhad's mobile. "'Not a problem.' Farhad said with a big smile. I should have been watching where I was going. A few more seconds, came Wang's voice over the comms channel, asking her to stall. No, it was me. I was walking and texting. Stupid. Asshole boyfriend. She looked at Farhad and flashed him a coy smile. I mean, ex-boyfriend, she corrected, looking him up and down and smiling with a blush. She ran the fingers of her free hand through her long, auburn hair and laughed. Sorry, that sounded slutty. She stuck out her right hand, the two phones still pressed together in her left. I'm Adeline. Adar, he said, smiling back at her. Are you sure you're okay? I think your knee is bleeding. She looked down at her right knee, the same knee Dempsey had noticed her dragging across the cement moments earlier. Oh, she said, looking down at the scuff. Just a little scrape. I'll be all right. Got it, Wang said over the comm circuit. I hope I can say the same about your phone, she made a show of inspecting it before handing it back to him. There's a little scratch on the corner, but the screen's not broken or anything. It looks fine, he said, giving it a quick perusal. Is yours okay? She flipped her mobile over in her hands. Yep, fine. Well, he said, smiling at her. It was nice running into you, Adeline. Yeah, literally, she said with a flirtatious laugh. He started to walk away, then abruptly stopped and turned back. Hey, listen, I was just on my way to grab a coffee. Do you want to join me? My treat for scratching up your phone. She put her hands behind her back and slipped her phone into the back pocket of her super tight white jeans and rocked her hips back and forth. Farhad checked the time on his phone and then said, Sure, why not? I don't have a class until two. There's a Starbucks just a few blocks from here, she said. I know it well. I live nearby. Cool. Dempsey slung the heavy backpack up onto his shoulder as Grimes and their mark began the stroll south. He followed at a distance, periodically losing visual contact as they passed between buildings and rounded corners. As he walked, he couldn't help but smile at Grimes's performance, babbling on and on like a nervous, flirtatious twenty-something already thinking about the one-night stand ahead. Are you a student? I mean, like, oh my God, of course you're a student. I met, what department are you in? Grimes giggled, and Dempsey could picture Smith rolling his eyes. I'm a grad student, finishing my Ph.D. in cognitive neuroscience, Farhad said. Good Lord, I don't even know what that is. It is the study of the biological mechanisms of cognition. Simply put, how the human brain interprets, processes, and stores data. Wow, sounds complicated, she said. I'm getting my master's degree in business administration. I'm going to work in pharma. That's where the big bucks are, but I hear it's tough to break into. He shrugged. I think you'll do just fine. You don't strike me as a woman who has trouble opening doors for herself. Thanks. No one's ever told me that before. Have you always been interested in the field of health and medicine? Were you pre-med in college? Pre-med? Are you kidding? She said with a laugh. I majored in French. French? Why? 
French. My parents made me go to college, but what I really wanted to do was be a model and live in Paris. I actually landed some swimsuit work, but the agencies all said I didn't have the right body type for runway. It was a stupid dream, she said, looking down at her feet. I don't know why I'm telling you this. No dreams are stupid, Adar said. And I, for one, think you have a beautiful body type. Those agents don't know what they're talking about. You really think so? She said, playing coy. Of course. Take it from someone who knows. Don't let anyone tell you what you can or can't do with your future. Dempsey watched and listened as the duo headed down the long steps past the corner of the biomedical sciences building, making their way west toward Oxford Street. He had to hand it to her. Grimes was good at this stuff. She'd set the hook and was steadily reeling in the shark. Suddenly his mind drifted back to something that Jarvis had said to him just before the team had stepped on the plane to fly out here. To stop Al-Mahajir, we need to leverage everyone's skills, insights, and network. And right now, Adamo brings more to the table in those categories than any of us. I'm not saying he has all the answers, but I can promise you that if the two of you don't work together, there's no chance we'll find Al-Mahajir in time. Maybe Jarvis was right. Maybe... Simon Adamo wasn't the problem. John Dempsey was. It didn't matter how they stopped al Mahajer. All that mattered was the end result. The truth was Dempsey had absolutely no idea how to find the snake, and it terrified him. If Adamo brought that capability to the team, then it was time for Dempsey to check his ego and put his personal feelings about the guy aside. Farhad just got a text message, Wang announced, snapping Dempsey back to the moment. The message reads, Want to meet for beers later? The number doesn't show up in his contact list. Phone's in his pocket. Dempsey whispered. Roger that, Wang said. Run the number, Adamo said in his ear. No shit, Sherlock, this ain't my first rodeo, Wang said. Dempsey caught himself grinning as he tried to assess every morsel of information from the event and ascribe tactical or strategic relevance, just like the instructors had trained him to do at the farm. Farhad received a text, but didn't check it. Possible meanings. One, Grimes has won his full and undivided attention. Two, he's not expecting anyone to contact him with anything important. Three, he's not on a tight leash. No domineering boss or girlfriend. Dempsey continued trailing Grimes and Farhad while keeping his distance and looking for ticks. As they reached the Starbucks, Farhad was explaining his plan to use the insights gained from his brain research to form a startup focused on artificial intelligence and deep learning. In my opinion, artificial intelligence is the final frontier in tech. We're talking about a trillion-dollar market in a decade's time. My father is a venture capitalist, and he's already secured seed funding for my company. I'm putting my team together right now. I could use someone like you, someone friendly and highly motivated with an MBA. In that case, Grimes said, maybe I should be buying you dinner instead of coffee. Seated and waiting, Smith said, confirming he was inside the coffee house and had taken a table in the back. If there were no open tables when Grimes and Farhad were ready to sit, he'd give up his table just in time for her to take it. A beat later, Dempsey watched Grimes and Farhad disappear inside. He cleared his six and both sides of the street under the guise of checking traffic. After crossing to the west side of Oxford, he put his phone to his ear to make another fake call. Hey, it's me again. Decided to grab a coffee before I head home. Let me know if you want something. Dempsey reporting, all clear outside, coming in. Ready for a domo on your mark. Don't worry, it's not crowded. The wait's only a few minutes, Smith said, pretending to have a conversation of his own. Starbucks clear inside, ready for a domo, three mics. Dempsey entered the Starbucks and found a place in line just as Grimes was paying the tab for two caramel macchiatos. He heard her tell Farhad to wait at the pickup counter while she grabbed a table. In his peripheral vision, Dempsey watched their little game of musical chairs play out with subtle precision as Smith evacuated his table just in time for Grimes to take his seat, a mere thirty seconds before Farhad appeared with their coffees. Smith cleared his throat. A moment later, the entrance door swung open and Adamo strolled in. Dempsey watched the CIA man scan the crowd, find Grimes, and then casually approach her table in the back. When Adamo stopped beside the table, Grimes looked up and smiled. Adar, I'd like you to meet my friend Scott, she said with the enthusiasm of someone who had just run into a long-lost friend. This was the critical phase of the operation. Worst case scenario, Adar was in play or under surveillance. If so, they could expect company any moment. Best case scenario, 
The young Persian made a scene drawing attention to himself and them. Either way, the dude was a flight risk as far as Dempsey was concerned. Managing all of these contingencies was his job now. What the hell is going on? Adar said, his voice taking on a timbre of terror. Hello, Adar, Adama said. Mind if I join you? No, no, absolutely not, Farhad said, shifting in his seat. Don't be silly, Grimes said. Here, take my seat, Scott. I'll leave you two alone to chat about boy stuff. Are you fucking kidding me? Farhad stammered, realizing he'd just fallen victim to a honey trap. This is bullshit. If both of you don't leave right now, I'm going to call the cops. Sit your ass back down in that chair, Adamo said, taking Grimes' seat. The cops take orders from me, remember? Or have you forgotten what happens when you try to go to the police? After an awkward beat, Farhad said, No, I haven't forgotten. Good. Then let's talk. Back then you told me your name was Brad. My name is whatever I say it is, Adamo said and inspected his fingers as if bored. Okay. Scott, in that case, there's nothing to talk about. I'm clean now. I'm getting my PhD, for God's sake. You have to believe me when I say I'm not involved in that stuff anymore. I know, and I'm proud of you for that, Adamo said with what to Dempsey almost sounded like a hint of fatherly pride. Then Adamo's tone turned hard and cold. Now lower your fucking voice. Dempsey stepped up to the register. It was his turn to order. May I help you, sir? The pimple-faced girl manning the cash register asked. Medium coffee, black, Dempsey said. Hot or iced? Hot and keep the change. He handed her a five and then moved to the pickup area. There is nothing I can do for you, Adar was saying, desperation and fear in his voice. I told you I'm clean. I've moved on. Sit still. Smile. Drink your coffee, you moron. You're drawing attention to us, Adamo said. Play by the rules, and this all goes easy. Make things hard, and I start scheduling meetings with your department chair and the dean. It's not my desire to ruin your life, but I will if I have to, and I won't lose sleep over it. Grimes left Adamo and Farhad alone and settled into a lounge chair next to Smith. She made a show of pulling out her phone and surfing the web. Just two strangers a foot apart and separated by miles of Internet world. What do you want? Farhad asked, defeated. I need your help. Just one last time. Why? I don't know anything. I don't know anyone. Let me be the judge of that. Farhad shook his head. I'm not going back down that hole. I'm sorry to hear that, Adar, because the last thing I wanted to see was you detained and questioned for your role in aiding and abetting terrorists. But I'm not a terrorist, the young man said, his voice now tight with genuine fear. I know, Adamo said softly, which would make your imprisonment all the more tragic, but no less inevitable if you don't help me. You still have sins left to atone for, I'm afraid. Do we understand each other? Yes, Farhad said, his voice cracking. If I agree to help you this one last time, will you promise to leave me alone forever? We both know that's a promise I can't make. I work for the United States of America, not Adar Farhad. But what I can promise you is that if you help me, I'll protect you. If you get me the information that I need... I'll make sure that everything in your case file disappears. If something happens to me, the guy who takes my place won't find any skeletons in your closet. After a long silence, Farhad said, Okay. What next? I'll meet you at your apartment at 6 p.m. No guests, no surprises. Between now and then, you go about your day as if nothing has happened. If you call anyone, if you try to run, I'll know and the deal is off. Do we understand each other? Farhad nodded. 6 p.m. I'll be there. Adamo stood and walked swiftly toward the exit. Grimes joined him en route. On her way out the door, she turned and blew Farhad a kiss. An interested bystander, Dempsey turned just in time to see Farhad flipper the middle finger. He wandered to a seat across from Smith, who was tapping furiously on his phone. Dempsey eased himself into the chair and sipped at his coffee. He glanced at Farhad, who was still sitting at the table, dazed and lost in thought. A few minutes passed, and he suddenly popped to his feet and stomped past with balled-up fists. He flung open the glass door and stepped outside onto the sidewalk. Dempsey watched him scan the street both directions before turning right to leave, shoulders slumped, head down in defeat. Status on Farhad's phone? Adamo asked over the comms channel. 
Tracking, came Wang's happy reply. He's moving south on Oxford. So far, he's being a good boy. No calls, no texts. You have the mic turned on? Oh, please, if he farts, we'll know it, Wang said. And as soon as he gets back to his apartment and on his Wi-Fi, we own this bitch. I'm all over his keychains. Roger. On cue, Smith departed. Dempsey lingered behind, leisurely finishing his coffee until he was satisfied no one in the coffee house was of concern. Five minutes later, the entire team was gathered in the back of a Mercedes-Benz Sprinter van, a mobile office conversion unit, parked within walking distance of Farhad's apartment. This had been Adamo's show, and Dempsey grudgingly had to acknowledge that the CIA man had run a good op. Although, truth be told, most of the kudos went to Grimes for her performance. That dude wanted you bad, Wang said as Grimes shrugged on a sweatshirt, covering up her flimsy tank top and hard nipples in the back of the chilly van. He was a walking, talking hard on until Adamo showed up, then shrinkage. Wang made the whistling sound of a deflating balloon and curled his index finger. As much as it pains me to admit it, you're not the first person to say I have that effect on people, Adamo said with a self-deprecating smile. Don't sweat it, Simon. Grimes said, jumping into the fray. When your name is Dick Wang, you simply can't help yourself from talking about other men's erections. Everyone laughed, including Adamo, with Wang howling the loudest of all. It felt damn good to laugh, Dempsey thought. There hadn't been much to warrant levity lately, but they all needed something to break the tension. The clock was ticking, and they all felt it. The hours waiting until their 1800 interrogation with Farhad would be absolute torture for all of them. They needed something to fill the time, something to keep their focus. So Dempsey looked at Adamo. What's on your mind, John? Adamo said without missing a beat. I was hoping that maybe now was a good time for you to fill us in on everything you know about Adar Farhad and his connection to the Suren Circle, Dempsey said. And for the first time since they'd met, he swore he saw something resembling respect in the other man's eyes. I started watching Farhad five years ago when he was a spoiled, rich kid with a drug habit. I never believed that he was Suren, but I strongly suspected his parents. They fit the profile I was screening for. Immigrated from Iran between 1990 and 2005, married, financially sound, well-educated, with occasional travel to visit family in Tehran. So you ran him as a CI? Grimes asked. No, nothing that clean. We worked him for four years but he was never cooperative. It was very much an antagonistic relationship. Besides the drug habit, he was hot-headed and always rebelling against his parents, parents who he viewed as sellouts and puppets of the West. At that time, Adar was disenfranchised and became enamored with Ahmadinejad. Is he a devout Muslim? Smith asked. Adamo laughed. <laughs> never. His respect for Ahmadinejad had nothing to do with Islam. He loved the way Ahmadinejad talked shit against the West and got away with it. He loved the audacity and the spectacle of it all. I think in one sense he was modeling his rebellion against his parents after Ahmadinejad's rogue persona on the international stage. So, what happened? Dempsey asked. He spiraled out of control. Drug use eventually led to drug dealing. At the same time, he began experimenting with radical Islam, again, not for ideological reasons, but to upset his parents. When he began communicating via social media with domestic extremists, he popped on another task force's radar. Things got a little messy then because I didn't want to risk spooking the parents. I escalated, and that pissed some folks off. Turned out to be all for nothing, however, because the parents staged an intervention and enrolled him in rehab. Six months later, Adar was clean. We had an administration change, and my group was shut down for lack of progress. So you never had anything on the parents? Dempsey asked. Nothing actionable, Adamo said, shaking his head. I was never in a position to force them to break protocol or communicate with other members of the circle. Well, Dempsey said, rubbing his chin. Maybe it's time we change that. Chapter 31. Ember Surveillance Van, Walking Distance to Adar Farhad's Parents' Residence. November 1st, 1950, Local Time. What's a sour face for? Grimes asked Dempsey. The leftover Chinese stinks, he said, nudging the trash bag of leftovers with his foot. I don't understand how something that tastes so good can smell so bad. Either it goes or I do. I'd love to see that report to Jarvis, she said with a laugh. 
Operation blown on account of counter-detection from stinky Chinese takeout. Hey guys, I'm trying to concentrate over here, Wang said, admonishing them despite the gigantic set of noise-canceling over-ear headphones he was wearing. Do you mind? Adamo, who was also wearing headphones, scowled at them. Dempsey and Grimes traded impish glances. Clearly, they weren't stakeout material. Dempsey leaned back in his seat and wondered if taking a little nap would rub Adamo the wrong way. Because if so, the seal in him could fall asleep on command. Put it on speaker, I promise we'll be quiet, Grimes said. Wang looked at Adamo, who nodded, and then he switched on the cabin speakers. Dempsey heard a rustling as Farhad's phone swished in his pocket as he got out of his car and walked toward his parents' house. So far, he had proved to be compliant, but nothing else. From the time he left Starbucks to the 1800 follow-up meeting, the kid had done exactly as he'd been told. No phone calls, no text messages, no non-work-related emails. The observation and waiting period had been critical to determine his credibility. Everyone, including Adamo, was convinced that Farhad was not being run or monitored by another entity, but only time and vigilance would prove that supposition. It had taken 30 minutes, but Adamo had expertly and successfully bullied Farhad into conducting one final task for him. Acting as a human Trojan horse, Adar would go to his parents' house with the mission of instigating a chain of events that would force the two suspected sleeper agents to communicate with their VVAC handler, with Tehran, or within the circle itself. He's on the front porch, Wang reported. Dempsey heard a knock, and then a beat later, Adar's mother greeted him at the front door. Mr. Farhad soon arrived and invited the once prodigal son, now Ph.D. candidate, inside to visit. Adar sounds nervous, Dempsey whispered to Grimes. Yeah, he does. I think they're in the kitchen now, Smith said. Audio gain just changed, Wang said. Phone's out of his pocket. I'm turning on the camera. Dempsey watched a new video feed populate one of the monitors in the van. It was the streaming video from Adar's front-facing mobile phone camera. The image was of the kitchen ceiling. That's my boy, Adamo said, pleased that Adar had remembered to take the phone out of his pocket. Now ask for Dad's phone. On cue, they heard Adar say, Hey, Dad, do you have any photos from the anniversary celebration? I'm sorry again to have missed the dinner. Of course, I have an entire album saved on my phone. Can I see them? Sure. At that, Adamo made a silent celebratory fist pump. Two minutes later, Wang announced, all right, I own the dad's phone. Check audio and video feeds, Adamo said. Did you gotta knock that shit off? Wang growled. I know how to do my job. Sorry, Adamo said. Bad habit. They listened as the Farhads made small talk. When the conversation hit a lull, Adar's father said, Adar, you know how much your mother and I love when you visit, but I have to ask, is something wrong? I can't remember the last time you showed up after dinner unannounced. Dempsey locked eyes with Adamo and mouthed the word, showtime. Adamo nodded. The tension in the van was palpable as they waited for Adar to drop the bomb. Actually, yes, the younger Farhad said. I hope it's nothing, but something happened I want to talk to you about. Does it involve a girl? Adar's mother asked. No, nothing like that, he said. It actually has to do with the two of you. With us, his father said with a laugh. Don't tell me you've run out of money. No, Dad, I'm not here for money. I'm here to ask you about the Suren Circle. Adar's father replied first. I'm not sure what you're talking about. I've never heard of the Suren Circle. Is it a charity you want us to donate to? The mother added. Please, Mom and Dad. Please don't make this any harder than it already is. I'm really scared, and I need to know what the hell is going on. Adar's voice shook. Two federal agents approached me today. They told me that you guys were both members of an Iranian spy ring. They said it's some sleeper program and that you have been secretly working for the Iranian government for two decades. There was a pause, and Dempsey wished like hell he had video other than the ceiling. He wanted to see the elder Farhad's face, see his real reaction. After a beat, the father said, Adar, this is a safe place. You know that your mother and I won't judge you, so it's okay to tell us the truth. 
have you started using again? Are you fucking kidding me? I tell you federal agents are investigating you and you ask me if I'm using? He fired back with enough emotion that Dempsey knew the switch had just flipped in the grad student's head. The kid wasn't compulsory role-playing anymore. The conversation had taken on a gut-wrenching, oh shit, my parents might actually be spies undertone now. Maybe we should call Dr. Magnus, his mother said. Schedule a session for all three of us to sit down and talk. No, absolutely not. When Adar spoke again, the ire in his voice was gone, replaced by the same dispassionate tone his mother had used. Actually, maybe that's not a bad idea. Maybe we should talk with a neutral third party. I can invite the two special agents to come to the session, too. It would be a delight to watch Dr. Magnus question them about their psychosis and drug-induced delusions as they lay out their case records. A long, uncomfortable silence hung on the line, while Wang solicited high fives from every member of the Ember team in sequence. Fucking A, way to go, Adar, Wang said while laughing. What else did these men say? Adar's father asked, his voice suddenly grave. The U.S. media is stoking the flames of Islamophobia in this country. If we are being unjustly targeted by Homeland Security, I need to know this could be very serious, son. They told me that you and Mom were recruited by something called VIVAC when you were in your twenties. You were given false identities, money, and the visas needed to emigrate to the U.S., you became naturalized citizens, but all the while continued working as part of a secret ring of sleeper agents created to infiltrate American business and government and gather trade secrets. Adar, we love you, son, but this sounds crazy and paranoid. After all you put us through, you can see why we would worry. If any of this were true, then why didn't the U.S. government arrest us years ago? Why contact you now after leaving us alone for twenty years? It doesn't make any sense, Farhad Sr. said. I asked the exact same question. And do you want to know what their answer was? Because until now you were only gathering intelligence, but in the last few days they said they have reason to believe that your spy ring is planning a terrorist attack. That's ridiculous! Adar's father scoffed. What's ridiculous? That you and Mom are Korea spies, and you've hidden this fact from me for my entire life, or that you're helping launch a terrorist attack inside the U.S.? Both! The father shouted. Someone started crying. Who's crying? Dempsey asked. Mrs. Farhad, Grimes answered, narrowing her eyes. Call it woman's intuition, but I call bullshit. I know it sounds legit, but crying is a great redirect. It's what I'd do if I were her. Don't cry, Mom, Adar said. Please don't cry. I'm not trying to accuse you of anything. Shit, Dempsey growled. We're losing him. It's okay, Adamo said, looking at Dempsey and Grimes. Adar did exactly what we needed him to do. He forced their hand. In the next five minutes, one of two things is going to happen. Either they kick him out of the house, or they read him in. But no matter what happens, we need to get Baldwin and the boys up and monitoring ASAP, because we're about to learn the truth. Chapter 32 Ember Surveillance Van Parked Near the Farhad Residence Dempsey watched Wang's fingers fly across a workstation keyboard as he messaged with Baldwin back in Virginia. Over Wang's shoulder, Dempsey read the string, only then realizing that the professor had been tied into the op the entire time. Apparently, from the moment that Wang commandeered Adar's father's mobile phone, Baldwin and the boys back at Ember had been busy requisitioning historical data to start mining. Sounds like they're wrapping up in there, Grimes said, talking over the audio feed. Adamo nodded but held a finger to his lips. Adar, can we please just agree to drop all of this your parents are spies lunacy and focus on what really matters, Fahad Sr. said. And what is that, Dad? completing your Ph.D., and building a team for your startup. Sure, that all sounds great, until the federal agents show up at the lab and haul me away for questioning. What the hell am I supposed to do then? You tell them the same thing I'm telling you now, that they must be mistaken with their information, and that if they have any more questions, they need 
to come talk to me directly. After a beat, Adar said, Fine. But when they throw you and Mom in the back of a black van and haul you away for interrogation, don't say I didn't warn you. I think you're being a little melodramatic now, son. Why don't you head back to your apartment? Relax, have some dinner, watch a movie. Better yet, why don't you go to bed early and get some sleep? If what you say is true, then I'm sure it's just one big misunderstanding. Give it some time, and I promise everything will be fine. Dempsey listened to the awkward goodbye that followed as the Farhads ushered their son out the front door. To his surprise, Adar drove away in his car, parked out of sight, then walked back to the van, just as Adamo had told him to do. Dempsey had been surprised by the instruction. It felt wrong letting the kid into their inner circle, but Adamo had been adamant about wanting Adar to listen to the parents' post-op discussion— a discussion the Farhads were just beginning to conduct as Grimes closed the slider door behind the kid. Adar shot daggers at Grimes as he climbed into his seat, but she pretended not to notice, instead focusing her attention on the conversation being retransmitted by the father's hacked phone. "'Do you think he's telling the truth?' Mrs. Farhad said. "'Yes, unfortunately,' Adar's father said. "'What do we do?' "'Hush!' he said, his voice low and agitated. When he spoke again, it was in Farsi. Dempsey groaned his irritation at the language change. Now he'd have to rely on Adamo and Grimes to reconstruct the conversation. The sounds of running water and a kitchen ventilation hood fan being turned on suddenly drowned out their voices. Adamo looked at Wang. Is there anything you can do about this? Yeah, sure. Hey, Adar, can you run back in there and ask your parents to turn that shit off and talk clearly into the microphone? Wang said. Adamo glowered at Wang. Cut the crap, I'm being serious. So am I, there's nothing I can do, man, Wang said. I have some tech for this situation, but it requires line-of-sight video surveillance. In the meantime, I'm recording everything and streaming it back to the talk. Hopefully they'll be able to work some magic and pull dialogue out of all that interference. Dempsey shifted his attention to Adar. The kid looked dazed. I can't believe it, he mumbled. I... I just don't understand. Sorry, dude, Wang said with a pitying smile. But your parents are fucking spies. For my whole life, they've been lying to me. Adar looked at Adamo. Well, you, someone I despised all these years, were telling me the truth. Adamo exhaled through his nose. Do you remember what I said to you the very first time we met? Adar nodded and his gaze went to the middle distance. You told me that I wouldn't like what you had to say, but the one thing you'd never do was lie to me. That's right, and I've kept that promise. And what about me? What am I supposed to do now? Damo placed a hand on the kid's shoulder. You're going to do exactly what your father said. Go home, relax, and work on your Ph.D. Tomorrow you'll have a new handler someone to help you manage this situation and answer all your questions, but until then you're on your own. Do you think you can handle that, Adar? My parents are spies. That's not something you can simply pretend away. Sure you can, Dempsey said. My parents were Democrats, but I found a way to manage. This isn't a joke. I know, Dempsey said, meeting the young man's eyes. Yes, your parents are spies but that doesn't make you one. You're an American, a first-generation Persian-American with a brilliant mind and a bright future. This is your country, just like it's mine and his and hers and his and his, he said, pointing at each of his teammates in turn. Our job is to safeguard the lives of all Americans. We're always out there, operating in the shadows. And now you see us. Now you know what we do and why we do it. As much as you might like to go back to your old life of blissful ignorance, you can't, Adar. You're one of us now, a shadow warrior, and you have a job to do. And if you don't do your job, thousands of people are going to die. So I ask you, can you rise above the fear and uncertainty? Can you cage your personal demons and become a protector of innocent men, women, and children? I think so. 
You think so or you will? I will, Adar said, tightening his jaw and nodding slowly. You can count on me, sir. Dempsey looked at Adamo. Time for Adar to head home. We have work to do. Adamo nodded and escorted the kid back to his car. On his return to the van, Smith asked, Are we good? Yeah. As soon as we finish here, I'll assign him a handler. Someone we can trust. Then, looking at Dempsey, Adamo added, Thanks for the pep talk, John. Adar needed to hear that. No problem, Dempsey said. Sometimes all it takes is marching orders and the kick in the ass. Adar knows the stakes. He's a smart kid. Hey, guys, heads up, Wang said, his voice amping up a notch. We've got an outbound call. Dad's phone, Adamo asked. Nope, Wang said. Probably a burner. Baldwin's on it. Where's the call to? Hang on. Looks like the Chicago area code. Ringing. Ringing. Three rings. No answer. Call disconnected. Can you get us an address? Adamo said, tension in his voice. They're working on it. It's a mobile phone. Shit, another outgoing. Fifty bucks says he's working down the hierarchy. This one is an Omaha area code. The call picked up. Put it on speaker for Christ's sake, Adamo barked. I can't. This is Baldwin's show, Wang said, messaging back and forth at the terminal. But he's dictating. I'll read it to you guys. Hello, this is Kayvon Shirazi. Hello, Kayvon, this is Sharze Farhad in California. Oh, Sharze, so good to hear from you. Tell me, how is the family? Fine, fine, no news to report. Good to hear. And work, how is work? Any new or interesting projects? Work is fine. No new projects. The only new and interesting thing I have to report are some new people who just moved into the neighborhood. They're very loud and intrusive. I hope we don't have to relocate to a different neighborhood to find peace and quiet. That is unfortunate. Please keep me informed of what happens. Of course. So tell me, Kayvon, how is your family? The family is fine, thanks for asking. Nothing new to report with the children. And your work? Work is stressful at the moment. I've taken on some new temporary responsibilities. Is that so? What kind of responsibilities, if you don't mind me asking? Nothing I want to bore you with. I'm simply looking forward to wrapping up the project as soon as possible. Is there anything I can do to help? No, this is local business, that's all. Okay, it was nice speaking with you, Kayvon. Give Delilah my love, and please don't hesitate to call if you need anything, anything at all. Yes, of course. Thanks for calling, Charze. Goodbye. Holy shit, Grimes said, grinning like a schoolgirl. We got him. You all right, Simon? Smith eyed the CIA man. You look a little green. Yeah, Adamo said, shaking his head and smiling. It's just surreal to be finally vindicated after all these years. It's hard to explain the feeling. Congratulations, Simon. Seriously, bro, nice work, Dempsey said. Then after a beat, he asked, Now what? Now, Adamo said, pushing his eyeglasses up on his nose, we head to Omaha and pay Kayvon Shirazi a visit. Chapter 33, Omaha, Nebraska, November 2nd, 1930, local time. Somehow... The Americans had found him. Kayvon's hands were still shaking, no matter how tight he clutched the steering wheel. In broad daylight, in the middle of a campus parking lot, they'd grabbed him, forced him into a black SUV at gunpoint, and given him a shakedown, all without anyone noticing. A car horn sounded behind him. With a start, he looked in his rearview mirror and saw a middle-aged man in a Buick throwing his hands up in the universal gesture for what the hell are you waiting for? Behind the Buick, he noted the roof line of the black SUV. The American agents were following him, keeping pressure on to make sure he followed through. The choice they'd given him was simple, cooperate or lose everything in his life that mattered. Just one look into their leader's eyes, the brute with the spiral scar on his muscular forearm was enough to convince Kayvon this was no idle threat. The people who'd taken him weren't local law enforcement, nor were they FBI. 
they hadn't even bothered to identify themselves as federal agents or flashed him ID. They were black ops. They were the type of people who made problems disappear. They were ghost warriors fighting America's real war on terror. If he failed, they would make him pay and pay dearly. And so in exchange for immunity, he told them everything, including how the Seren Circle had been activated, how he and Delilah had driven to Douglas, Arizona, to pick up and assist two jihadists who had crossed the border, and that two other Seren sleeper agent couples were fulfilling similar tasking in different locations. In exchange for a promise of a new identity and a new life with Delilah, he'd agreed to become their double agent and discover the target locations for the other two attacks. Now it was time to make good on his end of the bargain. He lifted his foot off the brake pedal and transferred it to the accelerator. His BMW sped forward and through the intersection just as the traffic light overhead changed to yellow. He drove the speed limit all the way home. Somewhere along the way, the black SUV disappeared, but it didn't matter. They were still watching. They were still listening. He pressed a button on the remote control garage door opener, clipped to the passenger sun visor, and waited for the door to roll open. After parking, he pushed the same button on the remote and watched the door lower in his rearview mirror until the last bit of fading daylight disappeared. He loitered in the dark, paralyzed with fear and dread and uncertainty. What if they suspect me? What if they catch me in a lie? What if they figure out that my phone is being used as a body wire? What if they hurt Delilah? What if they turn her against me? What if... what if... what if... The door to the house opened and made him jump. He turned to see Delilah's silhouette in the doorway. Her hands moved to her hips, signaling both her impatience and irritation. Just act normal, he told himself. He opened the driver's side door and stepped out. What are you doing out here in the dark, Kayvon? she asked. Nothing, he said and shut the car door behind him. I heard the garage door a while ago. You had to be doing something all this time. I was just thinking, he said, approaching her. She narrowed her eyes, scrutinizing him for insincerity, but said nothing else. He leaned in to give her a peck on the lips, and she gave him her cheek, something she'd never done before. He was about to ask her what was the matter, but he knew the dreadful answer to this question. Come, she said, as if talking to a child. They're waiting for us in the basement. He followed her through the mudroom, through the kitchen, and to the stairs leading down to the basement. Their basement was finished with a full bathroom and a guest bedroom. The rest of the space served as a lounge and game room, complete with poker and ping-pong tables, both big box store whim purchases and both never used. Never used that was until now. Their two guests had transformed the card table into a command center, covering every square inch of surface area with maps and photographs. The ping-pong table, on the other hand, was now serving as a weapons staging platform. He scanned the instruments of death and destruction neatly displayed, including two Kevlar vests wired with bombs, two small machine guns whose make he did not recognize, two Glock 9mm pistols, and several nasty-looking blades of varying lengths. Also, on the table, sat a small handheld video recorder. Since his last trip to the basement, there was one new addition— a black sheet with the white logo of the Islamic State was now tacked to the basement wall. A stool was staged in front of the terrorist banner. This was where they would shoot their web videos, reading self-serving passages of the Koran and taking credit for the devastation they were about to unleash. "'You've been gone a long time,' the Syrian said, not looking up from where he sat, typing on a notebook computer. "'I had work to do,' Kevan replied. I've fallen behind since your arrival. Is that so? The Syrian replied, his voice rife with superiority. It is important that I maintain my regular routines and appearances, he said, shoving his hands into his pockets. You wouldn't want me to do anything to draw unwanted attention to myself or the house, would you? At this the Syrian looked up and fixed his cold black eyes on him. What? Kavan said nervously. The Syrian set his notebook computer on the end table beside the sofa and stood up. He walked over to Kayvon and stepped into his personal space. You seem nervous, more nervous than usual. Kayvon looked at Delilah, but her gaze was fixed on the Syrian. Why are you so nervous today, Kayvon? 
the Syrian said, tilting his head. I don't know what you're talking about, Kavon said, willing himself not to take a step back. Just then a toilet flushed, and a beat later the Iranian Vivek operative appeared from the bathroom. Professor Shirazi returns, he said with false bravado. How many papers did you grade? How many American superstars will have to go home broken-hearted with a B today? As much as Kavon despised the Vivac operative, he was grateful for the interruption. He chuckled and said, I gave seven C's, nine B's, and five A's, if you must know. I don't give a shit, the man said. Get me a drink of water. Okay, Kavon said, turning toward the wet bar on the far basement wall. With ice, the Iranian said, glancing at the Syrian with a fox's grin. In America it is perfectly acceptable to treat a man like a woman. See, look at how obedient Kevan has become. He's so indoctrinated in his legend that there is no Persian pride left in him at all. Kevan felt his cheeks heat while he prepared a glass of ice water. Do you still have your manhood, Kevan, or has it shriveled away along with your pride? Kevan felt a surge of anger and he wanted to throw the ice water in the Vivek man's face, but he knew that would be a terrible mistake. The Iranian was twenty years his junior and a tactically trained Vivek operative. The man was a killer. Of this much, Kavan was certain, whereas he had no practical experience in such things. He silently cursed his trembling hand as he passed the water to his tormentor. The Iranian took the glass without thanks and walked over to take a seat on the sofa. Prove him wrong, Kevan, the Syrian said, filling the awkward silence. I am one man short for the operation. Join me as one of Allah's chosen warriors and cement your legacy as a hero of Persia. Kevan glanced at the suicide vests on the ping-pong table and felt his stomach tie in knots. That was never part of the arrangement, the man from Vivac said from the sofa. Then the arrangement must change. Kevan is not your asset. The Suren are tasked with providing support. They do not take orders from you, and neither do I. I think you misunderstand. This is not my will, but the will of Allah. Without a second warrior, the mission will fail, the Syrian said, his voice even and calm. Who are you to question God's plan? The Iranian wagged a finger at the Syrian. Now you listen to me. I'll do it, Kavan interrupted, shocking them all. What? the Iranian snarled. I said I'll do it, Kavan repeated. He glanced at the Syrian and saw that the terrorist wore an expression he'd not seen since his arrival. A smile. Kavan took a deep breath and brazenly walked over to the card table, covered with maps and photographs. This was the closest he'd been permitted to get to the table, which validated the logic behind his decision to volunteer. The only exigency that the Syrian cared about was drafting another suicide bomber. Offering to satisfy that need was the only way to learn the details of the operation. He's right, Kavan said, looking down at the map of downtown Omaha. He found the old market district and quickly scanned the street labels. I am very familiar with the old market. To achieve maximum results, it will take two gunmen. Together, we can herd the infidels toward the intersection of Howard and Eleventh Streets and detonate the bombs on opposite sides of the crowd. Yes. Yes, the Syrian said, walking over to stand beside him. This was exactly my plan. The Vivac man looked at Delilah. What is your opinion of this? She glanced at each of them in turn, her eyes settling last on Kevan. I am surprised at my husband's decision, but if this is God's will, then who am I to judge? Then it's settled, the Iranian said quickly. He walked to the ping-pong table and picked up one of the suicide vests. This will be your vest. Come here, Kevan. I want you to put it on for me. Kevan swallowed. Right now? The Syrian's enthusiasm darkened. Is there a problem? No, no, of course not. I just don't see why, Kavan stuttered. Why must I try on the vest now? The Syrian narrowed his eyes. I think you misunderstand me. I'm not asking you to try on the vest. This is not a wardrobe fitting. 
It is time to begin your training, and your first assignment is to wear the vest for twenty-four hours. Twenty-four hours? Kavan exclaimed, feeling all the blood drain from his face. But of course. A martyr must embrace his destiny, and to do that you must embrace the vest. It must become a part of you, and you a part of it. Do not be afraid, Kavan. Allah is watching. Kavan's feet suddenly felt like blocks of lead. Even if he wanted to, gravity prevented him from taking a step. He looked back down at the card table. Maybe after we discuss the operation, I'll be ready to wear it. There was no way in hell he was going to walk around with bombs strapped to his torso. Not for twenty-four hours, not for twenty-four seconds. His heart was racing now, beating so fast it felt like he was going into AFib. He clutched the edge of the card table to steady himself. Frantically, he scanned the photographs, maps, and documents on the table for clues about the other target locations. Everything on the table seemed to pertain to Omaha, but there had to be something, some hint or clue identifying the other two cities. He was almost positive there were two other cities being targeted because three sedans had arrived that night in Douglas, Arizona, and three sedans had departed in three different directions. A large map of downtown Omaha covered the middle of the table, but he spied a sliver of another map peeking out beneath one side. He folded the Omaha map on itself, revealing a map of the continental United States taped to the table below. Three red dots immediately caught his attention. Atlanta, Omaha, and Seattle. I just think we should discuss the details of the operation as a group. The tactics we use in the old market could also be applied to the targets in Atlanta and Seattle. He noticed that the dot in Washington State was actually located in a suburb of Seattle, not downtown proper. He leaned left to try to read the small black font of the township beneath the dot. Kavon, what are you doing? Delilah said, her tone both scolding and fearful at the same time. He stopped and looked up at her. He saw horror in her eyes. His heart fluttered. In his peripheral vision he realized that the Syrian was standing beside him. He turned his head to find the muzzle of a gun leveled at his forehead. "'What is the meaning of this?' he shouted, trying to sound indignant, but his voice cracking instead with fear. "'Don't point that at me!' There was a blur of movement, and the center of his face exploded in pain as the bridge of his nose shattered from the blow of the pistol butt. His eyes lit up with a fireworks display of white light, and he pitched forward. His knee screamed in pain as it hit the ground. He felt warm blood rushing through the fingers that cupped his ruined nose. "'My God, why did you do that?' It was Delilah's voice, frightened and tight. "'Why is Kavon asking these questions? Who have you been talking to?' the Syrian demanded. "'No one. I've spoken to no one,' he tried to yell, but his voice was wet cotton. "'I'm a servant of Allah. I've done everything he's asked of me.' The Syrian scowled and kicked him. Pain erupted in his side, and he felt a rib snap. He heard a scream and realized it was his own, reverberating off the basement walls. "'What have you told the Americans?' the terrorist asked. His voice was calm now, almost soft. Perhaps it was over, Kavon thought. He tried to push himself up from the floor, but his left side and chest shrieked in protest. Without warning, another kick landed between his legs, and he thought he would die before he could suck in another breath. "'What have you told them about the operation?' Have you revealed the targets? Tell me and the pain will stop. Stop it! You're killing him! Delilah cried. Kavan heard more emotion in that cry from her than he had in years, and he knew then that she still loved him. That realization gave him the strength he needed. They could get out of this. They could start over. I am a servant of Allah. I will martyr myself to see the Mahdi return in all his glory. Kavan managed to choke out. The voice, sputtering and begging, was alien to him. The words and promises were coming from somewhere deep and primal, but his plea was only met with another blow. He collapsed to the floor again, but immediately felt a hand on his collar, jerking him roughly back up to his knees. The pain was clouding his mind, weakening his resolve. The voice inside his head was wishing for a quick end, in a burst of glorious explosive light, as opposed to this slow death by bludgeoning. He readied himself for the next blow, but it did not come. What did you tell them about the old market? What did you tell them 
about Seattle and— Shut up, you idiot! You're making it worse! Unhand me! Kayvon was no longer sure who was speaking and to whom. He wheeled his eyes open to see what was happening, only to find the gaping black eye of a pistol so close his eyes couldn't focus on it. Then there was a flash and terrible pain. And then nothing. Chapter 34 Ember SUV, two blocks from the Shirazi House, Omaha, Nebraska, 2015, local time. Atlanta. Kevan had clearly said Atlanta, and now Dempsey could think of nothing but Kate and Jake as the word echoed over and over in his head. His throat tightened, and he felt anxiety the likes of which he hadn't felt since the day he pinned on his trident. The losses he experienced because he wore the trident were part of the life he had chosen, but this? This was just too much. Kate and Jake were never supposed to be in danger. That was his part of their equation. A gunshot snapped him from his emotional fugue. Oh, shit, I think they just executed him. Wang gasped, all the usual flippancy and sarcasm gone from his voice. Quiet, Dempsey barked. The arguing in the Shirazi basement continued. Are you mad? We needed to know what he told them. Shut your mouth, you fool. We're not in Raqqa or Arutba. What were you thinking? You're the one who executed him, Persian. Because you forced my hand. If the Americans actually did tag him, then they've been listening from the beginning, in which case you were sharing more information with your foolish questions than he knew. There was a rustling and then a wet thud. He's not wearing a body wire, no electronics. Then you killed him for nothing. You killed my K on your monster. He was doing what we were trained to do, the wife sobbed. You saw how nervous he was. The only explanation for his behavior is betrayal. He's always nervous, you asshole, she screamed. That is how he is. But he's always been loyal to me and to Persia. And you murdered him for it. Dempsey heard the sound of a slap. Never speak to me that way, woman. And if Kavan was loyal to you ahead of his country, then perhaps I should be asking what it is that you're not telling us. I've been sequestered here with you since Arizona, she cried. How could I possibly be working with the Americans? Hey, what are you doing? Checking his phone. A sudden loud scraping sound caused Wang to dial down the volume on his laptop, which was presently streaming over the Yukon speakers via Bluetooth. The phone appears to be off. Let me see it. Where is the woman? Where did she go? I don't know. Probably to the bathroom to be sick. No, she's upstairs. She's running. Go after her. Dempsey gritted his teeth. The voice belonged to Al Mahajer. He was certain of it. She's my problem, do you understand? You don't touch her. Just bring her back quickly, you fool. Dempsey unbuckled his seatbelt. She's making a run for it. Smith whipped around from the driver's seat. Go get her, but John? Yeah. If you've seen, we're blown. Better to sacrifice her than the mission. Don't worry, I got this, Dempsey said, before slipping out the rear passenger door and heading off into the night to save Delilah Shirazi. Chapter 35 Rostami reached the top of the stairs and saw that the door leading from the kitchen into the backyard was hanging open. He cursed Almahajer under his breath. The man might be a genius when it came to brutalizing the locals in western Iraq, whipping up the disenfranchised into a religious fury and hacking his opposition to pieces. But clearly he knew nothing about clandestine operations in a civilized country. This was not al Qaim. This was the middle of America. What a fool! He sprinted out the kitchen door onto a brick patio, where he paused and scanned both directions for movement. Seeing none, he listened for the sound of a car engine coming to life, but instead he heard the rustle of leaves and the crack of branches straight ahead. Rustami pulled his pistol from his waistband and ran across the backyard toward the wooded expanse that separated the Shirazi's neighborhood from the east campus. He entered the woods, crouched low, and moved quietly in the dark. Every few meters he paused, listening. He heard a rustle to his right and veered toward the sound, all the while cursing in his head. In a span of two days, al Mahajer had destroyed two invaluable VIVAC assets who had been operating for two decades undetected in America. 
Kayvon was a nervous woman of a man. He'd been that way since Arizona. But was he brave enough to betray them? Rostami thought not. Now Kayvon was dead, which dictated the same fate for Delilah. He simply could not let her live. Even if she was loyal, fear and anger would render her useless, and he could hardly leave her behind, knowing all that she knew. He heard the sound of feet on leaves slightly to his left now. He slowed and moved cautiously and quietly. Delilah had gotten her panic under control. She was hiding now. He took a knee, closed his eyes, and listened carefully. All predator. Thoughts of Delilah's bleached blonde hair, ample breasts, and thin, fit body flooded his mind. If he had to kill her, he might as well have fun in the process. He would pin her down by her throat on the floor of the woods. He would tear her clothes from her body and fuck her as he dragged his blade across her throat. He would finish as he watched the life drain from her face and then her eyes. Always it left the eyes last. He heard a soft, shuddering sigh. He opened his eyes and inched forward, very slowly, very carefully. He spied a large diameter tree several meters deeper into the woods. She was hiding behind that tree, he was certain of it. His eyes, now fully acclimated to the dark, could make out one gray running shoe sticking out past the trunk. A smile spread across his face. He looked over his shoulder toward the lights of the backyard, now perhaps eighty meters behind him. No movement, no sound, no pursuit. The Syrian had not followed him. He looked again at the shoe, which had not moved. If she screamed, he would be forced to kill her immediately. He needed to be quick. He needed to be silent. He reached the tree, raised a hand, and rested it on the wide trunk, bending in a crouch. He could hear her breathing now, long and slow. He readied himself and took a small step, repositioning around the trunk. As he did, her denim-clad left leg and half her ass came into view, the skin-tight jeans leaving little to the imagination. From her position, he knew she was looking away from him, peering around the far side of the tree. He slipped the pistol back into his waistband holster, took a deep, silent breath, and lunged at her. At the sound of his attack, she tried to spin but tripped over a root and fell backward instead. She landed hard, her arms flailing. She grunted, but to her great credit and his relief, she did not scream. He clamped his right hand onto her throat and squeezed. She gagged and her eyes went wide. He stretched his body long on top of hers, pinning her arms against her chest and pressing her into the ground with all his mass. She squirmed beneath him, terror-stricken and panicked. "'Be still,' he whispered. "'It's going to be all right.' For a moment her eyes filled with a spark of hope. Perhaps he was here to save her from the fanatical Al-Mahajer. Perhaps he would protect her. He knew she'd noticed his glances. She must now be building a fantasy in which he helped her escape, somehow got her to safety and away from the crazy Syrian. Rostami smiled a dark smile and slid a hand to unbuckle his pants. Her eyes widened with realization and a renewed terror. At the sight of her fear and helplessness, he had to exert all his self-control not to take her quickly. Not yet, not like this. Not until I'm bleeding her life into the dirt. Unencumbered now, he drew his stiletto from its scabbard. Gazing into her eyes, he pressed the point a centimeter below the corner of her right eye. She whimpered, and he shushed her like a baby. Still pinning her with his full weight, he released her throat. She gasped and gurgled while he fumbled to pull down her pants, finally snapping the button off and splaying open the short zipper by force. Grinning with anticipation, he tugged, but the fucking pants would not drop past her ass. The tight, hip-hugging jeans the western whores loved to wear, a look that drove him sex-crazy, was now working against him. He shifted his weight to the right to get more leverage. Her knee snapped up between his legs with impossible force. He grunted and somehow stifled the urge to yell. Long nails clawed his face, just missing his left eye. He released his grip on her jeans and went for her neck, but she had her chin tucked now. From the corner of his eye, he saw her right hand dart downward. Next thing he knew, she was clutching his scrotum. She squeezed, crushing his testicles and digging her fingernails into his flesh. Unable to control himself, he howled in pain, the knife slipping from his grip as he buckled at the waist and rolled off her. She released her vice grip, and he was aware of her squirming away, but the pain and nausea were incapacitating. As her footfalls disappeared into the night, all he could do was lie there and moan. Chapter 36 
Dempsey moved like a seal through the brush, deliberate, fast, and quiet. He was in his element now. He felt electric and invincible, which was a problem because tonight he wasn't kitted up like a seal. No rifle, no Kevlar vest, no radio, no NVGs. Given the choice of all those things right now, he'd take the NVGs. His organic night eyes had gone to shit the last few years, along with everything else, it seemed. His back, his alcohol tolerance, his mental concentration. He heard a wail, but not a woman's wail. This was the sound of a man in agony. A beat later, he heard uncontrolled breathing and footsteps moving toward him fast. He dropped into a low crouch and glided in behind a low bush. He was itching to pull his Sig Sauer from the holster he was wearing, but he couldn't risk a gunshot. Not here. Not now. Even if it turned out to be the devil himself, Rafiq al-Mahajer, Dempsey needed to show restraint. To locate and stop the other terror cells, Ember needed al-Mahajer alive, but if their paths crossed here in the woods, would he have the self-control? Probably not. A wave of dread washed over him at the realization. Was his thirst for vengeance that powerful? Suddenly he was regretting his decision to leave the Yukon. The running figure came into view and he saw that it was a woman. What the hell is she doing? He thought, as he watched her run while trying to hold her pants up simultaneously. When she closed within ten feet, he could make out the expression of abject terror on her face. With no time to second-guess the decision, Dempsey exploded out of the brush and wrapped her up. He clasped his left hand tightly over her mouth and used his right arm to protect her torso from injury as he brought her to the ground and rolled with her into a dense patch of brush. He dragged her along with him as he crabbed back behind the bush. Pressing his lips to her ear, he whispered, I'm here to help you, Delilah. Be silent or we're both dead. Nod if you understand. She nodded inside his grip. I'm going to let go. Don't bite me. She nodded again. He eased his hand off her face and she immediately whipped her head around to look at him. They locked eyes and he saw both surprise and uncertainty in her gaze. He kept perfectly still and felt her body shuddering against his, the adrenaline still coursing through her veins. A twig cracked nearby and she jerked in his arms. He held a finger to his lips. She nodded. Dempsey looked over his shoulder and caught a glimpse of a figure through a little gap in the foliage. Adult male walking with an awkward gait, possibly due to injury. Dempsey couldn't make out the face in the dark. He glanced back down at Delilah and saw that her blouse was torn and her jeans were ripped open at the hips. His mind quickly filled in the blanks. That motherfucker. He repositioned his hand to the hilt of his sog knife clipped to his belt. Delilah saw this and immediately tensed her respiration rate ticking up. She craned her neck around to look at him, and he shook his head. Don't worry, not for you. The footsteps stopped. He felt her go stiff in his arms. Dempsey looked over his other shoulder. Through the leaves, he could just make out their stalker. The man dangled a blade in his left hand while dabbing at his left cheek and nose with the index and middle fingers of his other hand. He held up his fingers for inspection in the pale moonlight. Dempsey heard him sigh heavily and gaze up at the sky as if saying a prayer to the heavens. Then the figure looked in their direction. Dempsey tightened his grip on the knife and visualized how the hand-to-hand -hand sequence would unfold. He waited for the footsteps. Waited. Waited. The figure looked away. Shoulders slumped, scanning the woods one last time before heading back the way he'd come. Dempsey let out a long, slow breath, but continued to hold Delilah. After several minutes passed, he whispered, Listen to me carefully. I know who you are. I know you're Suren. I know there are terrorists in your house right now planning to launch simultaneous attacks at the Old Market, as well as in Atlanta and Seattle. Her eyes widened. Then you also know what happened to Kevan? She whispered. Dempsey nodded. I'm sorry about your husband. She began to sob. We murdered him in cold blood. I know. Everything got out of control. It always does with these people. You work for the U.S. government? He nodded. What are you going to do to me? That, Delilah, is entirely up to you. We can do things the hard way or the easy way. Either way, you're coming with me, and you're going to tell me and my colleagues everything you know. He sensed a wave of fatalism wash over her, and tears began to flow down her cheeks. 
I made a terrible mistake trusting these men. Yes, you did, he said, and then let silence do the work for him. After a minute she wiped her tears with the backs of her hands. Then to his relief she swallowed hard and said, Okay, I choose the easy way. Chapter 37 The bitch was gone. And it was al Mahajer's fault. Rostami slammed the kitchen door. He wanted to scream. No, he wanted to take his blade and plunge it into the Syrian's fucking neck. He paced the kitchen, walking donuts around the Shirazi's granite-topped cooking island. He paused and looked at himself in the reflection of the stainless steel espresso machine on the bar. There were two shallow gouges on his cheek and a third along his eye socket that oozed blood down along his nose. The burning between his legs made him almost desperate to check himself out below, but he couldn't risk the Syrian coming up and finding him with his bloody manhood in his hand. He pulled his gaze away from the distorted reflection, grabbed a paper towel, and began dabbing away the blood on his face. Killing al Mahajer is a legitimate option, he told himself. Without al Mahajer, the operation would proceed as planned in Atlanta and Redmond. Those cells were on autopilot now. Carnage in two out of three target locations was still a victory. He could fabricate a grand fait accompli about discovering that the Shirazis were double agents and serve up this entire debacle in rich detail to Amir Modiri once he was safely back in Tehran. He was so tired of cleaning up other people's messes. This circus should never have been his responsibility in the first place. This was supposed to be Parviz's operation, but no. Parviz had to go and get himself captured by the Americans in Iraq. Gritting his teeth, Rostami made a silent vow to slit the other agent's throat if the fool somehow managed to make it back to Iran alive. Is she dead? Al Mahajer asked. Rostami whirled to find the terrorist standing behind him just inside the doorway to the basement stairs. Yes, he said, glaring at the Syrian. What happened to your face? Al Mahajer said with a scowl. I wanted it to look like a rape. She fought back. What did you do with the body? I shoved it down a sewer culvert, he lied. We need to sanitize this house and go. The elite Suren circle you promised me is a farce. I would have been better off executing this mission alone. Al Mahajer growled as he turned his back on Rostami and headed back downstairs. I hope my men aren't facing similar issues with their Suren hosts in Seattle and Atlanta. Rostami followed al Mahajer while shaking his head. Kevan was a coward, but he was no double agent, and Delilah was serving faithfully and obediently until you decided to bludgeon Kevan in front of her. Did you not see what I saw? Kevan was gathering information to betray us. Delilah was playing the same charade, only she was a much better actor than her husband. If you weren't so stricken by her womanly charms, you would have seen the plain truth as I did. Rustami decided to ignore the jab and hurried over to where Kavon's body still lay oozing on the carpet and began rifling through the pockets. Where is Kavon's phone? I smashed it, the Syrian said. We're out of time. A SWAT team will be here within thirty minutes. I packed everything while you were gone. We must leave immediately. Rustami agreed. He had no intention of ending up in a CIA black site cell next to Parviz, his testicles hooked up to a car battery. He looked at Al-Mahajer. If they were compromised, what is your contingency plan? Do you intend to postpone the operation and reassess? Al-Mahajer hoisted a large duffel bag onto his shoulder and laughed. Postpone and reassess? Oh, Persian, you really are naive. I'm not postponing anything, on the contrary. I'm going to accelerate the timetable. How soon? Rustami asked and quickly finished packing his own duffel. We strike tomorrow, at noon. There was a mania in al Mahajer's eyes. Rustami's stomach lurched at the implications. How can this be accomplished without notifying the other two teams? I will contact the other two teams and advance the timeline. Would it not be safer to maintain MCON and strike at the scheduled time? al Mahajer grinned. We've prepared and trained for this exact scenario. The equipment is prepared, the target locations set, 
The time between when I pass the order and they execute is too short for the Americans to react, inshallah. Besides, for this operation, the other cells require an authentication from me before they act. Rustami held his tongue and kept packing his bag. He'd learned there was no point in debating anything with the man, for al-Mahajer was a man whose opinion was immune to influence. But I still need your help, Persian. My help, Rustami said, finding the grip of his pistol inside his duffel bag. He looked up and gave the insane Syrian a placating smile. Yes, you must fill the void left by your dead Surin companions, al-Mahajer said. You are responsible for getting me to downtown Omaha and recording my glory. You must promise me to upload the video to the Internet so that it may spread around the world. Once you have done this, one last thing for me. Then you are free to return to your life of decadence and impiety in Iran. Rostami hesitated. Was al-Mahajer telling the truth, or was this some new trick to draw him into a position of involuntary martyrdom by entangling him in the events at the target location? He wouldn't be surprised if al-Mahajer had rigged a video camera with C4. Rostami slid his index finger off the trigger guard and onto the trigger. The safest course of action was to simply kill the Syrian now. You want me to film you? he asked. Yes. You will be witness to my sacrifice. You will record it and spread it around the world, so that it may inspire others to have the courage to strike the great Satan as well. My name will be remembered forever, and I will be given a seat at the great table with the prophet in paradise, Alma Jer said, looking up as if the prophet himself were floating overhead. Rastami scowled as the implications of al Mahajer's command and control plan sunk in. He let go of his pistol, leaving it concealed inside his duffel bag. Unless al Mahajer personally made the call, the other cells would not activate. If the other cells did not activate, then the mission would be a failure. Until al Mahajer made that call, Rastami would have to bide his time and continue to play the game. He stood and took al Mahajer by the shoulders. Your reward will indeed be great, my brother, he said. I know we've had our differences, but I swear you can count on me to spread the glory of your sacrifice around the world. Chapter 38 Dempsey shoved the trembling Delilah Shirazi into the back of the SUV. Hey, I didn't know we were allowed to bring dates to this party, Wang said, looking up from his laptop. The joke fell flat. Flex cuffer, Dempsey said to Grimes, brushing the dirt and leaves from his 5'11 tactical cargo pants. Anybody see you? Smith asked. No, Dempsey said, climbing into the Yukon and shutting the door behind him. But we had a close call. I'll fill you in on that later. What's going on inside the house? What are they saying? They smashed the phone, Wang said with a grimace. We lost our ears five minutes ago. I've been trying to find another way in ever since. No joy so far. Shit, Dempsey mumbled. But before we lost the signal, it sounded like they were packing up to leave, Adamo said from the front. The man's jaw was set and confident. Which means it's time to kid up and go do that Navy SEAL shit you love. Dempsey raised an eyebrow. He was slowly gaining a grudging respect for the man, just as he imagined Jarvis predicted. But right now, Adamo had him at a loss. What are you talking about? Adamo looked at him with surprise. We have to hit the house, he said, as if perhaps Dempsey had lost touch with reality. They're going to get away. We can't hit them now, Dempsey said. We don't know the other two targets. Atlanta and Seattle. Where in Atlanta and Seattle? Those are two big fucking cities. There are millions of people there. He swallowed and squeezed his eyes shut. He had hurt Kate and Jake so much already. The thought that they might be anywhere near what was coming was unbearable. We need to know the exact target locations. We need details on the other players. We don't know any of that. His voice was rising to a fevered pitch, and he felt the eyes of his team on him. But she does, Adamo said, looking at Delilah. All eyes shifted to their new guest. The intelligence on the operations in the other cities is compartmentalized. They kept it from us. 
My husband tried to— She stopped mid-sentence, Epiphany slapping her across the face. Oh, my God, Kayvon was working for you? Dempsey nodded. We picked him up leaving the university this afternoon. We made him a deal. Immunity and protection for both of you in exchange for gathering intelligence about the attacks. Then you are the ones responsible for his death. You killed my husband! She shrieked, her face contorting with anger. No, ma'am, Smith said, grave and stern. The terrorists you invited into your home did that. I think you're confusing influence with action. We don't have time for bickering right now, Adamo said with mounting agitation. Our window of opportunity is rapidly closing. Either we hit the house now, or we're going to lose these assholes again. Dempsey nodded. Adamo was right. If they were going to hit the house, they needed to kid up now. He needed an answer right fucking now. He turned to the Persian woman. Cut the crap, Delilah. What are the other two target locations? She clenched her jaw and looked out the window in defiance. Hey, I'm talking to you, he said, gripping her under the chin and turning her face to look at him. You agreed to cooperate, so cooperate. That was before I realized you were responsible for Kayvon's death. Dempsey eyed her torn blouse and ripped open jeans. Sounds like you're confused, so let me clarify. We're not the ones who tried to rape and kill you in the woods. We're not the ones who put a gun to your husband's forehead and executed him while you watched. We're the good guys, lady. We protect people, even people like you. We're out here gathering intelligence to safeguard innocent lives, but the clock is ticking, which means you need to pick a side, but pick quickly, because if you don't, you're going to lose the only friend you have in the whole world right now. You have five seconds. She glared at him, fire in her eyes. He got it. He really did. She needed someone to blame, and the easiest scapegoat is always the closest one. But he didn't have the time for Delilah Shirazi to work through the five stages of grief and come to terms with her widowhood. Time's up, he said. She exhaled. I don't know the targets. Bullshit, Wang said from the back seat. If I knew them, I would tell you, she answered, keeping her gaze fixed on Dempsey. I suppose I owe you at least that for saving my life. Then what can you tell us? he said. I can tell you that there are two terrorists in my basement as we speak. Who are they? Adamo asked, and Dempsey watched the woman carefully. One is a VIVAC agent, and the other is a senior lieutenant in the Islamic State. Those are not identities, Adamo said, pushing up his glasses on his nose. I could have told you as much, or we wouldn't even be here with you. The woman fidgeted and swallowed, her desperation growing. They were careful never to use their real names. I would tell you if I knew them. What I can share is that we picked them up outside Douglas, Arizona, two days ago after they entered the U.S. from Mexico using an underground tunnel. And they were not alone. They traveled with four other jihadists, all ISIS youth. At the pickup, they split into three pairs with orders to strike the assigned targets simultaneously. The two men who came with us are the commanders for the operation— and finally, I can tell you that the attacks are scheduled for the day after tomorrow at 1200 Eastern Daylight Time. Dempsey looked down at his bald fists. If these guys are the commanders, it means al Mahajer is here. He turned to Wang. Hand me my gear bag from the back. I'm going in. Hold on, John, Smith said. You said it yourself. If we hit the house, we jeopardize our ability to discover the other target locations. We have to let this play out. It's going to come down to the wire. Dempsey shook his head. He needed to know the exact locations right fucking now. He needed to know Jake and Kate were safe. He just couldn't tell Smith that. I know what I said, but that was before we knew with absolute certainty that Al Mahajer was in her basement right now. I'm going to go in there and get him. This ain't Iraq and it ain't Poland, bro. That motherfucker is going to hit the homeland in less than 48 hours. Just let me do my job. I'll get the other target locations out of him. I promise you that. He looked at Grimes. You coming, Lizzie, or am I flying solo? The corners of her mouth curled into a devious grin. And let you have all the fun? Hell yes, I'm coming. Wang heaved Dempsey's gear bag over the bench seat. Dempsey grabbed it and set it on his lap. He cracked his knuckles, the anticipation and adrenaline ramping up. 
and then he unzipped the main compartment to begin the combat preparation ritual he'd done thousands of times. Are the other teams being supported by Suran assets in Seattle and Atlanta? Adamo asked Delilah, the words tumbling out of his mouth so quickly they practically blended together. Yes, she said. Dempsey shrugged on his Kevlar vest. Do you know the addresses where the other teams are staying? Adamo continued. No. What are the identities of your Suran counterparts in Seattle and Atlanta? Dempsey clipped his radio to his kit and plugged in his headset. He was only half listening to the conversation now. I don't know. Bullshit! Adamo snapped. Give me the identities of the Surin hosts in Seattle and Atlanta. Dempsey looked past Delilah at Grimes and spoke as if Delilah's interrogation wasn't happening. I say we cut the power to the house and go in on night vision. What do you think? Agreed, she said, fishing her helmet out of her bag. The Surin circle is an enigma even to its own members. Delilah insisted. Communication between members is prohibited, except in the case of emergency or compromise. In such cases we utilize a hierarchical chain of command based on seniority. Kevan and I are second in that chain. Adamo nodded. The senior couple is located in Chicago? Yes. How did you know this? It doesn't matter. All that matters is finding the identities of the Atlanta and Seattle cells. Would the senior couple in Chicago know this information? Possibly, but they would never share it down the chain without explicit instructions to do so. Instructions from who? From Tehran. Dempsey double-checked the extra magazine on his vest and looked at Grimes. Ready? Check, she said. Let's go, he said. Wang, come up on channel. Stop, Smith barked, his voice like a gunshot. We have to leave these guys in play. I only agreed to that before I knew who was in there. Don't you mean before you knew one of the targets was Atlanta? Smith said more softly. Yes, God damn it! Dempsey shouted. He felt the curious stares of Grimes, Adamo, and Wang on him, but refused to look at any of them. I won't let him hurt my family. I can't let him. Smith reached back and put a hand on his shoulder. I understand, believe me. But going in there guns blazing is not going to get us what we need. This is Kaim all over again. You go in now and we lose any chance of identifying the other teams. These guys are sophisticated and determined. They intend to martyr themselves. So wiping out command and control here doesn't stop Atlanta and Seattle. In two days, those other teams will execute regardless of what happens here tonight. Our best hope is that Al Mahajer recognizes he's being surveilled, feels the pressure, and contacts the other cells to advance the timetable. I'm sorry, but I'm with Dempsey on this one. Adamo said, stepping in. This could very well be our one and only shot to take out Al-Mahajer before he kills hundreds of people in Omaha. There's no guarantee we'll learn the other target locations by waiting. Squander this opportunity and we risk lives here. True. But if we don't leave him in play, we are guaranteeing that hundreds of innocents will die in Seattle and Atlanta. If Al-Mahajer communicates with the other cells in the next 12 hours, we'll be able to take out all three cells. Smith said. And if he doesn't, then what? Adamo said, shaking his head at Smith. Leaving him in play is insane. Smith blew air through his teeth. I know. But that's the world we live in now. So you're making the call? Adamo said. No. This is a capture-kill operation, which means Dempsey's in charge. But before the decision gets made, we each have an obligation to speak our minds and make a case for what we think is right. Smith said. That's the Ember way. Dempsey suddenly felt the yoke of responsibility settle back on his shoulders. Technically, Smith could overrule his decision, but Dempsey knew that wouldn't happen. He clenched his jaw. Like Adamo said, if they hit the house now, they would stop one team, for sure. But what if Smith was right? What if by intervening now, his action guaranteed that the two other attacks were executed? He was lying to himself and his teammates to guarantee he could take al Mahajer alive and get the bastard to talk. Don't let family cloud the decision, a voice said inside his head. The odds of them being at the target location at the time of the attack are probably a million to one. But even if his family wasn't there, someone's family would be. Someone's son, someone's daughter, someone's mother, wife, father, husband. Fuck! Dempsey bellowed, shaking his clenched fists in the air. 
The inside of the Yukon fell so quiet he could hear the thump of his pulse in his ears. All eyes were fixed on him waiting for the decision that would determine the fate of hundreds, possibly thousands, of American lives. Dempsey closed his eyes and imagined what Jarvis would say if he were present. The difference between operating for Ember and operating as a Tier 1 SEAL is delayed gratification. We're playing the long game, John, and to win the long game sometimes requires making decisions that, in the heat of the moment, seem counterintuitive. Making those decisions requires courage. Without courage, leadership can't exist. Without leadership, the bad guys win every time. He took a deep breath and opened his eyes and looked at Wang. So Kayvon's phone is deep-sixed? Yeah, boss. Okay. So how else can we track these guys? At a minimum, one of them needs to power on a phone, and by that I mean a phone that they are taking with them, Wang said. So far that hasn't happened. What about hacking into Kayvon's BMW? Can you use the low jack or built-in GPS to track it? Yeah, Wang answered. I hacked it already when we were following the professor here from the university. Perfect. But that won't do us any good if they exfil on foot or take another vehicle. True. So we observe their exit. If they take the BMW, we're golden. If not, we tail them old school, Dempsey said. So we're not hitting the house? Adamo asked with incredulity. Dempsey shook his head. Believe me, dude, I want to. I want to so bad I can taste acid in my mouth, but we can't. These guys are too good. Despite what I said, even if we manage to take al Mahajer, I can't guarantee he'll talk. He's planning to martyr himself in two days. He'd rather die than crack. And after what we saw in Poland, I think any intel we extracted from the VVAC operative would be questionable at best. I promise we'll take these fuckers out before they can execute here in Omaha. But we have to give them a chance to communicate with the other teams. It's our only hope of saving Seattle and Atlanta. Adamo nodded, accepting the decision without further debate. The priority now is getting tactical teams en route to the other targets. Dempsey's personal need to go to Atlanta was almost overwhelming, but he fought it back. He needed to stay in Omaha. al Mahajer had beaten him twice. He wouldn't let it happen a third time. I'll remain here as team leader with Wang. To round out our team, I want an HRT unit here ASAP. Wang let Jarvis know I want a name request for Hansen and his guys from our New York City UN op six months ago. Typing the request now, Wang said. Adamo and Grimes, your team Atlanta. Chunk and his seals are on standby at Ember. I want them to be your augment. Agreed, Adamo said to his surprise. It's the right play. We won't let you down, Grimes added, and in her gaze was an unspoken promise to safeguard more than just the city. Which leaves Seattle. Smith said. And me. You good with that? Dempsey asked. We can augment you with West Coast Seals or some of your old Delta buddies. A couple of names come to mind, Smith said with a nostalgic grin. Don't worry, I'll take care of my own augment. You just focus on Omaha and Atlanta. I'll brief Jarvis en route and get the talks stood up back home to start lining up eyes and ears for us. God knows we're going to need it. Roger that, Dempsey said. All right, everyone, that's the battle order. The mission is simple. Locate and eliminate. Everyone nodded in agreement. Well, what the hell are you waiting for? He growled. Get the hell out of my Yukon and get your asses to the airport. We have work to do and the clock is ticking. Chapter 39 Embassy Suites Downtown Old Market Lobby, 540 South 12th Street, Omaha, Nebraska, November 4th, 0615 local time. Special Agent Scott Hansen walked into the lobby looking exactly like Dempsey remembered. Big, confident, and his face creased with a permanent scowl. The kind of scowl like a man trapped in an elevator with a flatulent stranger. Even in civilian clothes, cargo pants, a black sports shirt, and a cheap gray sports coat bulging around the pistol on his hip, Hansen oozed operator. Hansen was a team leader in the FBI's hostage rescue team. Like Hansen, the vast majority of the nearly 100 operators who made up this quick reaction force were former military special operations. Dempsey pegged Hansen as Army SOF, the same unit Smith hailed from, but he'd yet to confirm this. 
Dempsey extended his hand in greeting, and Hansen shook it with a grip like a hydraulic press. Was there something I did in New York that made you think I was okay with being OGA's own call bitch because I don't remember giving you that impression, Hansen said. Impossibly, the scowl on his face deepened, but Dempsey knew this ruse. Hansen's dark green eyes sparkled with the look of a man glad to be turned loose outside the wire after a dry spell. Sorry, Dempsey said, releasing Hansen's thick, calloused hand. We're in a real shitstorm here, and I really needed someone I could trust. By that you mean someone who's already seen your super spooky ass in action and kept his mouth shut after, Hansen said. That's the real reason I pinged on a by-name request. Dempsey laughed. Yeah, well, there is that. Let's go upstairs and brief. You have a team setting up? Roger, Hansen said. I have the same tech leader you met at the UN, former frogman like you. Plus, a six-man team, all senior, just like you requested. Two are combat medics, retired 18 Deltas. They're set up at the airport, waiting for instructions. Very good, Dempsey said, leading him to the elevator. We need to present a really low profile on this one. Our target will spook easily, and if that happens, we're screwed. Hansen pursed his lips. You know we're not really set up for that kind of thing. Our operations at HRT are, by design, obscenely overt in signature. I understand, Dempsey said. HRT was deployed for tactical strikes when the FBI's critical incident response group needed big guns and special operators. Power projection was a tactical component of most HRT operations. Our situation here requires operators of your caliber, but we'll need more of a stealth presence. Adapt and overcome, right? He added, mimicking the Special Forces mantra. Right, Hansen said, both his voice and expression dubious. They rode the elevator to the sixth floor. As they were stepping off, Dempsey asked, You got the brief from our guys? We got the grainy pictures of the two guys you ID'd as your bad guys, but the report was vague on specifics. Can you share more detail about the operation? Unfortunately, not much. Dempsey confessed as they walked down the hall to the King's suite they were using as an op center. We know the principals, but we're unclear on the other players. We know the general target and the time, but no specifics on the attack itself or precise location. Awesome, Hansen said through a sigh as Dempsey swiped them into the room. Inside, Wang sat hunched over one of six laptops he had lined up on the table in front of him. Special Agent Hansen, this is Dick Wang, our tech genius and field SIGINT guy. Dempsey said, Wang, this is Special Agent Hansen. Wang glanced up, gave a campy wave, then hunched back over his laptop. Where are we? Dempsey asked. Same, Wang said and combed his thick black hair out of his face with his fingers. They're still holed up in the hotel near 24th Street. No one has left. Based on the mobile GPS, the low jack what? Nah. Wang said. Their phones are still off. The BMW is sitting in a lot a few blocks away. Right now, we're stuck with a single channel. Eyes in the sky. Satellite? Wang shook his head. That's my backup. Degraded resolution because Ian is using the same satellite for us in Seattle, so he gave me overlapping drones. Super high-res shit, streaming real time from their command center in Colorado. Nobody's left the hotel all morning. When they do, I'll be able to tell how much change is in their pockets. I don't like it. Dempsey said, What happens if you have to take a piss? Without taking his eyes off the screen, he pointed to a one-liter aquasana bottle on the desk filled halfway up with yellow liquid and said, Dude, I got this. Dempsey shook his head and looked at Hansen. What task force did you guys say you were with? Hansen said, his scowl back and uglier than ever. Dempsey gave a tight-lipped grin. Okay, moving on. Hansen squinted at the screens of some of the other laptops Wang had set up farther down the table. You said two other cities. Omaha isn't the only target? Correct, Dempsey said. Our intel suggests simultaneous attacks in Atlanta and Seattle. Jesus, Hansen said, letting out a whistle. This is some serious shit. Islamic State? Dempsey nodded. With outside help. When you guys aren't CIA. Hansen mumbled. No, but aren't you glad we're here? 
Wang said over his shoulder, his boyish grin finally free. I'll answer that question after it's all over, Hansen said. A knot formed in Dempsey's stomach as a new and terrible idea occurred to him. Wang. Is it possible that Al Mahajer already called the other cells in Seattle and Atlanta and we missed it? Sure, anything's possible, Wang said, his eyes still locked on his laptop. But highly unlikely. That doesn't make me feel better, Dempsey said. If he made the call and we missed it, then Atlanta and Seattle are screwed. Yes, I know. Which is why we're using every SIGINT technology in our arsenal to monitor for that call. Dempsey sighed. Not sure what else to say, but also not satisfied with the situation. Look, Dempsey, Wang said, turning to look at him. I know what room they're in. I know what car they're driving. As of two hours ago, I own the room next to them, and I have equipment inside. When did you pull that off? When you were sleeping, he said with a grin, then turned back to his laptop. Don't worry about it, dude. You do your ninja shit out there, and I'll do mine in here. I'm not going to miss that call. To his surprise, Wang's confidence actually took the edge off his nerves. So when the call happens, then what? Dempsey asks. Can you hack and track the phones on the receiving end? Yeah. So if Fuckstick calls his boys in Atlanta, then you can hack and track the phone in Atlanta? Dempsey asked. Kate and Jacob popped into his mind for the hundredth time in the last few hours. I can track them, Wang said. But that doesn't mean they'll carry the phone around with them. Odds are they're all using burners and they all ditch after final instructions are given and received. But once we get the phone's location, which takes only seconds, we put eyes on them, just like we're doing with Al Mahajer. Even if they ditch their phones, we can still track them, but instead of using GPS, we're following the rabbit. Following the rabbit? Hansen asked. Dempsey looked at the FBI man. Following a target with just line of sight. No signals. With drones and satellites. Less than ideal, obviously, but doable. More than doable, Wang corrected. The new drones can probably read a VIN number for me off a windshield if needed. Don't worry, guys. We'll find the bastards. How do you know? Hansen asked. Wang shrugged. Have to. The alternative is inconceivable. Hansen scowled at Wang for a long moment, then turned to Dempsey. So, what do you need from us? Dempsey walked him over to a paper map of downtown Omaha, spread out on a table. In the middle, the cobblestone-paved streets of the Old Market, laid out between 10th and 13th Streets, and the five blocks north to south between Farnham and Jackson Streets, were highlighted. The quaint entertainment district was one of Omaha's most popular attractions— for both tourists and local residents alike. As the go-to dining destination for downtown Omaha, the old market was a perfect lunchtime target on a sunny fall afternoon, like today. As I said before, Dempsey began, We don't know if Al Mahajer has selected a specific target inside the old market or if he's just planning to wander around machine gun blazing. Hell, he could kill dozens by making a single pass down Howard Street during lunch hour. Hanson leaned in for a better view. Could be worse, he grumbled. If we split up into two-man teams, we can cover the majority of the market. We can either start at the corners and converge or assign teams different key intersections. If I was Al Mahajer, I would launch the attack at the intersection of 12th and Howard. But he's a wily, deceptive bastard. The point is, we need to be really kinetic here and adjust in real time once we see how it unfolds. Can we intercept prior to arrival? We can certainly try, but I think they'll come in on foot. I'll take the northwest corner so I have a better chance of making a visual ID. Okay, Hansen said. How many shooters are we talking about? We think two. Once we pick them up, then what, kill on sight? Dempsey shook his head. We have every reason to think they will have explosive vests and no idea how they will detonate. He wished they had been able to examine the vests or knew more about them. He realized that they had learned almost nothing from the woman, Delilah. They might have dead man switches like the assholes in Brussels who had gloved hand switches that detonate on release. In that case, manual detonation is also a concern if they spot our patrols. Jesus. So why not just take them now? Wang said he knows the room number. My guys can get there in a few minutes. That has to be lower risk of collateral. 
They may not even be kitted up and armed yet. Dempsey shook his head. We're still waiting for the outbound call. If we take Al-Mahajer now, we don't get any intel on the other targets, and those attacks will happen on schedule, and we won't be able to stop them. Okay, so we surround the hotel covertly, wait for the call, and then kill them. It all depends on what's communicated during the call. If Al-Mahajer is using go, no-go protocol, the other teams will be waiting for a last-minute signal to proceed. In that case, we have to wait for the green light call, or the other teams will alter their plans. So you're willing to risk letting this attack happen? Christ, Dempsey. That is some scary cowboy shit, man. If we can get the teams from all three targets ID'd on the first call, we'll hit them all right away. If not, we have to wait. Two minutes later, they were consumed by angles, lines of fire, escape routes, mass casualty plans, and where to place their snipers. Dempsey locked thoughts of Kate and Jacob in a black mental box and dug into the details of stopping Al-Mahajer as they waited for the outbound call that he feared might never come. Chapter 40 Econo Lodge, West Dodge, Omaha, Nebraska, 0710 local time. Rostami looked up from where his forehead was pressed against the cheaply carpeted hotel room floor and watched Al-Mahajer pray his last prayer to Allah. Al-Mahajer had woken him at 4.30 a.m. to share a pot of tea. Then they prayed the Sunnah of Fajr, beginning precisely when 5.15 a.m. had passed. Afterward, Rafiq had kneeled and stared at the wall, not speaking, for an hour. It was not permissible to offer voluntary prayer between the Fajr and sunrise more specifically until the sun had risen a spear's length above the horizon. Twelve minutes apogee was the accepted time period since compact pistols had long ago replaced spears as the instruments of jihad, but al-Mahajer had waited a full fifteen, no doubt extra cautious, today of all days. Rastami watched a tear fall from al-Mahajer's tightly closed eyes and drip onto the floor beside his mobile phone, where a compass app pointed to 42.33 degrees, the line of bearing to the holy shrine of Kaaba, 7,262 miles away in Mecca. If the ISIS commander had not been so stubborn with his decision to wait until the last possible moment to activate the Atlanta and Seattle teams, then Rostami would not be in this situation. If the call had been made, he could have already put a bullet through the man's head. But Al-Mahajer had not made the call, and Rostami's anxiety was following an exponential curve. Last night's events would not go unnoticed. Delilah Shirazi was out there, and that meant the Americans were coming for him. He could feel it in his bones. They were close and getting closer. Every minute that lunatic waited to make the call was a minute closer to capture. He will martyr us both if he keeps this up. Only I no longer believe in a paradise awaiting me in the afterlife. Al-Mahajer's eyes sprung open suddenly, and he sat bolt upright on his knees. Rostami squeezed his eyes shut and began to move his lips in final, feigned prayer. He did manage one short prayer, just in case. Allah, please allow me to survive this madness. After a minute, he opened his eyes and took a long, slow breath, as if completing a deep and solemn prayer. Then he looked over at Al-Mahajer with a tight smile. Today is a great day for true believers, my brother, Rostami said. Your reward for your sacrifice will be great. I'm weary of your false flattery. Al-Mahajir turned to look at him with cold black eyes. What are you talking about? Al-Mahajir laughed sardonically. Do you think me blind? Do you think I don't know your heart, Persian? You might have charmed me at the Emek Café, but I've come to know the real you these past days. You, Behruz Rostami, are not a true believer. Like all Rafida, you are an opportunist who cares only for yourself and sating your most carnal desires. Allah knows this, too, and has no place for your kind in paradise. You have misjudged me, Rostami said while instinctively inching his right hand toward the pistol tucked in his waistband. "'You want to kill me?' Al-Mahajer said, narrowing his eyes. "'You've been contemplating it since Guatemala, but you can't do it now for the same reason you couldn't do it then. 
Your masters in Tehran will put a bullet in your brain if the operation fails. Our destinies are entwined. So it would seem, Rostami said through gritted teeth. Is it time to make the call, brother? al scooped up his phone and got to his feet in a single fluid motion. It is, he said and powered up his phone. Rostami watched him select and dial the first of only two numbers in the contact list. Then al surprised him by turning on the phone's speaker. The phone rang once and picked up. God is great, al said in Arabic. May God be with you, came the reply, strong and confident, much more so than Rostami had imagined. I am moving up the timeline. When? Today we shall be together in paradise, my brother. The pause that followed spoke volumes. Today? the voice said at last. Yes, al replied. God is indeed great. We will be ready. Only the day changes, the ISIS commander instructed. The time and the target remain the same. Confidence had found its way back into the voice on the line. Praise God. al looked into Rostami's eyes and smiled a devious smile as he spoke his next words. I will make another call at precisely one minute before the appointed time. Should that call not come, then something has happened to me, and you will change to the secondary target at the alternate time. Do you understand? I understand. We will be ready and will await your call to strike. al severed the call without a parting word, his black hole eyes still fixed on Rostami. It appears, Persian, that we will be together until the glorious end. Praise and glory to God, Rostami said robotically. As al Mahajir dialed the second team, Rostami's mind was racing. He had not expected the call would be made only in the final seconds of the attack. al Mahajir had thought of everything. Now he needed to devise an escape plan from the old market because the opportunity to send al Mahajir to paradise early was forever lost to him. Chapter 41 Embassy Suites Downtown, Old Market Lobby, 540 South 12th Street, Omaha, Nebraska, 0720 local time. Got him! Wang shouted, his fingers flying over his keyboard. Now I just have to lock the coordinates and move the drones. We need a solid visual fix for backup in case they power the phone off. Dempsey walked over and squeezed Wang's shoulders. The Universal Ops Center attaboy. I'll do it, came Baldwin's voice, calm and professorial, from the second laptop screen. You stand by to lock the second phone. Okay, Wang said. They're in downtown Atlanta, tracking just off the intersection of Carnegie Way and Cone Street. Looks like they're in a parking garage. You gotta be fucking kidding me, damn it! Calm down, Richard, Baldwin said slowly and softly, a teacher to a student. I have a fix, and I'm recording the call. Please prep for the next call. I'm sure the director would prefer to hear the live audio as opposed to your commentary. Wang mumbled something under his breath and glanced over his shoulder at Dempsey. We can track them out of the garage, right? Dempsey said. If they keep the phone powered on, if not, they could drive away in any of a dozen cars and without eyes on the ground, we wouldn't know which one, Wang said as he typed and clicked. Shit. Dempsey saw a new number flash on one of the laptops. Is that the second call? he said, pointing to the center screen. Wang slapped his hand away. Hands off, dude! That's like a touch screen. You're gonna jack up my shit! Dempsey pulled his hand back and Wang tapped the screen, this time bringing the audio up on the speakers. The speakers greeted each other in Arabic. Dempsey felt his fists and throat tighten hearing al Mahajer's voice. What are they saying? he asked. Moving up the timeline. They're going today, but at the same time as previously planned, God is great... They're going to paradise to bang virgins, blah, blah, blah. Now, something about a second call one minute before and instructions to change targets if the call isn't received. The words hit Dempsey like a punch in the gut. Fuck. He turned to look at Hanson. How'd you know, Dempsey? Hanson said. How'd you know they'd pull that shit? Because this is not my first rodeo. Dempsey said. We've seen this tactic before. He watched Wang's hands fly across several different laptops. The second screen to the left was zooming in spurts, magnifying a particular section of Seattle. 
Wang ignored the map and satellite feeds, his fingers typing code furiously on the computer beside it. Almost got it. Got what? Dempsey asked, but then bit his tongue, trying to be quiet. Oh, yeah, Wang shouted and raised his hands over his head. I own you, bitches. He looked up at Dempsey with the smile of an eighth grader bringing home an A-plus on his science project. Now I'll just run the GPS in the background. He was back to tapping again, this time on the center keyboard. Got him, he said, and a blue dot now appeared on the satellite image. The camera zoomed in on a neighborhood situated like a little peninsula surrounded by the Broadmoor Golf Club. It was located just south of Route 520 and less than five miles northeast of downtown. The image zoomed again, and soon he was looking at the top of a big white house with a circular brick driveway cutting through well-manicured hedges. In Seattle, it had to be a $3 million home, maybe more. The dot flashed in the northwest corner of the house. Can you tell what floor they're on? Dempsey asked. Wang looked up, eyebrows raised. Sure, he said. Do you need that? He started typing again. No, I was kidding. I just... The device is 15.6 feet from ground level, so second floor. Christ, Wang, where'd Jarvis find you again? The same find my iPhone, man, Wang said, gloating now. I'm using some seriously high-speed shit, dude. I'm in, Baldwin said from the other laptop. The encryption is generic on this phone. I'll dump the data for the team to sort through. Also, I have a drone on the way. For the Seattle location? Wang asked, clarifying. Yes, Seattle. What about Atlanta? I should have it. Wait a moment, Baldwin said, his voice terse, but still measured like a college professor lecturing. Shit, Wang said. What's wrong? Dempsey asked. All the screens looked the same to him. The Atlanta phone powered off. Wang was typing again, this time on the last laptop in the row. But if the battery is still in, then I can interrogate the GPS in 911 mode. Much less precise, but still useful. Shit! It's gone. They must have taken the battery out. It's not your fault, Richard, Baldwin said. Tell me you at least got a data dump from the Atlanta phone before it powered off? Wang asked. Incomplete, Baldwin said. The Atlanta phone had better encryption. Why don't you periodically try to power it back on, just in case they put the battery back in? If you succeed, let me know immediately so I can export the remaining data from it. No promises, Wang said, but I'll try. You focus on that and I will sift the data from the Seattle phone for coordinates or anything pointing to the specific target location. Dempsey stared at the zoomed-in image of the house in Seattle. This is good, he told himself. Very, very good, but it wasn't enough. He looked at his watch, almost 0800. The attacks were scheduled for 1 o'clock p.m. in Atlanta, noon in Omaha, and 10 o'clock a.m. in Seattle. That gave the tech weenies four hours to figure out the target locations. He watched Wang work for several minutes until he decided that him hovering wouldn't help the process go any faster. He walked over to the map of the old market and began running tactical scenarios in his head, laying them on the map with his mind. It wasn't long before thoughts of Al Mahajer intruded, derailing his concentration. He'd been beaten twice by the bastard, and both times because he'd made the same mistake. He thought he'd gained the upper hand, let down his guard for an instant, and then paid dearly for it. There was nuance to how Al Mahajer utilized his suicide bombers, but Dempsey couldn't articulate what it was. Like a forgotten question, impossible to answer without first being recalled. To beat Al Mahajer this time, he would have to solve this strategic puzzle before the terrorist's vest went boom. Chapter 42 Ember Talk, Newport News, Virginia Jarvis paced the talk, tapping the side of his stainless steel coffee tumbler with his thumb. For the hundredth time, he glanced at the center display and the static blue dot superimposed over the target address in the upscale Broadmoor neighborhood north of Seattle. The dot had not moved on the map for hours, and now he was beginning to worry. He resisted the urge to sigh. He resisted the urge to clench his jaw. He resisted the urge to curse his adversary and the limits of technology and everything else in the universe that seemed to be conspiring against them. Events were not unfolding like he had anticipated. Soon he would start second-guessing himself, and that was a road he did not want to go down. He looked up at the row of digital clocks above the screens, each giving the time in a variety of U.S. and international time zones. 12.15 EDT, 11.15 CDT, 
1015-MDT, 0915-PDT. They were 45 minutes from showtime with no fix on the terrorists in Atlanta and no intelligence on the target locations in either Atlanta or Seattle. Where are we with Atlanta? he asked Baldwin, who was sitting at a computer terminal in a row of terminals along the wall. No change, Baldwin said. I can put the drone imagery up, but it's just circling downtown. You still have Wang trying to interrogate the phone? Yes, but with no success. We believe they removed the battery, in which case our next and only window of opportunity to get a fix will be when Al Mahajer makes the go-no-go -go call just before the attack. Jarvis nodded gravely. Any other ideas how we can— We've got movement, Baldwin interrupted. Jarvis looked up at the monitor left of center as the aerial imagery from an MQ-9 Reaper drone slowly rotated and began to zoom in. He watched as a silver sedan pulled out of the garage and backed down the driveway. A beat later, a red triangle appeared in the middle of the high-resolution image, indicating that the target had been acquired. Then the zoom accelerated dramatically until the crystal-clear image of an Infinity Q70 sedan filled most of the screen. The targeting system on the MQ-9 Reaper drone matched the movements of the vehicle perfectly. On screen, the sedan appeared motionless, the only indication of movement being the asphalt slipping by underneath as the drone tracked the target with miraculous precision. Thermals? Jarvis said. Stand by. One signature, Baldwin said. Just the driver. Jarvis slammed his coffee tumbler down on the conference table, causing Baldwin to jump. Damn it! What do you want me to do? We need to track the Infinity and keep eyes on the house. They're supposed to be two-man teams. You think the Infinity could be a decoy? Baldwin asked. Yes. What are my coverage options? Satellite for the next twelve minutes. After that, we're going to have problems. There's weather moving in. You're fucking kidding me. I wish I were. It's raining in Everett and creeping south. Bravo, one. did you hear that? Jarvis said on the open channel. Copy, came Smith's voice back over the talk speakers. Want me to send a vehicle to the house? Bravo, two could be there in ten mics, but be advised it could impact our response once the target location is identified. I could circle the drone? Baldwin said. No, keep the drone on the infinity, Jarvis said, then louder. Bravo 1, send a vehicle to Broadmoor Drive. Copy, said Smith. Where the hell is he going? Jarvis said, pointing to the blue dot which was now moving on the map in sync with the infinity's real-time position as tracked by the Reaper. He's heading north on Foster Island Road, Baldwin said. Yes, I can see that, Ian, but why is he getting on to 520 East? I don't know. What in Christ's name is going on? A phone chirped beside Baldwin, and he picked it up. Yes? Okay, then walk over and tell us. Jarvis looked at Baldwin. Chip and Dale have a theory where he's going, Baldwin said, and then focused back on his screen. Zoom out on the Reaper, half-mile radius, Jarvis said, and immediately the infinity began to shrink on the screen. He watched as the sedan took 520 east across Lake Washington, away from Seattle, toward Bellevue. A second later, the talk doors burst open and Chip rushed in, nervous excitement on his face. I think I know where he's going. Central Park East Apartments, located south of 520 and just east of Highland Crossroads. Where is that? Jarvis said. Right here, Baldwin said, as a digital pin materialized in the center display, approximately halfway between Bellevue and Redmond. How did you get this address? Jarvis asked, turning to face the analyst. The browser history we pulled from the hacked phone showed several Google queries. One of the queries was for this apartment complex. We also see they used the map function several times, zooming in and scrolling around. They generated two different route maps to the apartment complex from the residents on Broadmoor Drive. Jarvis allowed himself a slight smile. Nice work. We'll know in the next few minutes, but I think you just ID'd the pickup location for the shooters. But we still don't know the target, Baldwin said. Jarvis walked to the conference table and picked up a stack of printed probability distributions, each for a different target location and each calculated using Ember's Monte Carlo simulation software. He had run 37 simulations to generate a list of probable target locations, 20 for Atlanta and 17 for Seattle, based on a specific list of factors including accessibility, visibility, crowd size, crowd density, native security presence, financial value, name recognition, social significance, and distance to closest law enforcement first responders.
The highest probability target for Seattle had been the Space Needle. The iconic structure satisfied multiple criteria, and it had been Jarvis's instinctive first choice before running any stats. But the time of the attack, 10 o'clock a.m., severely impacted crowd size. The waterfront also scored high marks across all criteria, but took a similar hit on crowd size and density at the target time. Now, with the driver heading east, away from downtown, the probability distributions were changing rapidly in real time. He didn't have time to rerun the simulations, but as a synesthete, he possessed certain gifts when it came to numbers and figures. As he flipped through the pages, he perceived the ink changing colors. Red, 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 blue, yellow, red, yellow, blue, red. When he was finished, he pulled the blues and set the others aside. As he scanned the new shortlist, connections formed in his mind. al Mahajer was not hitting a single target, he was hitting three. His goal was not to simply maximize civilian carnage, but to send a powerful message of fear. That message was, Americans are not safe anywhere, whether you live in Boston or Boise, Orlando or Omaha, big city or small town, whether you're going out to shop, to dine, to play or to work, you're not safe. Jarvis looked up to find both Baldwin and Chip staring at him. He selected the page with the brightest blue font, color that only he could perceive, and slammed it down on the table. They're not hitting downtown, he said. The target is the Microsoft campus in Redmond. Baldwin's eyes went wide, and then he whipped around in his chair to face his terminal. As his fingers flew across his keyboard, he began rattling off information. Eighty buildings spread out across a 500-acre campus serving 30,000 employees. On-site dining, on-site gym, on-site post office, on-site daycare. It's the perfect target, Chip chimed in. It's a microcosm of Seattle. Bravo One, are you copying this? Jarvis asked into the ether. Copy, Smith said. Be advised, we're downtown and Bravo Two is arriving on station at Broadmoor. We know your locations, Bravo. Then you understand that our tangos have a big head start. Prosecution could be difficult. Copy that, Bravo One. Jarvis turned to Baldwin, who read his mind and nodded. We're working on a backup solution, just in case. Do you want me to reposition now or hold until you confirm the pickup? Smith asked. Jarvis considered the question for a beat. Reposition to intercept. Hold Bravo Two in position as a backup in case I'm wrong and we need quick reaction downtown. Roger that, Smith said. Bravo One, ready for coordinates. While Baldwin transmitted real-time routing guidance to Smith's vehicle, Jarvis returned his attention to the monitor with the drone footage. But instead of seeing the infinity, all he saw was gray haze. God damn it, he barked. We're going to miss the pickup. Baldwin, get me lower now. Be advised, sir. Radar shows the cloud base for this system at 800 feet. At that altitude, everyone, including our shooters, will see the Reaper. Damned if I do, damned if I don't, he murmured, running his fingers through his hair. What's that, sir? Baldwin said, looking up at him expectantly. Nothing. He took a deep breath and then gave the order. Coordinate with the pilot and take her down. Whatever it takes, Mr. Baldwin, do you understand we cannot miss this pickup? Understood. Baldwin picked up a handset and called the drone pilot 1,700 miles away. The conversation lasted only 20 seconds. We can stay at Cloud Base and pop in and out, Baldwin said after hanging up the phone. Hopefully catch the pickup but minimize exposure of the drone. Not hopefully. Jarvis growled. We need visual confirmation of the pickup. Baldwin pursed his lips. Jarvis shot him a look. You disagree? Well, no, not entirely, Baldwin said. Visual would be nice, but this is an all-weather drone. The new tracking system allows it to maintain the target designation it already achieved on the Infinity. Your point, Ian, I'm sorry, but we have a time issue here. The middle screen was still filled with only dense gray clouds. My point is that, regardless of the clouds, we'll continue tracking the infinity. We'll see it stop and confirm the location the chip identified from the map display. Thermal imaging will cut the clouds and confirm the number of people in the vehicle. Jarvis considered this, but he wanted to see the shooters enter the vehicle. Three decades' experience of hunting shitheads was worthless if his eyes were stuck in the clouds. Yet, Baldwin had a point. If the two or three signatures were added and the vehicle resumed track toward Redmond? All right, circle in the cloud base. When the vehicle stops, I want a short drop out of the clouds to try and get a visual. If the thermals confirm a pickup, we follow the infinity with the drone and continue Bravo 1 to the intercept and leave Bravo 2 at Broadmoor's back up for downtown. 
Baldwin nodded and spoke again into his handset, coordinating with the drone pilot. And they waited. It was minutes, but felt like hours. Jarvis checked the feeds from Dempsey and Omaha and Adamo and Grimes in Atlanta, but no new information was available to him to distract his racing mind. He tapped his metal thermos. He paced and watched the blue dot on the map display and the clouds on the center screen. They took the exit for Highland Crossroads. They're a minute or so from Chip's projected pickup point. Stand by to dive the Reaper. Seconds dragged and dragged and dragged. Okay, they've stopped, Baldwin said. On your mark. Jarvis closed his eyes and pictured men moving swiftly from the apartment to the car on the street. He watched them in his mind and counted off their steps. Now, he said, opening his eyes. Roger. Jarvis watched the white-gray mist dissolve and become green foliage bisected by the black asphalt of Route 520. The image refreshed and he was looking at the infinity, dead center in the large screen. The right front passenger door was swinging closed and he glimpsed a ponytail trailed by a thin forearm, definitely female. A larger body, sporting a mop of black hair, jumped into the rear seat. The door closed and he got a short glimpse of a black boot as it disappeared. On the far side, another male was stepping into the car. He was hurrying, and Jarvis noted the unnatural bulge between the shoulder blades under the jacket he wore. A beat later, the image turned gray and then white as the Reaper pulled back into the cloud base. It's them. Baldwin looked at Jarvis with a frown, and then down at his screen. We have four thermals in the vehicle. The target is pulling away from the curb, Baldwin said. I didn't see weapons. It's them, Jarvis said again. The Surin couple in the front and two ISIS jihadis in the back. He looked at the map and saw the blue dot move in step with the infinity as it pulled away from the curb and then made a U-turn. He watched the blue dot head north and take the ramp onto Route 520. He noted the green dot Bravo 1 was also on Route 520, but only now crossing Lake Washington. You need to haul ass, Bravo 1, Jarvis said. Pickup confirmed. The shooters are en route to Microsoft. Chapter 43 Old Market, Omaha, Nebraska, 1120 Local, 1220 Atlanta, 0920 Seattle Dempsey needed to get his head in the game. The more time he spent worrying and wondering about Kate and Jacob, the less effective he'd be. This was exactly the reason Jarvis had Baldwin segregating comms and information flow for all three target operations out of the talk. It was unrealistic to think he could prosecute his own target while coordinating Bravo and Charlie teams. And I can't prosecute Al Mahajer while I'm worrying about Kate and Jacob. Hansen sat beside him in the passenger seat. The other six HRT agents, uneasy with their street clothes and gym bags holding their rifles and gear, were assembled at the rear of the SUV. Dempsey pulled his mobile phone out of his small backpack on the floor beside Hansen's foot, entered his passcode, and then tapped the Facebook icon. Checking something? Hansen asked. Dempsey thought of three lies simultaneously, but went with the truth. Yeah, he said as the app opened. I have a wife and teenage boy in Atlanta. I'm just checking to see where they are, not sending anything. Didn't I ask? Hansen said. I sure as shit would let my family know if there is an attack coming to my hometown. Dempsey nodded. Direct communication was impossible for him. He was dead, after all, and unlike in Stephen King novels, the dead did not speak to their spouses and children via Facebook or any other form of social media. The air caught in his throat as he read Kate's last status update from less than an hour ago. Teacher in service day, taking Jake downtown for lunch, and an afternoon of shark watching. Great kid, great day. She'd posted a selfie of the two of them standing in front of a townhouse. His son looked insanely tall. No longer the little boy Dempsey still pictured in his mind's eye. Jake was looking sideways at his mom, smiling awkwardly but with adoration. Fuck. Everything okay? Dempsey turned to Hansen, who wore a look of concern that he imagined pertained to Dempsey's role in the mission more than anything else. Yeah, he said. Everything is five by. He turned on the radio in the inside pouch of his black jacket and spoke into the air, the comms picked up by the micro Bluetooth in his ear. Mother, any data on the Charlie team target? There was a long, 
uncomfortable pause. Negative, Alpha-1. Charlie team is in hot standby, ready to go. Stay focused. Copy, Dempsey said with pursed lips. Did Jarvis know something but wasn't telling him? Doubtful. Atlanta was hundreds of miles away, and he was here. His thoughts went to Grimes and Adamo, and he said a little prayer that they'd keep his family safe. Then he reminded himself that there were wives and children and husbands at the old market he needed to worry about. He owed those families his undivided attention. Dempsey let the seal inside him take control, and he slipped into his familiar tactical routine. He checked his gear. Pistol in the waistband of his pants, the extra magazines on his left belt, and wireless earbud. He exited the truck and met Hansen at the rear of the vehicle where the other four agents milled about, hands in pockets looking awkward. Dempsey gave them a tight grin. You guys look like Marines on Liberty. Untuck your shirts, relax your shoulders. Try to look casual. When you're in your sector, you can't just stand there, mingle, browse, buy something in a shop, order a coffee at the Starbucks, pretend to text or pretend to be on the phone. If the bad guys see FBI-looking dudes standing on the corner scanning the crowd, we're blown. Got it? Yes, sir, one of the agents, almost certainly a former Marsoc guy like Mendez had been, said, and Dempsey winced. All right, get moving. Don't worry, they'll be fine, Hansen said, after the two teams assigned to the southern end of the market wandered off. But good call putting those teams south, he laughed. The remaining two agents stood beside them, arms folded, waiting for orders. You guys set? Dempsey asked. They both nodded. So you're with me, he said to the shorter one. We walk together and we talk. We laugh. We bullshit around. We look like guys just heading to lunch. Got it? You see something suspicious or anybody who looks like our tangos, you let out a big laugh and lean and tell me like it's a raunchy secret. Can you do that? The guy nodded. He was older and looked more confident than his colleagues. You're the SEAL from New York City, right? Right, the guy said without a smile. You can call me Basher. I was the tactical team leader. And you're the should I take the red pill or the blue pill SEAL from the Matrix nobody talks about? Yeah, I'm that guy. I took the red pill. The SEAL laughed. Morpheus showed you the real world, huh? Dempsey thought about the strange universe of counterterrorism Jarvis had pulled him into. The metaphor fit. He grinned wryly. Something like that. Well, you were solid at the UN, Basher said. I'll trust your spooky ass on this one. Cool, Dempsey said. Then, looking at the other pair, you guys good? Hansen nodded. We'll work that northeast sector and stay in touch. I'm keeping the Vox off for bullshit chatter unless we see something, all right? Dempsey nodded. Yeah, same here. Dempsey clipped a small black disc to the button closure of his shirt. The camera was no longer than a button cell battery, but it would stream high-resolution real-time video back to Jarvis in the talk at Ember. He and Basher hiked in slowly, two friends with some time to kill. Dempsey had spent more hours than he cared to remember recently doing just this drill, scanning the crowd for a target while looking like he wasn't. They were still a bit early, so he wanted to get the lay of the land and then move back to the north where he expected al Mahajer and his partner to enter the market on foot. If the phones were still off, the high-altitude drones should, he hoped, track their infill. Wang spoke in his earpiece as if he had read his mind. Phones are still off. No movement from the hotel, but it's getting kind of busy over that way. Don't miss them, Dempsey said harshly, but then turned to his SEAL teammate and laughed. The man chuckled back and shook his head. Basher was a better actor than Dempsey had expected. I won't, Wang said. I'm running the camera and the pilot has control of the bird. I can see everyone leaving the hotel. Are you in position? Dempsey asked. Check. I'm on the top floor of the parking deck in the truck. I'm good, Daddy-o. Is he always like this? Basher asked. No, Dempsey said. Sometimes he's annoying and immature. The agent laughed for real now. They stopped at Scooter's Coffee a block into the old market at the corner of Howard and 12th Street. Heads up, J.D., I got them, Wang said. Dempsey felt his pulse quicken and forced himself to slow down as he paid for two coffees. Thanks a bunch, he said and handed the barista a ten-dollar bill. Keep the change and have a great day. Thank you. Yeah, it's definitely them, Wang's voice said in his ear. Moving on foot, two tangos. They left together but have stretched out. I think it's 
Al Mahajer in the lead, and now the other Spanky is a half block back, heading east, coming your way. Dempsey and Basher loitered in the coffee shop and waited for Wang's next update. He forced himself to make small talk and sip his coffee casually. They had time. Al Mahajer had several blocks to cover. They're turning east on Harney now, the lead guy anyway. Second guy in trail nearly a block back now. The lead guy is wearing a jacket and carrying a bag. The second guy is wearing short sleeves and has no carry. Weird. He can't be wearing a vest. No way he's packing anything bigger than a subcompact. He's texting on his phone now. Dempsey nodded at Basher and stepped outside scooters. He set them on an intercept course, striding casually through the old market. Maybe he's not the guy, he said to Wang. Sure you didn't see a third? Negative. That was weird, Dempsey thought. Delilah Shirazi had been clear about al Mahajer prepping two suicide vests in her basement. Was the other bomber coming in from another route? Was the guy walking with al Mahajer a decoy? Shit! He had planned to move the two South teams to the Mint Market once they had a visual, but now... Alpha 3 and 4 stay South, he said softly, then elbowed his partner and laughed. The seal glowered at him instead of laughing, which played to anyone watching. Two, we're going to stage at the bus stop on Harney and 13th on the southeast corner. You guys slip behind us to mid-block on Howard between 12th and 13th. He thought a moment. Actually, two, split your team. One guy to Howard. The other patrol that northeast corner. The guy trailing al Mahajer is probably the VVAC operative, which means there could be a third player we don't see. Dempsey hated splitting his team, but he had no choice. They only had so many guys, and there was a lot of market to cover. There have been no other comms from these dudes, if that helps, Wang chimed in. If they met up with another shithead here in Omaha, I missed the call. They've been dark since the calls to the other target cities. Check, Dempsey said, and then a thought occurred to him. What if al Mahajer had pre-staged explosives around the market? That was exactly the type of devious shit the bastard would think of. Guys, make sure you're looking for abandoned bags, packages, etc. They may have pre-staged IEDs. You want us to canvas the shops? One of the patrolling operators asked. Negative. That would keep you out of the game too long. Hansen said on comms. They made it to the bus stop and took a seat on the bench. Dempsey pretended to show something to his buddy, Basher, on his phone, laughed, and started sipping his coffee. He set his bag on the bench beside him and pulled the zipper back halfway. Inside, he could see the SIG 556 compact rifle with the stock collapsed to its shortest length. The seal in him wanted to take it out, recheck the round in the magazine, and sling it across his chest. Tango almost to you, said Wang in his ear. Across Harney and coming to the corner at 13th. Dempsey looked at the corner and spotted al Mahajer, and his blood went cold. He hadn't expected to feel such a visceral reaction. Images of Romeo in Iraq and Mendez in Mexico flooded his mind, and he willed the ghastly, grisly memories back into the black lockbox in his head. Contact, he whispered, and forced himself to look away. Crossing the street south, but staying on the west side of 13th. I have him. Where is the other asshole? He's in tow, but... Wait, he's turning south now on 14th. Two pick up Tango 2 on Howard, or if he turns east toward you, three and four, stay alert. He turned to his teammate and laughed and slapped the man on the back, earning a scowl and a fake laugh. He watched in his peripheral vision as al Mahajer passed on the far side of 13th Street. Once he passed, Dempsey activated his Vox. Here we go, Alpha, he said. Mother Alpha has the target. He tapped the camera disc on his shirt, streaming to you now and moving south. Roger, receiving you, Lima Charlie. Hearing Jarvis's calm voice brought Dempsey into the zone. He tapped the former seal on the shoulder, and they stood, gym bags in hand, and began walking. They were twenty-five yards behind the ISIS terrorist he had been hunting for a quarter of his life. As he walked, al Mahajer pulled out his mobile and raised it to his ear. Mother, this is Alpha One. al Mahajer is making a call. I repeat, Tango is making a call. Copy, Alpha One came Jarvis's voice. Interrogating now. Dempsey watched al Mahajer lower the phone, look at the screen, and then raise it to his ear again. Mother Alpha One Tango is making a second call. He's activating the other cells. Copy Alpha, we're on it. He knew he shouldn't ask the question, but couldn't help himself. Did you get the Atlanta location? After a long beat, the answer came back. Affirmative, Alpha One. Charlie team is moving into position. Just keep your eye on the ball. Mother out. Dempsey swallowed hard and tried to cage his emotions. They'll be fine, he told himself. 
And as he watched the ISIS terrorist drop his mobile phone into a trash can, the little voice inside his head reminded him that nothing with his old nemesis was what it appeared to be. Al-Mahajer had one last trick up his sleeve, and Dempsey still had no idea what it was. Chapter 44 Ember Talk We've got the Infinity just a few minutes from the 51st Street exit, Baldwin said. Three tangos inside, plus the driver. Jarvis shifted his focus from Dempsey and Omaha to watching the green dot, Bravo 1 in pursuit of the blue dot, the Infiniti Q70 sedan. Both vehicles were driving north on Route 520 toward Redmond. Smith's SUV had closed the gap, but was still a mile behind. A missile strike from the drone had become the primary solution. Unfortunately, Route 520 was not cooperating with this plan. This was not some backcountry rural highway. It was the major commuter artery between Redmond and Seattle. A remote stretch suitable for a missile strike without the risk of collateral damage simply did not exist. Traffic wasn't rush hour bumper to bumper, but it was heavy enough that an aerial attack at highway speed would result in significant civilian injury. Orange numbers scrolled in his head. His best bet, he decided, was to hit them on the exit ramp of 51st Street as they looped east on the exit toward 148th Street and the entrance to the vast Microsoft Redmond campus. If that did not pan out, he would strike the target as they entered the complex on Microsoft Way. Everything depended on collateral damage. Bravo One, keep trying to close a gap. We're going to need you if collaterals prevent a strike. I'm doing 90, came Smith's voice. Three miles to the exit. Jarvis shifted his gaze from the map to the Reaper feed. Imagery inside a gray cloud with streaks of rainwater forming and sliding to the bottom corners of the lens. The red triangle in the middle marked the infinity, if the clouds weren't in the way. He looked back at the map and the blue dot and the green dot. Too far. He made his decision. Bravo One, be advised. We're going with the aerial solution. We still need you to confirm the kill afterward and assist in the case of collaterals. There was a pause as the words sunk in for his operations, officer. Finally, Smith said, You have control of the kill? Can you confirm? Yes, Bravo One. Aerial attack on the tango. He expected a protest from Smith, but got one from Chip instead. We're going to launch a drone strike on American soil? Really? the analyst said, his face going pale. Is that even legal? Jarvis looked at him and nodded. An attack on American soil by an armed military drone was actually not unprecedented, but he doubted anyone involved with supporting this mission or even their extended chain knew that. He turned to Baldwin. Get me Colorado on the red phone, please. I'll talk to the boss. You brief the pilot. Yes, sir. Ringing him now. You're speaking to Colonel Benjamin Price, Baldwin said softly and handed the wireless phone to Jarvis. Usually wireless was best avoided, but the whole of the Ember underground complex was shielded from any outside electronic interrogation. Good morning, Colonel, Jarvis said. If that were true, why am I getting a call on this line from an untraceable number? Sir, my name is Brian Smith. I had a secret joint counterterrorism task force answering to SecDef and the DNI. D&I is sending you an authority code for this mission. My men are briefing your pilot, who will, in about 90 seconds, need you to release his restrictions. This is the shit in Seattle, I assume. Yes, sir. We are going to authorize a missile strike on the target in less than two mics. Well, fuck me, came the tense voice. I have your authorization code from D&I coming in now. My pilot is ready, and we are secure in our skiff. Transmit the targeting data. He has it already, Jarvis said. The target is locked. Roger that, said the salty colonel a thousand miles away. Can you give us a laser designation on the target? A blind shot from cloud cover is one thing in the middle of nowhere Iraq, but this is down fucking town, Redmond. Jarvis thought a moment. Bravo team had a Northrop Grumman GLTD-2 laser target designator. It was not as bulky as the ANPED-1. It also didn't have the warm-up time that the larger device needed, but the precision was similar, and certainly good enough to confirm the target already locked by the Reaper. He looked up at the map and saw that Bravo 1 was 500 meters in closing. We have a ground asset. I'll make the call and try to light the target so you can confirm that you're tracking the actual target. 
Then we wait for a shot that will mitigate any collateral damage. Mitigate or minimize. Jarvis paused. He understood. No one was going to come asking questions of a task force that didn't even exist. This mission is critical to saving American lives, Colonel. We will have your back, I assure you. I've heard that before. Not from me, Jarvis said. He weighed the situation. The colonel would follow his orders either way. Still. Sir, my name is Captain Kelso Jarvis. You come and find me if anyone comes fucking with you after this. There was a tight chuckle. You're all good on our end, Captain Jarvis, the colonel said. We know what we signed up for at this command. The line went dead. Jarvis looked at the screen again. The infinity was just a few moments from taking the exit. Bravo One, did you hear the last? Yes, sir. We have the hand held and have a visual on the target. Still closing the gap, but we'll be good to light the target in another hundred meters. Shit. There was a pause. Jarvis waited. There's a car ahead of the tango and a minivan behind it on the ramp. We can't see them, Bravo One. The drone is in the clouds. Light the target and call the shot. In his mind, Jarvis could see the three cars tightly packed on his moving map and behind Bravo Team's SUV. Jarvis let the two columns of numbers stream through his mind, one representing the collateral damage risk and fallout, and the other the targeting opportunities still left. Reaper, do you have the target locked? Jarvis said to the open room. The link to the skiff where Colonel Price and his operator controlled the drone was now on speaker. The green triangle switched to red. Target is locked. The pilot sounded tense, maybe even a little scared. Waiting to confirm with the laser designator. Hold fire for my order, Jarvis said. Roger. The blue dot was stopped near the bottom of the ramp. The green dot was at the top of the ramp, decelerating but closing. Bravo, be advised the tango will be turning right, Jarvis said. Check, Smith said. Looks like the car ahead of the tango is turning left. Jarvis watched the screen and saw the blue dot creep forward to the intersection and the green dot come to a stop within a car's length. Fuck, the minivan has its right turn signal on, Smith reported. There are kids in the minivan, boss. I can see them watching a cartoon on the video player through the back window. We have from now until they reach the entrance to the campus to take the shot, Jarvis reassured him. They're probably going there too, sir. Microsoft has a daycare program. Can you hold? We can engage from here. We're ready to go. The numbers scrolled through his mind's eye. More risk of collateral that way, Bravo One, he said. Any other vehicles approaching from the north? Negative, sir, Smith said. But the minivan... I need a visual pilot right now, Jarvis barked. Drop below the cloud base. Mother, Bravo One, Tango is turning. Hold your fire until my mark, Smith said, his voice rife with tension. On the drone feed, the gray haze disappeared and Jarvis saw the Infinity sedan turning right. A second later, the minivan began its right turn, but before it could finish, Bravo One's SUV clipped the van's right rear panel, spinning the van 90 degrees and perpendicular to the road. The van stopped, still at the corner of the exit. Smith's SUV then accelerated around the van, veered into the southbound lane, and then immediately swerved back into the northbound lane, narrowly avoiding a head-on collision with a passing Honda. Smith's maneuver was genius and executed perfectly, stopping the minivan while protecting the family inside. Jarvis watched as Bravo One accelerated after the infinity. Lighting up the target, Smith said, breathless from the tension and the accident he had just caused. His passenger rose head and shoulders out the SUV's sunroof, lighting up the infinity with his handheld laser designator. Target is lit. Now, Reaper, Jarvis barked. Engage. There was no reply, but the triangle on the screen that represented the targeting system of the Reaper flashed. Fire streaked across the lower right side of the screen. A heartbeat later, the blue dot representing the infinity flickered and disappeared as the missile hit. The drone feed went gray as the pilot played peekaboo again, disappearing the drone back up into the clouds. Direct hit, came Smith's voice. Target is... um... gone. Nothing left but a smoking hole and a couple of wheels. Nice shooting, Mother. No collateral damage from the strike to us or the minivan. Jarvis turned to Baldwin. Get on the horn with the locals, police and FBI, and find someone to help manage this. Then louder, he added, Bravo, one, get the hell out of there. Copy, came Smith's reply. With Seattle safe and no time to waste, he turned his attention to Dempsey's feed. 
On the screen, he realized he was looking at Rafiq al-Mahajer walking through the old market in downtown Omaha, a suicide vest beneath his jacket and only moments from blowing himself up. Chapter 45 Old Town Market, Omaha, Nebraska Dempsey grabbed his partner's arm and laughed loudly, shoving his mobile phone at the man with his left hand. Look at this, dude. I mean, how drunk do you have to be to post this on Facebook? His right hand was reaching in his bag now, his fingers tickling the cool metal of the SIG 556 and the warmer composite plastic of the grip farther back. Basher stopped walking and leaned over the screen for a look. Oh, shit, bro! Basher laughed, playing the part. Dude, I know that girl. We used to date. Alma Hajer's eyes floated over them, then passed them, not registering them as a threat. Then the terrorist crossed west to east, directly in front of them, heading back toward 12th Street on Howard Street. We are one half block in trail, came Hansen's voice. Hold, Dempsey said softly, then louder to Basher. Are you serious, dude? No way. They let Al Mahajer disappear around the corner, and then they continued walking, crossing to the south side of Howard Street and stopping just past the corner out of view. Dempsey pressed against the wall and counted to three. Then he stuck his face around the corner and pulled it back again, recalling what his eyes had seen. Al Mahajer was crossing at the corner to head south on 12th Street. Wang, where is our secondary tango? Dempsey whispered. One block south of you heading east toward 12th Street. Anything south, three and four? Negative. Dempsey waited to see if Jarvis, call sign Mother, would chime in. He didn't. Three and four moved toward Twelfth, and then slowly north, head on a swivel. Whatever is happening is happening soon. Two, move a block south and get behind the secondary. We have the primary. Double clicks from all three teams confirmed his orders. Dempsey led and Basher followed swiftly down the south side of Howard and Twelfth Streets. He peered around the corner and then pulled back. Al Mahajer was walking toward a makeshift stage on the east side of the cobblestone street where the first band was already warming up. Dempsey had seen signs plastered all over town for the music festival playing today through Sunday. The city had blocked off two blocks of Howard Street to vehicle traffic. A small crowd had already gathered around the stage and the surrounding cafes and restaurants with outdoor seating were packed with patrons. Dempsey knew exactly what Al Mahajer intended to do. He pulled the zipper on the gym bag over his shoulder the rest of the way back and reached in and gripped his assault rifle, leaving it in the bag. Cries from bystanders would alert Al Mahajer, so he had to time the reveal perfectly. He sensed his partner fanning left, so he drifted right. Then his stomach sank as the terrorist reached into his bag. Fuck. Al Mahajer was definitely wearing a suicide vest beneath that barn jacket one undoubtedly packed with ball bearings or washers that would fly shrapnel in all directions when he detonated, dealing death in a wide sphere. Dempsey performed a quick collateral assessment. The band, the crowd, and people dining at the two outdoor cafes behind the stage would be obliterated. With enough shrapnel and a powerful enough charge, people across the street and even down the block would die as well. So he couldn't risk intentionally detonating this asshole under any circumstance— but knowing that didn't solve the problem of how to prevent an unintentional detonation. If Alma Hajer was fingering a detonator inside that bag, a headshot now would save everyone. But if the terrorist was gripping a dead man's switch, a headshot would kill dozens of innocents. I've lost Tango too, said Wang's voice. He had no time for that now. Hansen would have to unfuck that. Tango two went in the side entrance of a cafe, pursuing, came Hansen's voice. Al Mahajer mounted the steps to the stage, his hands still in the bag. The lead singer of the bluegrass band stopped strumming his guitar and smiled awkwardly at their uninvited guest. Dempsey pulled his rifle from the bag and sighted, putting a floating holographic dot on the back of Al Mahajer's head. No coin flips today, he told himself. He needed to see the terrorist's hand. Thumb on the button, it's a dead man's switch. Thumb off the button, a detonator. Before he could take the shot, he needed to confirm the trigger mechanism. Suddenly an idea came to him. Allahu Akbar, Rafiq al-Mahajer, he shouted, keeping the floating red reticle on the man's head and his eye on the hand in the bag. Al-Mahajer turned, looking furious rather than frightened. As he did, his hand came out of the bag, holding neither a dead man's switch nor a detonator. Instead, Dempsey identified the object as a compact 9 millimeter fully automatic assault pistol. The logic clicked in Dempsey's mind. 
The bastard was going to mow down as many people as possible with his machine gun before blowing up those who tried to escape. Assalam, motherfucker, Dempsey said and squeezed his trigger. Everyone down on the ground, he heard Basher scream. FBI, everyone get down! Dempsey watched with satisfaction as his five fifty six round went through Al Mahajer's left eye and then exploded out the top of his head, taking with it bone, blood, brains, and a chunk of hairy scalp. The man's arms flew outward, his left hand empty, the right squeezing the trigger of his assault pistol. A few rounds coughed from the gun into the crowd and then up and over Dempsey's head. Dempsey hit the deck and pressed himself to the ground. People were screaming and scurrying now, some leaping over the fallen and others tripping on them. Instead of heeding Basher's order to get down, the crowd's reaction was to panic and run. Dempsey waited for the white light and the searing flash, but it never came. No body parts raining down on him, no blood in his eyes. He waited a slow three-count. Then he looked left at Basher, who was also on the deck looking at him, his head shielded beneath his arms. The man's eyes were wide, but he managed to smile. Still glad you took the red pill? Basher asked. Dempsey tried to think of something clever, but came up empty. He smirked instead, and then pulled himself up to his knees. Then he raised his rifle and scanned the fleeing crowd around him. Two, one, status on the secondary? Lost him in the cafe, came Hansen's curt reply. Wang? Nothing from above. I have the crowds to deal with, easy to blend in, especially if he changed his shirt or put on a hat. Keep looking, everyone. Find that son of a bitch. Three and four move north on all four blocks. We need to find Tango, too. About half of the civilian bystanders had fled, but the rest were mostly clustered into a herd about thirty yards away from Dempsey and Basher. Others were standing in ones and twos, taking pictures with their smartphones. Dempsey moved cautiously toward the stage where Al Mahajer's lifeless body lay leaking blood and other fluids. Time to call Jarvis. Mother, this is Alpha One. Al Mahajer is down. Alpha One, mother. Is he wearing a suicide vest? Check. But no dead man switch? He didn't go boom, Dempsey said, staring at his fallen adversary. Then, with a queasy, this ain't over feeling in his stomach, he added, But I need EOD here ASAP to disarm. Just in case. Chapter 46 Zio's Pizzeria, 1109 Howard Street in the Old Market, Omaha, Nebraska. Rustami lost his tail by cutting through the Hyatt Place Hotel at Jackson and 12th Streets. He snagged a sports coat from a bellman's cart and then slipped on sunglasses as he exited the lobby down the hall from the first-floor rooms. At the end of the hall, he exited to the alley that ran between the hotel and the building housing Zio's Pizza and a seafood restaurant. He entered Zio's via the side door marked Exit Only and smiled at the couple at the table beside the door, nodding and saying, Bonjour. The couple, if they remembered anything about him at all, would remember the happy French Algerian who came in the wrong door. He moved to the main entrance, which faced 12th Street. Can I help you? said the young woman at the hostess stand. Un moment, s'il vous plaît, he said. He picked up a menu from beside her and perused it as if deciding. He turned his back to her and looked out the window, just in time to see Al Mahajer sprint up the stairs onto the music stage. Rostami smiled and backed away from the large window beside the glass door. When he saw the Syrian move his left hand into his coat, he would move back farther and hit the deck, though he might have to do so sooner if the ISIS zealot pointed the machine pistol in his direction. The crowd started screaming, pushing at one another, but then a voice, a loud, booming voice, screamed something in Arabic from the corner to his left. He couldn't see far enough around to identify the source. Rostami moved backward beyond the hostess stand where the young woman stood. He watched her walk toward the window, mouth open, oblivious to the fact she would soon be riddled with bullets and shrapnel. Rostami dropped to the floor, anticipating the onslaught. Then a single gunshot rang out, not the burp of the machine pistol he expected to hear. He rose up enough to see Al Mahajer pitch over backward, his pistol firing haphazardly into the air. Several bullets struck the plate glass. The window exploded inward. The blast would come next. Rostami closed his eyes and pressed himself against the floor. Seconds passed. Nothing. He opened his eyes. Something was wrong. He got to a knee and looked out the shattered window. Huddled on the floor beside him, the hostess was sobbing, but she was very much alive and intact. She cradled her left arm, trying to stem the bleeding from a laceration that looked to be from flying glass rather than a bullet. And then... 
Rostami saw him. The devil himself, moving forward in a combat crouch, looking over a Sig Sauer 556 assault rifle. It was the same rifle. It was the same stance. It was the same fucking man from the tunnels beneath the UN. It had to be. This was the man who'd stalked him in Frankfurt, pursued him to Vienna, and thwarted him in New York. Because of this man, Masoud Modiri was dead. A loss Amir Modiri would never forgive him for. The devil was waving his left arm and moving through the crowd. Rastami reached for the pistol under his untucked shirt, rage in heart, intent on putting a bullet in the back of this devil's head. But then he spied another man behind him, also in a combat crouch that marked him as special operations. But how could they have responded so quickly? How had the Americans found them unless... Delilah. If only he'd gutted the Surin bitch when he'd had the chance. He left the pistol in his waistband. Allah only knew how many American counterterrorism operators were moving in disguise through the crowd. If he took the shot, they'd pursue him and he'd have no chance of escape. Oh, my God, said a restaurant patron, a young man in his twenties who stood beside him and began to film the chaos in the street with his mobile phone. The American devil was only yards from him now. Rustami raised his own phone and began to record. Motion to his right made him turn, and he saw several more men, rifles at high ready, weaving through the rising tide of screaming people. Two-thirds of the people ran in all directions, but the other third, like him, stood gawking with cell phones raised above their heads. Time to leave. As he joined the panicked throng running north, he focused his phone camera on the American counterterror specialist with the SIG 556. The operator was talking via a wireless radio system he assumed to his command and control. As Rustami passed, he filmed the operator's face in profile, passing within three meters of him. I have your face now, you cowboy motherfucker. Then he looked away and slipped his phone back into his pocket. He scooped up a trampled blue baseball cap off the cobblestone street. It was embroidered in white with the letters KC. He pulled the ball cap down on his head and disappeared into the panicked crowd. As he fled the old market, he said a little prayer for the dead Syrian to explode and rid the world of the American devil once and for all. Chapter 47 Georgia Aquarium Lobby, 1304 Local, 1204 Omaha Jacob Kemper smiled. The past six months had been the hardest of his life, but today he was happy. For the first time since his mom had dragged him to Atlanta, he saw the move for what it really was, a gift. By leaving Tampa behind, his mom had given him both the physical opportunity and the spiritual permission he needed to start over. He had a new house, a new school, a couple of new friends, and most importantly of all, a new perspective. He now realized that his dad's death had not been the beginning of his downward spiral, but rather the hard landing at the bottom. He loved his dad, and he missed him. But during his parents' two-year separation, Jake and his mom had been trapped in a Tier 1 purgatory, his dad unwilling to commit to them, but also unwilling to let them go. Now, they were free to live again. "'What do you want to see first, bud?' his mom asked. He smiled at her. She had started calling him Bud about a week after they arrived in Atlanta. At first it had pissed him off because that had been Dad's nickname for him. But once he realized that she was doing it subconsciously and not of her own volition, he actually kind of liked it. How about the ocean voyager thing? he said. I want to see the scuba divers with the sharks. Fine, but don't get any bright ideas. Diving with sharks is completely off the table for you she said, as she presented their admission passes to the ticket checker at the main entrance doors. Never gonna happen, so don't get your hopes up. Jake shook his head and rolled his eyes, the requisite response of a sixteen-year-old, but he laughed inside. It had practically taken an act of Congress to get her to agree to the scuba lessons. He didn't dare tell her that the thought of diving next to a shark made him queasy. He liked that she saw him as someone fearless enough to actually dive with sharks. Someone like Dad. We'll see, he said, mimicking her favorite line and throwing in a cocky half-smile for good measure. Oh, we'll see, all right, 
she fired back, laughing as they walked into the main entrance vestibule. To their immediate left, a bright orange information kiosk beckoned. How about I ask for directions? she teased. I know how you love it when I do that. Don't you dare, he said, tugging her by the hand away from the kiosk and toward the wall of fish, the tunnel aquarium leading to the massive atrium. From there, visitors could access all the exhibits, the gift shop, and a cluster of restaurants and snack shops. They strolled through the tunnel, watching the permit and jacks zoom by, swimming in their endless underwater loop. As they exited into the atrium, someone shoulder-checked Jake, hurriedly trying to squeeze by on his left. "'Hey, watch it, dude,' he said to the asshole's back. "'Jake, come here,' his mom said. There was something in her voice that made him uneasy, and he turned. She grabbed his wrist and pulled him toward her, her eyes on the dark-haired, dark-skinned man. A second man strode after the first and bore such a resemblance they easily could pass for brothers. Both appeared to be mid-twenties and wore canvas barn jackets despite the warm fall day. The jackets, the hurried movements, and the way their heads swiveled nervously around in all directions, sizing up the crowd— made Jake's inner voice scream with alarm. Dad used to say, especially right after returning from a deployment, when his gaze still had that dark, faraway thing going on, to watch for certain traits in a crowd. These two guys were hitting all the marks. Suddenly Jake found himself counting off the exits, scanning the atrium for shelter and trying to identify persons who could be of help. It was as if his dad were standing beside him, quizzing him on the checklist. Jake twisted his wrist free from his mom's hand and stepped in front of her. "'I think we should leave,' she said, a trembling urgency in her voice, and he wondered if Dad had also quizzed her on how to spot trouble during their date nights in Tampa. "'Hold on, Mom,' he said. "'Something is wrong.' He pulled the SEAL Team 10 hat, one of so many gifts from his father, off his head and handed it to her. "'Jake, what are you doing?' Commotion erupted ahead. A concessions employee with a food tray dropped at his feet was shouting, but Jake couldn't make out what the guy was saying. All around him, people began shuffling. A chair at one of the restaurants tipped over. A baby started crying. The crowd was beginning to sense that something was wrong. Ahead, the two men briefly caucused and then diverged, one rushing ahead toward Ocean Voyager and the other turning back toward the tunnel his eyes on the throng of people behind Jake, streaming into the atrium through the wall of fish. Jake locked eyes with the man, and goose flesh stood up on his neck. For the first time in his life he saw murder in another man's eyes, and at that moment he knew these guys were terrorists. He grabbed his mom's hand and pulled her to the right, hoping to give a wide berth to the terrorist. "'Stay behind me,' he commanded, and to his surprise she listened— a bird's-eye view of the aquarium popped into his mind, and he wondered how he could possibly know the layout of the place, but then he remembered having glanced at the back of the trifold tourist brochure while they were waiting in the ticket line. Somehow he remembered that the gift shop was to his immediate right, and there was an emergency exit just beyond the tropical diver exhibit at his two o'clock. A woman running with a toddler in her arms smashed painfully into him. The woman screamed, the baby wailed, and he lost his grip on his mom's hand. Across the atrium, he saw two fully kitted-up warriors enter from the cold-water quest exhibit moving in a combat crouch. He blinked and wondered if he was hallucinating, imagining what he wanted to see, because these guys were definitely SEALs. With the exception of actual team guys like his dad, no one knew SEALs better than Jake. He watched the two operators fan out quietly through the crowd, so quietly that the terrorists they were converging on didn't hear them coming. In mere seconds, the two seals had the first jihadist spread eagle on the floor at the entrance to Ocean Voyager. The taller seal had the terrorist stretched out in front of him, his hands gripping the wrists while the other pointed an assault rifle at the back of the man's head. To his left, he heard someone shout, Everyone clear the atrium! Two more operators materialized out of the tunnel as pandemonium erupted in the atrium. Someone screamed, and then it seemed like everyone screamed. The noise reverberated and echoed in the cavernous hall with a disconcerting effect. People, mostly women with small children, hunched over and darted in all directions. 
Jake looked back at the operators and registered that they were dressed different from the SEALs, with non-issue cargo pants and black T-shirts under their black combat vests. Then he realized that one of them was a woman, sighting over an MP5. The second terrorist saw them and veered left, putting him on a collision course with Jake's mom. Jake watched, everything happening in slow motion, as the man opened his olive-green barn jacket, revealing a small machine gun in his grip. As the barrel rose, Jake surged forward, anger trumping all fear. A simple thought took shape in his head. This guy was about to shoot women and children. Men like this guy were the reason he didn't have a dad. He crossed the distance between them in a second, but it felt like minutes. The man was looking away, mouth open and screaming. Jake saw fire lick out of the machine gun and heard more screams. He twisted his body, driving his left hand out and up, just as his dad had taught him in their backyard Krav Maga lessons. He nailed the terrorist's wrist, forcing the thundering machine gun barrel toward the ceiling. Jake rotated his hand, repositioning it to grip the man's wrist. At the same time, he pivoted on the ball of his left foot, stepped through the space between them with his right, and drove his right fist up into the terrorist's jaw. The terrorist stumbled backward and almost fell, but at the last second regained his balance and wrenched his arm free from Jake's grip. Jake stumbled forward and tried to tackle him by the waist as he fell, but the shooter stayed upright. Jake felt a sharp, crushing pain as the terrorist drove the rifle butt down against the crown of his head. He hit the ground and immediately rolled onto his back, his arms up defensively. He blinked hard to clear the white spots from his eyes and felt hot blood running through his hair and onto his neck. As his vision cleared, he saw the man sighting in on his face over the machine gun. Allahu Akbar! the man screamed, eyes wide with pure and absolute hatred. Jake wanted to close his eyes so he wouldn't see the muzzle flash, but another part of his brain refused. Fuck you! There was a loud pop and Jake's body jerked. But instead of a stream of bullets ripping Jake's face apart, the terrorist arched his back, his rifle arcing away and spitting at the tile floor. The terrorist's body twitched violently, still upright, as another pop followed the first. Then another. Blood spilled out of the man's mouth and over his chin. A big red bubble formed and then burst from between his lips. Finally, he pitched forward and fell, his face smacking the floor with a wet thud, the rifle clattering away. Jake felt strong hands clutch his arms and he realized he was being dragged backward into the tunnel. He looked down and saw the black gloves and turned to see who had him, half expecting and half hoping to see his dad. But he didn't recognize the man. He locked eyes with the woman with auburn hair running beside them. You're not seals, he heard himself say from far away. Then the world was filled with light and heat, and he disappeared into a soft but comfortable darkness. Chapter 48 Ember Talk, 1320 Local, 1220 Omaha, 1020 Seattle All hell had just broken loose and Jarvis was in the middle of the firestorm. The center monitor was streaming drone imagery from Seattle where Bravo team was circling the smoking hole that had once been a luxury sedan full of terrorists. The Seattle map was gone from the left screen, replaced with split-screen live streams from Dempsey's and Special Agent Hansen's body cams in Omaha. Jarvis watched their cameras pan as they walked through the now-deserted old market. Rapid movement on the right monitor usurped his attention. It was streaming Grimes's body camera feed as she entered the Georgia Aquarium. This was it. Everyone clear the lobby, Grimes shouted. Chaos ensued, screaming, running, and shooting. Shoot her at your three o'clock, Jarvis said, but she was already converging. He watched in awe as a random teenager in the crowd rushed into view and assaulted the terrorist while he was firing into the crowd. There was something familiar about the way the kid moved. The kid delivered a punishing blow and almost succeeded in disarming the shooter, but then the terrorist regained the upper hand. Jarvis watched in horror as the terrorist knocked the teenager out and brought his weapon to bear for the kill. Take the shot, Jarvis barked and prayed his instincts were right. Grimes's muzzle barked and the jihadi buckled. As she advanced on the fallen terrorist and the kid, he finally got a good view of the shooter. He's wearing a bomb vest, Jarvis said. Egress, egress, egress! A beat later, Grimes was running alongside Adamo, who was dragging the kid to safety. Suddenly the monitor flashed white, flickered, and went to static. Jarvis's heart skipped a beat. 
He'd stood OTC in enough talks to know what had just happened. The terrorist's suicide vest had exploded. Charlie Team, report, he said. Charlie Team, report. Stand by, came Adamo's coughing reply. Switch to Adamo's feed, Jarvis ordered Baldwin. The right monitor flickered and a new feed appeared. Charlie Two, report. Grimes's voice was strong and clear, but tense. You were right, she said. Suicide vest. Must have been on a kill switch, but I didn't see anything in his left hand. He blew after we killed him. Less than thirty seconds. Probably nothing left of him, but if you hold on, I can walk over and take a look. Your camera is tango uniform, Jarvis said. We're on Adamo's feed. Copy, she said. Charlie Three, status report, Jarvis said. Mother, this is Charlie Three, came Chunk's voice, loud and clear. We're five by and have the other shithead in cuffs and isolated. Was the other shooter wired to blow? Jarvis asked. Hell yeah, that's why we got him isolated, said the SEAL. And he didn't have a handheld detonator? No, sir, came the reply. So what's the trigger? I do not know, sir, Chunk said. But I am not walking over there to ask the motherfucker. You want to know how that shit works and call 